Section Zero of A Year Amongst the Persians by Edward Granville Brown. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nicholas James Bridgewater. A Year Amongst the Persians Impressions as to the Life, Character, and Thought of the People of Persia received during twelve months residence in that country in the years eighteen eighty seven to eight by edward granville brown section zero exordium dedicated to the persian reader only in the name of god the merciful the forgiving praise be to god the maker of land and sea the Lord of B, and it shall be. Quran 2, 111, 3, 42, etc. Who brought me forth from the place of my birth, obedient to his saying, Journey through the earth. Quran 6, 11, 2771, etc. Who guarded me from the dangers of the way, with the shield of no fear shall come upon them and no dismay quran two thirty six fifty nine one o six etc who caused me to accomplish my quest and thereafter to return and rest after i had beheld the wonders of the east and of the west but afterwards thus saith the humblest and unworthiest of his servants, who least deserveth his bounty, and most needeth his clemency, may God forgive his failing, and heal his ailing. When from Kerman, and the confines of Bam, I had returned again to the city on the Cam, and ceased for a while to wander, and began to muse and ponder on the lands where I had been, and the marvels I had therein seen, and how in pursuit of knowledge I had foregone the calm seclusion of college, and through days warm and weary, and nights dark and dreary, now hungry and now athirst, I had tasted of the best and of the worst, experiencing hot and cold, and holding converse with young and old, and had climbed the mountain and crossed the waste, now slowly, and now with haste until i had made an end of toil and set my foot upon my native soil then wishful to impart the gain which i had won with labour and harvested with pain for travel is travail say the sages so burton has well translated the arabic proverb travel is a portion of hell-fire i resolved to write these pages and taking ink and pen to impart to my fellow men what i had witnessed and understood of things evil and good now seeing that to fail and fall is the fate of all and to claim exemption from the lot of humanity a proof of pride and vanity and somewhat of mercy our common need therefore let such as read and errors detect either ignore and neglect or correct and conceal them rather than revile and reveal them for he is lenient who is wise and from his brother's failings averts his eyes being loath to hurt or harm nay meeting bane with balm thus salam end of section zero recording by nicholas james bridgewater Reco Section 1 of A Year Amongst the Persians by Edward Granville Brown. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nicholas James Bridgewater. A Year Amongst the Persians by Edward Granville Brown section one chapter one introductory al-ilm wa al-man 
علم الأديان وعلم الأبدان Science is twofold Theology and Medicine I have so often been asked how I first came to occupy myself with the study of Eastern languages that I have decided to devote the opening chapter of this book to answering this question and to describing as succinctly as possible the process by which not without difficulty and occasional discouragement i succeeded ere i ever set foot in persia in obtaining a sufficient mastery over the persian tongue to enable me to employ it with some facility as an instrument of conversation and to explore with pleasure and profit the enchanted realms of its vast and varied literature i have not arrived at this decision without some hesitation and misgiving for i do not wish to obtrude myself unnecessarily on the attention of my readers and one can hardly be autobiographical without running the risk of being egotistical but then the same thing applies with equal force to all descriptions intended for publication of any part of one's personal experiences such for instance as one's own travels believing that the observations impressions and experiences of my twelve months sojourn in persia during the years eighteen eighty seven to eight may be of interest to others besides myself i have at length determined to publish them it is too late now to turn squeamish about the use of the pronoun of the first person i will be as sparing of its use as i can but use it i must i might indeed have given to this book the form of a systematic treatise on persia a plan which for some time i did actually entertain but against this plan three reasons finally decided me firstly that my publishers expressed a preference for the narrative form which they believed would render the book more readable secondly that for the more ambitious project of writing a systematic treatise i did not feel myself prepared and could not prepare myself without the expenditure of time only to be obtained by the sacrifice of other work which seemed to me of greater importance thirdly that the recent publication of the honourable g n curzon's encyclopaedic work on persia will for some time to come prevent any similar attempt on the part of any one else who is not either remarkably rash or exceedingly well informed moreover the question what first made you take up persian when addressed to an englishman who is neither engaged in nor destined for an eastern career deserves an answer in france germany or russia such a question would hardly be asked but in england a knowledge of eastern languages is no stepping stone to diplomatic employment in eastern countries and though there exist in the universities and the british museum posts more desirable than this to the student of oriental languages such posts are few and when vacant hotly competed for in spite of every discouragement there are i rejoice to say almost every year a few young englishmen who actuated solely by love of knowledge and desire to extend the frontiers of science in a domain which still contains vast tracts of unexplored country devote themselves to this study to them too often have i had to repeat the words of warning given to me by my honoured friend and teacher the late dr william wright an arabic scholar whom not cambridge or england only but europe mourns with heartfelt sorrow and remembers with legitimate pride it was in the year eighteen eighty four so far as i remember i was leaving cambridge with mingled feelings of sorrow and of hope sorrow because i was to bid farewell forever as i then expected to the university and the college to which i owe a debt of gratitude beyond the power of words to describe hope 
because the honours I had just gained in the Indian languages tripos made me sanguine of obtaining some employment which would enable me to pursue with advantage and success a study to which I was devotedly attached, and which even medicine, for which I was then destined, with all its charms and far-reaching interests, could not rival in my affections. This hope, in answer to an inquiry as to what I intended to do on leaving Cambridge, I one day confided to Dr. Wright. No one, as I well knew, could better sympathize with it or gauge its chances of fulfillment. And from no one could I look for kinder, wiser, and more prudent counsel. And this was the advice he gave me. If, said he, you have private means which render you independent of a profession, then pursue your oriental studies and fear not that they will disappoint you or fail to return you a rich reward of happiness and honour. But if you cannot afford to do this and are obliged to consider how you may earn a livelihood, then devote yourself wholly to medicine and abandon, save as a relaxation for your leisure moments, the pursuit of oriental letters. The posts for which such knowledge will fit you are few, and, for the most part, poorly endowed. Neither can you hope to obtain them till you have worked and waited for many years. And from the government you must look for nothing, for it has long shown, and still continues to show, an increasing indisposition to offer the slightest encouragement to the study of Eastern languages. A rare piece of good fortune has in my case falsified a prediction of which Dr. Wright himself, though I knew it not till long afterwards, did all in his power to avert the accomplishment. But in general, it still holds true, and I write these words not for myself, but for those young English Orientalists whose disappointments, struggles, and unfulfilled, though legitimate hopes, I have so often been compelled to watch with keen but impotent sorrow and sympathy. Often I reflect with bitterness that England, though more directly interested in the East than any other European country save Russia, not only offers less encouragement to her sons to engage in the study of Oriental languages than any other great European nation, but can find no employment even for those few who, notwithstanding every discouragement, are impelled by their own inclination to this study, and who, by diligence, zeal, and natural aptitude, attain proficiency therein. How different is it in France? There, not to mention the more academic and purely scientific courses of lectures on Hebrew, Syriac, Arabic, Zand, Pahlavi, Persian, Sanskrit, and on Egyptian, Assyrian, and Semitic archaeology and philology, delivered regularly by savants of European reputation at the Collège de France and the Sorbonne, all of which lectures are freely open to persons of either sex and any nationality. There is a special school of Oriental languages, now within a year or two of its centenary, where practical instruction of the best imaginable kind is given, also gratuitously by European professors, assisted in most cases by native repetiteurs in literary and colloquial Arabic, Persian, Turkish, Malay, Javanese, Armenian, Modern Greek, Chinese, Japanese, Annamite, Hindustani, Tamil, Russian, and Romanian, as well as in the geography, history, and jurisprudence of the states of the extreme east. To these lectures, the best, I repeat, without fear of contradiction, which can be imagined, any student French or foreign, is admitted free of charge. And any student who has followed them diligently for three years 
and passed the periodical examinations to the satisfaction of his teachers provided that he be a french subject may confidently reckon on receiving sooner or later from the government such employment as his tastes training and attainments have fitted him for the manifold advantages of this admirable system alike to the state and the individual must be obvious to the most obtuse and need no demonstration all honour to france for the signal services which she has rendered to the cause of learning may she long maintain that position of eminence in science which she has so nobly won and which she so deservedly occupies and to us english too may she become in this respect at least an exemplar and a pattern now having unburdened my mind on this matter i will recount briefly how i came to devote myself to the study of oriental languages i was originally destined to become an engineer and therefore partly because at any rate sixteen years ago the teaching of the modern side was still in a most rudimentary state partly because i most eagerly desired emancipation from a life entirely uncongenial to me i left school at the age of fifteen and a half with little knowledge and less love of latin and greek i have since then learned better to appreciate the value of these languages and to regret the slenderness of my classical attainments yet the method according to which they are generally taught in english public schools is so unattractive and in my opinion so inefficient that had i been subjected to it much longer i should probably have come to loathe all foreign languages and to shudder at the very sight of a grammar it is a good thing for the student of a language to study its grammar when he has learned to read and understand it just as it is a good thing for an artist to study the anatomy of the human body when he has learned to sketch a figure or catch the expression of a face but for one to seek to obtain a mastery over a language by learning rules of accidents and syntax is as though he should regard the dissecting room as the single and sufficient portal of entrance to the academy how little a knowledge of grammar has to do with the facility in the use of language is shown by the fact that comparatively few have studied the grammar of that language over which they have the greatest mastery while amongst all the latin and greek scholars in this country those who could make an extempore speech dash off an impromptu note or carry on a sustained conversation in either language are in a small minority then amongst other evil things connected with it is the magnificent contempt for all non-english systems of pronunciation which the ordinary public school system of teaching latin and greek encourages granted that the pronunciation of greek is very different in the athens of to-day from what it was in the time of plato or euripides and that cicero would not understand or would understand with difficulty the latin of the vatican does it follow that both languages should be pronounced exactly like english of all spoken tongues the most anomalous in pronunciation what should we think of a chinaman who because he was convinced that the pronunciation of english in the fourteenth century differed widely from that of the nineteenth deliberately elected to read chaucer with the accent and intonation of chinese if latin and greek alone were concerned it would not so much matter but the influence of this doctrine of pan anglican pronunciation too often extends to french and german as well the spirit engendered by it is finely displayed in these two sayings which i remember to have heard repeated any one can understand english if they choose provided you talk loud enough always mistrust an englishman who talks french like a frenchman 
apart from the general failure to invest the books read with any human historical or literary interest or to treat them as expressions of the thoughts feelings and aspirations of our fellow creatures instead of as grammatical treadmills there is another reason why the public school system of teaching languages commonly fails to impart much useful knowledge of them when any intelligent being who is a free agent wishes to obtain an efficient knowledge of a foreign language as quickly as possible how does he proceed he begins with an easy text and first obtains the general sense of each sentence and the meaning of each particular word from his teacher in default of a teacher he falls back on the best available substitute namely a good translation and a dictionary looking out words in a dictionary is however mere waste of time if their meaning can be ascertained in any other way so that he will use this means only when compelled to do so having ascertained the meaning of each word he will note it down either in the margin of the book or elsewhere so that he may not have to ask it or look it out again then he will read the passage which he has thus studied over and over again if possible aloud so that the tongue ear and mind may be simultaneously familiarized with the new instrument of thought and communication of which he desires to possess himself until he perfectly understands the meaning without mentally translating it into english and until the foreign words no longer strange evoke in his mind not their english equivalents but the ideas which they connote this is the proper way to learn a language and it is opposed at almost every point to the public school method which regards the use of cribs as a deadly sin and substitutes parsing and construing for reading and understanding notwithstanding all this i am well aware that the advocates of this method have in their armory another and more potent argument a boy does not go to school say they to learn latin and greek but to learn to confront disagreeable duties with equanimity and to do what is distasteful to him with cheerfulness to this i have nothing to say it is unanswerable and final if boys are sent to school to learn what the word disagreeable means and to realize that the most tedious monotony is perfectly compatible with the most acute misery and that the most assiduous labor if it be not wisely directed does not necessarily secure the attainment of the object ostensibly aimed at then indeed does the public school offer the surest means of attaining this end the most wretched day of my life except the day when i left college was the day i went to school during the earlier portion of my school life i believed that i nearly fathomed the possibilities of human misery and despair i learned then what i am thankful to say i have unlearned since to be a pessimist a misanthrope and a cynic and i have learned since what i did not understand then that to know by rote a quantity of grammatical rules is in itself not much more useful than to know how often each letter of the alphabet occurs in paradise lost or how many separate stones went to the building of the great pyramid many of my readers even those who may be inclined to agree with me as to the desirability of modifying the teaching of our public schools will blame me for expressing myself so strongly the value of a public school education in the development of character cannot be denied and in the teaching also great improvements have i believe been made within the last ten or fifteen years but as far as my own experience goes i do not feel that i have spoken at all too strongly it was the turkish war with russia 
in 1877-8 that first attracted my attention to the East, about which, till that time, I had known and cared nothing. To the young, war is always interesting, and I watched the progress of this struggle with eager attention. At first, my proclivities were by no means for the Turks, but the losing side, more especially when it continues to struggle gallantly against defeat, always has a claim on our sympathy, and moreover, the cant of the anti-Turkish party in England, and the wretched attempts to confound questions of abstract justice with party politics, disgusted me beyond measure. Ere the close of the war I would have died to save Turkey, and I mourned the fall of Plevna, as though it had been a disaster inflicted on my own country, and so gradually pity turned to admiration, and admiration to enthusiasm, until the Turks became in my eyes veritable heroes, and the desire to identify myself with their cause make my dwelling amongst them, and unite with them in the defence of their land, possessed me heart and soul. At the age of sixteen, such enthusiasm more easily establishes itself in the heart. And, while it lasts, for it often fades as quickly as it bloomed, exercises a more absolute and uncontrolled sway over the mind than at a more advanced age. Even though it be transitory, its effects, as in my case, may be permanent. So now my whole ambition came to be this, how I might become in time an officer in the Turkish army, and the plan which I proposed to myself was to enter first the English army, to remain there till I had learned my profession and attained the rank of captain, then to resign my commission and enter the service of the Ottoman government, which, as I understood, gave a promotion of two grades. So wild a project will doubtless move many of my readers to mirth and some to indignation, but, such as it was, it was for a time paramount in my mind, and its influence outlived it. Its accomplishment, however, evidently needed time, and, as my enthusiasm demanded some immediate object, I resolved at once to begin the study of the Turkish language. Few of my readers, probably, have had occasion to embark on this study, or even to consider what steps they would take if a desire to do so suddenly came upon them. I may therefore here remark that for one not resident in the metropolis it is far from easy to discover anything about the Turkish language, and almost impossible to find a teacher. However, after much seeking and many inquiries, I succeeded in obtaining a copy of Barker's Turkish Grammar. Into this I plunged with enthusiasm. I learned Turkish verbs in the old school fashion, and blundered through the pleasantries of Khoja Nasruddin Effendi. But so ignorant was I, and so involved is the Ottoman construction, that it took me some time to discover that the language is written from right to left, while, true to the pan-Anglican system on which I have already animadverted, I read my Turkish as though it had been English, pronouncing for example, the article bir and the substantive ber exactly the same, as though both, instead of neither, rhymed with the English words fur and fur, and so I bungled on for a while, making slow but steady progress, and wasting much time, but with undiminished enthusiasm, for which I was presently rewarded by discovering a teacher. This was an Irish clergyman who had, I believe, served as a private in the Crimean War, picked up some Turkish, attracted attention by his proficiency in a language of which very few Englishmen have any knowledge and so gained employment as an interpreter. After the war, 
he was ordained as a clergyman of the church of england and remained for some years at constantinople as a missionary i do not know how his work prospered but if he succeeded in winning from the turks half the sympathy and love with which they inspired him his success must have been great indeed when i discovered him he had a cure of souls in the consit iron district having been driven from his last parish by the resentment of his flock whigs almost to a man which he had incurred by venturing publicly to defend the turks at a time when they were at the very nadir of unpopularity and when the outcry about the bulgarian atrocities was at its height so the very religious and humane persons who composed his congregation announced to his vicar their intention of withdrawing their subscriptions and support from the church so long as the boshi bozouk such as he informed me not without a certain pride was the name they had given him occupied his pulpit so there was nothing for it but that he should go isolated in the uncongenial environment to which he was transferred he was i think almost as eager to teach me turkish as i was to learn it and many a pleasant hour did i pass in his little parlour listening with inexhaustible delight to the anecdotes of his life in constantinople which he loved to tell peace be to his memory he died in africa once more engaged in mission work not long after i went to cambridge end of section one recording by nicholas james bridgewater recorded in london england section two of a year amongst the persians by edward granville brown this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by nicholas james bridgewater a year amongst the persians by edward granville brown section two one of the incidental charms of orientalism is the kindness and sympathy often shown by scholars of the greatest distinction and the highest attainments to the young beginner even when he has no introduction save the password of a common and much-loved pursuit of this i can recall many instances but it is sufficient to mention the first in my experience expecting to be in or within reach of london for a time i was anxious to improve the occasion by prosecuting my turkish studies for the boshi bozouk had recently left consit for hull and to this end wished to find a proficient teacher as i knew not how else to set about this i finally and somewhat audaciously determined to write to the late sir james then mr redhouse whose name the study of his valuable writings on the ottoman language had made familiar to me as that of a patron saint asking for his advice and help this letter i addressed to the care of his publishers and in a few days i received to my intense delight a most kind reply in which he the first turkish scholar in europe probably not only gave me all the information i required but invited me to pay him a visit whenever i came to london an invitation of which as may be readily believed i availed myself at the earliest possible opportunity and so gradually i came to know others who were able and willing to help me in my studies including several turkish gentlemen attached to the ottoman embassy in london from some of whom i received no little kindness but if my studies prospered it was otherwise with the somewhat chimerical project in which they had originated my father did not wish me to enter the army but proposed medicine as an alternative to engineering 
as the former profession seemed more compatible with my aspirations than the latter i eagerly accepted his offer a few days after this decision had been arrived at he consulted an eminent physician who was one of his oldest friends as to my future education if you wanted to make your son a doctor said my father where would you send him and the answer given without a moment's hesitation was to cambridge so to cambridge i went in october eighteen seventy nine which date marks for me the beginning of a new and most happy era of life for i suppose that a man who cannot be happy at the university must be incapable of happiness here my medical studies occupied of course the major part of my time and attention and that right pleasantly for apart from their intrinsic interest the teaching was masterly and even subjects at first repellent can be made attractive when taught by a master possessed of grasp eloquence and enthusiasm just as a teacher who lacks these qualities will make the most interesting subjects appear devoid of charm yet still i found time to devote to eastern languages turkish it is true was not then to be had at cambridge but i had already discovered that for further progress in this some knowledge of arabic and persian was requisite and to these i determined to turn my attention during my first year i therefore began to study arabic with the late professor palmer whose extraordinary and varied abilities are too well known to need any celebration on my part no man had a higher ideal of knowledge in the matter of languages and as i believe sounder views as to the method of learning them these views i have already set forth substantially and summarily and i will therefore say no more about them in this place save that i absorbed them greedily and derived from them no small advantage learning by their application more of arabic in one term than i had learned of latin or greek during five and a half years and this notwithstanding the fact that i could devote to it only a small portion of my time i began persian in the long vacation of eighteen eighty neither professor palmer nor professor cowell was resident in cambridge at that time but i obtained the assistance of an undergraduate of indian nationality who though the son of hindu parents converted to christianity had an excellent knowledge not only of persian and sanskrit but of arabic to this knowledge which was my admiration and envy he for his part seemed to attach little importance all his pride was in playing the fiddle on which so far as i could judge he was a very indifferent performer but as it gave him pleasure to have a listener a kind of tacit understanding grew up that when he had helped me for an hour to read the golestan i in return should sit and listen for a while to his fiddling which i did with such appearance of pleasure as i could command for two years after this that is to say till i took my degree such work as i did in persian and arabic was done chiefly by myself though i managed to run up to london for an afternoon once a fortnight or so for a turkish lesson till the lent term of eighteen eighty one when the paramount claims of that most exacting of taskmasters the river took from me for some weeks the right to call my afternoons my own and when the lent races were over i had to think seriously about my approaching tripos while a promise made to me by my father that if i succeeded in passing both it 
and the examination for the second MB at the end of my third year, that is, in June 1882, I should spend two months of the succeeding long vacation in Constantinople, determined me to exert all my efforts to win this dazzling bribe. This resolution cost me a great deal, but I was amply rewarded for my self-denial when, in July 1882, I at length beheld the minarets of Stamboul, and heard the muezzin call the true believers to prayer. I have heard people express themselves as disappointed with Constantinople. I suppose that, wherever one goes, one sees in great measure what one expects to see, because there is good and evil in all things, and the eye discerns but one when the mind is occupied by a preconceived idea. But I at least suffered no disenchantment, and returned to England with my enthusiasm for the East, not merely undiminished, but, if possible, intensified. The two succeeding years were years of undiluted pleasure, for I was still at Cambridge, and was now able to devote my whole time to the study of Oriental languages, as I intended to become a candidate for the Indian languages tripos, in 1884 I was obliged to begin the study of Hindustani, a language from which I never could succeed in deriving much pleasure. During this period I became acquainted with a very learned but very eccentric old Persian, Mirza Mohammad Bagher of Bavonat in Fars, surnamed Ibrahim John Moattar, having wandered through half the world, learned and learned well half a dozen languages, and been successively a Shiite Mohammedan, a Dervish, a Christian, an atheist, and a Jew, he had finished by elaborating a religious system of his own, which he called Islamo-Christianity, to the celebration I can hardly say the elucidation, of which in English tracts and Persian poems, composed in the most bizarre style, he devoted the greater part of his time, talents, and money. He was in every way a most remarkable man, and one it was impossible not to respect and like, in spite of his appalling loquacity, his unreason, his disputatiousness, his utter impracticability. I never saw anyone who lived so entirely in a fantastic, ideal world of his own creation. He was totally indifferent to his own temporal interests, cared nothing for money, personal comfort, or the favour of the powerful, and often alienated his acquaintances by violent attacks on their most cherished beliefs, and drove away his friends by the ceaseless torrent of his eloquence. He lived in a squalid little room in Limehouse, surrounded by piles of dusty books, mostly theological treatises in Persian and Arabic, with a sprinkling of Hebrew and English volumes, amongst which last, Carlyle's Sartor Resartus, and heroes and hero worship occupied the place of honour. Of these, however, he made but little use, for he generally wrote when alone, and talked when he could get anyone to listen to him. I tried to persuade him to read with me those portions of the Masnavi and the Divan of Hafez set for my examination, and offered to remunerate him for his trouble, but this plan failed on its first trial. We had not read for twenty minutes when he suddenly pushed away the hafez, dragged out from a drawer in the rickety little table a pile of manuscript, and said, I like my own poetry better than this, and if you want me to teach you Persian, you must learn it as I please. I don't want your money but I do want you 
to understand my thoughts about religion. You can understand Hafez by yourself, but you cannot understand my poetry unless I explain it to you. This was certainly true. Allusions to grotesque visions in which figured grass-eating lions, bears, yellow demons, Gog and Magog, crusaders, and Hebrew and Arab patriarchs, saints, and warriors were jumbled up with current politics, personal reminiscences, rabbinic legends, mystical rhapsodies, denunciations, prophecies, old Persian mythology, Old Testament theology, and Quranic exegesis, in a manner truly bewildering. The whole being clothed in a Persian so quaint, so obscure, and so replete with rare, dialectical, and foreign words that many verses were incomprehensible even to educated Persians, to whom, for the most part, the little son of London, Shomei Seyelandaniye, so he called the longest of his published poems, was a source of terror. One of my Persian friends, for I made acquaintance about this time with several young Persians who were studying in London, would never consent to visit me unless he had received an assurance that the poet-prophet-philosopher of Bavarnot would be out of the way. I, however, by dint of long listening and much patience, not without some weariness, learned from him much that was of value to me besides the correct Persian pronunciation. For I had originally acquired from my Indian friend the erroneous and unlovely pronunciation current in India, which I now abandoned with all possible speed, believing the French of Paris to be preferable to the French of Stratford at Bow. Towards the end of 1884, Mirza Bagheer left London for the East with his surviving children, a daughter of about eighteen and a son of about ten years of age, both of whom had been brought up away from him in the Christian religion, and neither of whom knew any language but English. The girl's failing health, for she was threatened with consumption, was the cause of his departure. I had just left Cambridge, and entered at St. Bartholomew's Hospital, where I found my time and energies fully occupied with my new work. Tired as I often was, however, when I got away from the wards, I had to make almost daily pilgrimages to Lime House, where I often remained till nearly midnight, for Mirza Bolger refused to leave London till I had finished reading a versified commentary on the Qur'an, on which he had been engaged for some time, and of which he wished to bestow the manuscript on me as a keepsake. My daughter will die, said he, as the doctors tell me, unless she leaves for Beirut in a short time, and it is you who prevent me from taking her there for I will not leave London until you have understood my book. Argument was useless with such a visionary. So, willing or no, I had to spend every available hour in the little room at Limehouse, ever on the watch to check the interminable digressions to which the reading of the poem continually gave rise. At last it was finished and the very next day, if I remember rightly, Mirza Bagheer started with his children for the east. I never saw him again, though I continued to correspond with him so long as he was at Beirut, whence, I think, he was finally expelled by the Ottoman government as a firebrand menacing the peace of the community. He then went with his son to Persia, his daughter had died previously at Beirut, whence news of his death reached me a year or two ago. And now for three years, 1884 to 87, 
it was only an occasional leisure hour that i could snatch from my medical studies for a chat with my persian friends who though they knew english well for the most part were kind enough to talk for my benefit their own language or for quiet communing in the cool vaulted reading room of the british museum with my favourite sufi writers whose mystical idealism which had long since cast its spell over my mind now supplied me with a powerful antidote against the pessimistic tendencies evoked by the daily contemplation of misery and pain this period was far from being an unhappy one for my work if hard was full of interest and if in the hospital i saw much that was sad much that made me wonder at man's clinging to life since to the vast majority life seemed but a succession of pains struggles and sorrows on the other hand i saw much to strengthen my faith in the goodness and nobility of human nature never before or since have i realized so clearly the immortality greatness and virtue of the spirit of man or the misery of its earthly environment it seemed to me like a prince in rags ignorant alike of his birth and his rights but to whom is reserved a glorious heritage no wonder then that the pantheistic idealism of the masnavi took hold of me or that such words as these of hafez thrilled me to the very soul todal ze kungari arsh mizanan safir nadal namat kedar in khalq dawn che of todast they are calling to thee from the pinnacles of the throne of god i know not what hath befallen thee in this dust heap the world even my medical studies strange as it may appear favoured the development of this habit of mind for physiology when it does not encourage materialism encourages mysticism and nothing so much tends to shake one's faith in the reality of the objective world as the examination of certain of the subjective phenomena of mental and nervous disorders but now this period too was drawing to a close and my dreams of visiting persia even when their accomplishment seemed most unlikely were rapidly approaching fulfilment the hopes with which i had left cambridge had been damped by repeated disappointments i had thought that the knowledge i had acquired of persian turkish and arabic might enable me to find employment in the consular service but had learned from curt official letters referring me to printed official regulations that this was not so that these languages were not recognized as subjects of examination and that not they but german greek spanish and italian were the qualifications by which one might hope to become a consul in western asia the words of dr wright's warning came back to me and i acknowledged their justice to my professional studies i felt and not my linguistic attainments must i look to earn my livelihood i had passed my final examinations at the college of surgeons the college of physicians and the university of cambridge received from the two former with a sense of exaltation which i well remember the diplomas authorizing me to practice and was beginning to consider what my next step should be when the luck of which i had despaired came to me at last returning to my rooms on the evening of may thirtieth 
1887, I found a telegram lying on the table. I opened it with indifference, which changed in the moment I grasped its purport to ecstatic joy. I had that day been elected a fellow of my college. End of section two. End of chapter one. Introductory. Recording by Nicholas James Bridgewater. Recorded in London. Section three of A Year Amongst the Persians by Edward Granville Brown. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nicholas James Bridgewater. A Year Amongst the Persians by Edward Granville Brown, Section 3. Chapter 2 From England to the Persian Frontier. Feme Ederi Ide Yamem to Erd Uridul Hoira Ayuhuma Yalini E El Hairul Ladi Ana Ebeterihi Emisherul Ladi Hua Yabeterini. And I know not when bound for the land of my quest if my portion shall be the good which i hope for and seek or the evil that seeketh for me al muthaqibul abdi so at last i was ready to go to persia about that there could be no question for i had long determined to go if i got the chance and now not only had the opportunity come but in view of the probability that the university would soon require a resident teacher of Persian, I was urged by my friends at Cambridge to spend the first year of my fellowship in the way which would best qualify me for this post. Yet, as the time for my departure approached, a strange shrinking from this journey which i had so much desired a shrinking to which i look back with shame and wonder and for which i can in no wise account took possession of me it arose partly i suppose from the sudden reaction which unexpected good fortune will at times produce partly if not from ill health at least from that lowering of the vitality which results from hard work and lack of exercise and fresh air partly also from the worry inseparable from the preparations for a long journey into regions little known but whatever its cause it did much to mar my happiness at a time when i had no excuse for being otherwise than happy at length however it came to an end bewildered by conflicting counsels as to the equipment which i should need and the route which i had best take i at last settled the matter by booking my passage from marseilles to batoum at the london office of the messagerie maritimes and by adding to the two small portmanteaus into which i had compressed so much clothing as appeared absolutely indispensable nothing but a wolseley valise a saddle and a bridle a pith hat which was broken to pieces long before the summer came round a small medicine chest a few surgical instruments a revolver a box of a hundred cartridges a few books a passport with the russian and turkish visas and a money belt containing about two hundred pounds in gold paper and circular notes at the last moment i was joined by an old college friend h who having just completed a term of office at the hospital was desirous to travel and whose proposal to join me i welcomed he was my companion as far as tehran where as i desired to travel for a while and he to proceed we were obliged to separate we had booked our passage as i have said to batoum 
intending to take the train thence to Baku, and so by the Caspian to Rasht in Persia. For this route, unquestionably the shortest and easiest, I had from the first felt little liking, my own wish being to enter Persia through Turkey, either by way of Damascus and Baghdad, or of Trebizond and Erzurum. I had suffered myself to be persuaded against my inclinations, which, I think, where no question of principle is involved, is always a mistake, for the longer and harder way of one's own choosing is preferable to the shorter and easier way chosen by another. And so, as soon as I was withdrawn from the influences which had temporarily overcome my own judgment and inclination, I began to repent of having adopted an uncongenial plan, and to consider whether even now, at this eleventh hour, it was not possible to change. The sight of the Turkish shore and the sound of the Turkish tongue, for we stayed two days at Constantinople, whence to Trebizond, the deck of the steamer was crowded with Turks and Persians, with whom I spent the greater part of each day in conversing, swept away my last scruples as to the wisdom of thus reversing at the outset a decision which had been fully discussed. I consulted with H, who raised no objection, and we decided on reaching Trebizond, where the steamer anchored on 4th October, to inquire at the British consulate as to the safety and practicability of the old caravan road leading thence into Central Asia, and, if the report were favourable, to adopt that route. There was a heavy swell in the open roadstead, and the wind which rolled back the rain clouds on the green thickly wooded hills seemed to be rising as we clambered into one of the clumsy boats which hovered round the steamer to go ashore nor had the gruff old captain's answer to my inquiry as to how long the steamer would lie there tended to reassure me if the wind gets up much more he had said i may start at any time and if we are on shore i demanded how shall we know that you are starting vous me verrez partir voilà tout he replied and with a shrug of his shoulders walked off to his cabin so i was somewhat uneasy in my mind lest while we were conducting our inquiries on shore the steamer might put out to sea bearing with it all our worldly goods this disquieting reflection was dispelled by the shock of the boat striking against the little wooden jetty. We stepped out and found ourselves confronted by one of the Turkish police, who demanded our passports. These had not been presented, as theoretically they should have been, at Constantinople for a fresh visa, and I feared we might consequently have some trouble in landing. However, I assumed an air of confident alacrity, produced the passports, and pointed to the seal of the Turkish consulate given in London. As the visa, bon pour se rendre à Constantinople, to which this was attached was in French, the officer was not much the wiser, and, after scrutinizing the passports, which he held upside down, with a critical air, he returned them and stood aside to let us pass. And this is typical of Turkey, where the laws, though theoretically stringent, are not practically troublesome, in which point it has the advantage over Russia. Guided by a boy belonging to our boat, we ascended through narrow, tortuous streets to the British consulate, where, though unprovided with recommendations, we received from the consul Mr. Longworth that courteous and kindly welcome which, to their honour be it said, Englishmen, and indeed other Europeans, as well as Americans, resident in the Turkish and Persian dominions, seldom fail to give the traveller. In reply to our inquiries, he told us that the road to the Persian frontier was perfectly safe, 
and that we should have no difficulty in hiring horses or mules to convey us to Erzerum, whence we could easily engage others for the journey to Tabriz. He also kindly offered to send his dragoman, an Armenian gentleman named Hekimian, to assist us in clearing our baggage at the custom house so we returned to the steamer to bring it ashore as we pushed our way through the deck passengers to the side of the ship some of my persian acquaintances called out to me to tell them why i was disembarking and whither i was going and on learning my intention of taking the old caravan road through erzerum they cried oh dear soul it will take you three months to get to tehran thus if indeed you get there at all why have you thus made your road difficult but the step was taken now and i paid no heed to their words the custom house thanks to the aegis of the british consulate dealt very gently with us we were even asked if i remember right which of our packages we should prefer to have opened h s wolseley valise was selected but we forgot that his rifle had been rolled up in it. The Turkish excisemen stroked their chins a little at this sight, for firearms are contraband, but said nothing. When this form of examination was over, we thanked the mudir, or superintendent, for his courtesy, gave a few small coins to his subordinates, and, with the help of two or three sturdy porters, transported our luggage, to the one hotel which Trebizond possesses. It is called the Hôtel d'Italie, and, though unpretentious, is clean and comfortable. During the three days we spent there, we had no cause to complain either of being underfed or overcharged. Next morning our preparations began in earnest. Hekimion was of inestimable service, arranging everything and accompanying us everywhere. The Russian paper money, with which we had provided ourselves for the earlier part of the journey, was soon converted into Turkish gold. Tinned provisions and a few simple cooking utensils and other necessaries were bought in the bazaars, and arrangements were concluded with two sturdy muleteers for the journey to Erzerum. They, on their part, agreed to provide us with five horses for ourselves and our baggage, to convey us to Erzerum in six or seven days, and to do what lay in their power to render the journey pleasant. While we were on our part covenanted to pay them six and a quarter Turkish pounds, three pounds down, and the remainder at Erzerum, to which we promised to add a trifle if they gave us satisfaction. There remained a more important matter, the choice of a servant to accompany us on our journey. Two candidates presented themselves, an honest-looking old Turkish cavals of the consulate, and a shifty Armenian, who, on the strength of his alleged skill in cookery, demanded exorbitantly high wages. We chose the Turk, agreeing to pay him one Turkish pound a week, to guarantee this payment for six months, and to defray his expenses back to Trebizond from any point at which we might finally leave him. It was a rash agreement, and might have caused us more trouble than it actually did, but there seemed to be no better alternative, seeing that a servant was an absolute necessity. The old Turk's real name was Omar, but, having regard to the detestation in which this name is held in Persia, for he whom Sunnite Mohammedans account the second caliph, or successor of the prophet, is regarded by the sect of the Shia as the worst of evildoers and usurpers. It was decided that he should henceforth bear the more auspicious name of Ali the darling hero of the persian shiites the repetition of the following curse on the three first caliphs of the sunnis is accounted by persian shiites as a pious exercise of singular virtue 
O God, curse Omar, then Abu Bakr, and Omar, then Othman, and Omar, then Omar, then Omar. As for our old servant's character, viewed in the light of subsequent experience, I do him but justice when I express my conviction that a more honest, straightforward, faithful, loyal soul could not easily be found anywhere. But, on the other hand, he was rather fidgety, rather obstinate, too old to travel in a strange country, adapt himself to new surroundings and learn a new language, and too simple to cope with the astute and wily Persians, whom, moreover, religious and national prejudices caused him ever to regard with unconquerable aversion. This business concluded, we had still to get our passports for the interior. Hekimion accompanied us to the government offices, where, while a courteous old Turk entertained me with coffee and conversation, a shrewd-looking subordinate noted down the details of our personal appearance in the spaces reserved for that purpose on the passport. I was amused on receiving the document to find my religion described as English and my moustache as fresh, ter, but not altogether pleased at the entries in the head and chin columns, which respectively were top, bullet-shaped, and deirmen, round. Before leaving the government house, we paid our respects to Sururi Effendi, the governor of Trebizond, one of the judges who tried and condemned the wise and patriotic Midat Pasha. He was a fine-looking old man, and withal courteous, but he is reputed to be corrupt and bigoted. In the evening, at the hotel, we made the acquaintance of a Belgian mining engineer, who had lived for some time in Persia. The account which he gave of that country and its inhabitants was far from encouraging. I have travelled in many lands, he said, and have discovered some good qualities in every people, with the exception of the Persians, in whom I have failed to find a single admirable characteristic. Their very language bears witness against them, and exposes the sordidness of their minds. When they wish to thank you, they say, L'autre fait May your kindness be increased. That is, may you give me something more. And when they desire to support an assertion with an oath, they say, Bejone azize chodat. By thy precious life, or Bemarge shomal. By your death. That is, may you die if I speak untruly. Apart from the doubtful justice of judging a people by the idioms of their language, it may be pointed out that, with regard to the two last expressions, they are based on the idea that to swear by one's own life or death would be to swear by a thing of little value compared to the life or death of a friend and they would be as indifferent to your death as to the truth of their own assertions. Although we were ready to start on the following day, we were prevented from doing so by a steady downpour of rain. Having completed all our arrangements, we paid a visit to the Persian consulate, in company with Mr. Longworth. In answer to our inquiry as to whether our passports required his visa, the Persian consul signified that this was essential, and, for the sum of one mejidiye apiece, endorsed each of them with a lengthy inscription so tastefully executed that it seemed a pity that, during the whole period of our sojourn in Persia, no one asked to see them. Though perfectly useless and unnecessary, the visa, as a specimen of calligraphy, was cheap at the price. Next day, Friday 7th October, the rain had ceased, and at an early hour we were plunged in the confusion 
without which as it would seem not even the smallest caravan can start the muleteers who had been urging us to hasten our preparations disappeared so soon as everything was ready when they had been found and brought back it was discovered that no bridle had been provided for h s horse for though both of us had brought saddles from england he had thought that it would be better to use a native bridle eventually one was procured and about nine a m we emerged from the little crowd which had been watching our proceedings with a keen interest and rode out of the town our course lay for a little while along the coast until we reached the mouth of the valley of khush oglan which we entered turning to the south the beauty of the day which the late rains had rendered pleasantly cool combined with the novelty of the scene and the picturesque appearance of the people whom we met on the road raised our spirits and completely removed certain misgivings as to the wisdom of choosing this route which when it was too late to draw back had taken possession of my mind the horses which we rode were good and leaving the muleteers and baggage behind we pushed on until at two thirty p m we reached the pretty little village of jevizlik the first halting place out of trebizond here we should have halted for the night but since the muleteers had not informed us of their plans and it was still early we determined to proceed to khamsekui and accordingly continued our course up the beautiful wooded valley towards the pass of zigona dog which gleamed before us white with newly fallen snow during the latter part of the day we fell in with a wild-looking horseman who informed me that he like all the inhabitants of khamsekui was a christian it was quite dark before we reached khamsekui and it took us some little time to find a khan at which to rest for the night the muleteers and baggage were far behind and at first it seemed probable that we should have to postpone our supper till their arrival or else do without it altogether however ali presently succeeded in obtaining some bread and also a few eggs which he fried in oil so that with the whisky in our flasks we fared better than might have been expected at about nine p m the muleteers arrived and demanded to see me at once they were very tired and very angry because we had not waited for them at jevizlik i did not at first easily understand the cause of their indignation for this was my first experience of this kind of travelling and my ideas about the capacity of horses were rather vague till it was explained to me that at the present rate of proceeding both men and animals would be wearied out long before we reached erzerum oh my soul said the elder muleteer in conclusion more in sorrow than in anger a fine novice art thou if thou thinkest that these horses can go so swiftly from morning till evening without rest or food henceforth let us proceed in company at a slower pace by which means we shall all please god reach erzurum with safety and comfort in seven days even as was agreed between us not much pleased at being thus admonished but compelled to admit the justice of the muleteer's remarks i betook myself to the wolseley valise which i had after much deliberation selected as the form of bed most suitable for the journey excellent as this contrivance is and invaluable as it proved to be my first night in it was anything but comfortable as i intended to stuff with straw the space left for that purpose beneath the lining i had neglected to bring a mattress straw however was not forthcoming and i was therefore painfully conscious of every irregularity in the ill-paved floor while the fleas which invest most turkish khans did not fail on this occasion to welcome the advent 
of the stranger in spite of these discomforts and the novelty of my surroundings i soon fell fast asleep looking back at those first days of my journey in the light of fuller experience i marvel at the discomforts which we readily endured and even courted by our ignorance and lack of foresight bewildered by conflicting counsels as to equipment i had finally resolved to take only what appeared absolutely essential and to reduce our baggage to the smallest possible compass prepared by what i had read in books of eastern travel to endure discomforts far exceeding any which i was actually called upon to experience i had yet to learn how comfortably one may travel even in countries where the railroad and the hotel are unknown yet i do not regret this experience which at least taught me how few are the necessaries of life and how needless are many of those things which we are accustomed to regard as such indeed i am by no means certain that the absence of many luxuries which we commonly regard as indispensable to our happiness is not fully compensated for by the freedom from care and hurry the continual variety of scenery and costume and the sense of health produced by exposure to the open air which taken together constitute the irresistible charm of eastern travel on the following morning we were up betimes and after a steep ascent of an hour or so reached the summit of the pass of zigona dog which was thickly covered with a dazzling garment of snow here we passed a little khan which would have been our second resting place had we halted at javizlik on the preceding day instead of pushing on to khansekui as it was however we passed it without stopping and commenced the descent to the village of zigonakui where we halted for an hour to rest and refresh ourselves and the horses excellent fruit and coffee were obtainable here and as we had yielded to the muleteer's request that we would not separate ourselves from the baggage we had our own provisions as well and altogether fared much better than on the previous day after the completion of our meal we proceeded on our journey and towards evening reached the pretty little hamlet of kupriboshi situated on a river called from the town of ardessa through which it flows ardessa irmari in which we enjoyed the luxury of a bathe the inhabitants of this delightful spot were few in number peaceable in appearance and totally devoid of that inquisitiveness about strangers which is so characteristic of the persians although it can hardly be the case that many europeans pass through their village they scarcely looked at us and asked but few questions as to our business nationality or destination this lack of curiosity which so far as my experience goes usually characterizes the turkish peasant extends to all his surroundings inquiries as to the name of a wayside flower or the fate of a traveller whose last resting place was marked by a mound of earth at the roadside were alike met with a half scornful half amused kimbilir who knows indicative of surprise on the part of the person addressed at being questioned on a matter in which as it did not concern himself he felt no interest in persia more especially in southern persia it is quite otherwise and whether right or wrong an ingenious answer is usually forthcoming to the traveller's inquiries our third day's march took us first through the town of ardessa and then through the village of demirji suyu on emerging from which we were confronted and stopped by two most evil-looking individuals armed to the teeth with pistols and daggers my first idea was that they were robbers but on riding forward to ascertain their business i discovered that they were excisemen of a kind called dik taban whose business it is 
to watch for and seize tobacco which does not bear the stamp of the Ottoman regie. It appeared that someone, either from malice or a misdirected sense of humour, had laid information against us, alleging that we had in our possession a quantity of such tobacco. A violent altercation took place between the excisemen and our servant Ali, whose pockets they insisted on searching, and whose tobacco pouch was torn in two in the struggle. Meanwhile, the muleteers continued to manifest the most ostentatious eagerness to unload our baggage and submit it to examination, until finally, by protestations and remonstrances, we prevailed on the custom house officers to let us pass. The cause of the muleteers' unnecessary eagerness to open our baggage now became apparent. Sidling up to my horse, one of these honest fellows triumphantly showed me a great bag of smuggled tobacco, which he had secreted in his pocket. I asked him what he would have done if it had been detected, whereat he tapped the stock of a pistol which was thrust into his belt with a sinister and suggestive smile. Although I could not help being amused at his cool impudence, I was far from being reassured by the warlike propensities which this gesture revealed. Continuing on our way, and still keeping near the river, we passed one or two old castles, situated on rocky heights, which, we were informed, had been built by the Genoese. Towards noon, we entered the valley of Gumishkhane, so called from the silver mines which occur in the neighbourhood. This valley is walled in by steep and rocky cliffs, and is barren and arid, except near the river, which is surrounded by beautiful orchards. Indeed, the pears and apples of Gumishkhane are celebrated throughout the district. We passed several prosperous-looking villages, at one of which we halted for lunch. Here, for the first time, I tasted petmez, a kind of treacle or syrup made from fruit. In Persia, this is known as dushab, or shire. It is not unpalatable, and we used occasionally to eat it with boiled rice as a substitute for pudding. Here also, we fell in with a respectable-looking Armenian going on foot to Erzerum anyone worse equipped for a journey of a hundred and fifty miles on foot i never saw he wore a black frock coat and a fez his feet were shod with slippers down at the heels and to protect himself from the heat of the sun he carried a large white umbrella he looked so hot and tired and dusty i was moved to compassion and asked him whether he would not like to ride my horse for a while. This offer he gladly accepted, whereupon I dismounted and walked for a few miles, until he announced that he was sufficiently rested and would proceed on foot. He was so grateful for this indulgence that he bore us company as far as Erzerum, and would readily have followed us farther had we encouraged him to do so. Every day, H. and myself allowed him to ride for some distance on our horses, and the poor man's journey was, I trust, thereby rendered less fatiguing to him. During the latter part of the day, our course lay through a most gloomy and desolate valley, walled in with red rocks and utterly devoid of trees or verdure. Emerging from this, and passing another fine old castle, situated on a lofty and precipitous crag, we arrived about 5 p.m. at the little hamlet of Tekke, where we halted for the night. It is rather a miserable place, containing several khans swarming with Persian camel drivers, but very few private houses. A shallow river which runs near it again enabled us to enjoy the luxury of a bathe. Our fourth day's march was very dreary, 
lying for the most part through gloomy ravines walled in with reddish rocks like that which we had traversed at the end of the previous day's journey in addition to the depressing character of the scene there was a report that robbers were lurking in the neighbourhood and we were consequently joined by several pedestrians all armed to the teeth who sought safety in numbers shortly after noon we halted at a small roadside inn where we obtained some cheese and a not very savoury compound called kawurma which consists of small square lumps of mutton embedded in fat at three p m we reached the solitary khan of qadarak which was to be our halting place for the night a few zabtiyas were lounging about outside waiting for the post which was expected to pass shortly as it was still early i went out into the balcony to write my diary and contemplate the somewhat cheerless view but i was soon interrupted by our armenian fellow-traveller who came to tell me that the zabtiers outside were watching my proceedings with no favourable eye and suspected that i was drawing maps of the country he therefore advised me either to stop writing or to retire indoors lest my diary should be seized and destroyed whether the armenian spoke the truth or whether he was merely indulging that propensity to revile the ruling race for which the christian subjects of the port are conspicuous i had no means of deciding so i thought it best to follow his advice and retire from the balcony till i had completed my writing our fifth day's march led us through the interesting old armenian village of varzahan just before reaching this we passed several horsemen who were engaged in wild and apparently purposeless evolutions accompanied with much firing of guns it appeared that these had come out to welcome the qaim maqam of diyadin who had been dismissed from office and was returning to his native town of Gyumishkhane, and we had scarcely passed them when he appeared in sight, met, and passed us. I wish to examine the curious old churches which still bear witness that Varzahan, notwithstanding its present decayed condition, must formerly have been a place of some importance. Our Armenian fellow-traveller, offered to conduct me and i was glad to avail myself of his guidance after i had examined the strange construction of the churches the armenian inscriptions cut here and there on their walls and the tombstones which surrounded them amongst which were several carved in the form of a sheep my companion suggested that we should try and obtain some refreshment although i was anxious to overtake our caravan i yielded to his importunity and followed him into a large and dimly lighted room to which we only obtained admission after prolonged knocking the door was at length opened by an old man with whom my companion conversed for a while in armenian after he had bidden me to be seated presently several other men all armed to the teeth entered the room and seated themselves by the door a considerable time elapsed and still no signs of food appeared the annoyance which i felt at this useless delay gradually gave way to a vague feeling of alarm this was heightened by the fact that i was unable to comprehend the drift of the conversation which was still carried on in armenian i began to wonder whether i had been enticed into a trap where i could be robbed at leisure and to speculate on the chances of escape or resistance in case such an attempt should be made i could not but feel that these were slender for i had no weapon except a small pocket revolver five or six armed men sat by the heavy wooden door which had been closed and for anything that i knew bolted 
and even should I succeed in effecting an exit, I knew that our caravan must have proceeded a considerable distance. My apprehensions were, however, relieved by the appearance of a bowl of yogurt, curds, and a quantity of the insipid, wafer-like bread called lavosh. Having eaten, we rose to go, and when my companion, whom I had suspected of harbouring such sinister designs against my property and perhaps my life, refused to let me pay for our refreshment, I was filled with shame at my unwarranted suspicions. On emerging once more into the road, I found the faithful Ali patiently awaiting me. Perhaps he too had been doubtful of the honesty of the Armenian villagers. At any rate, he had refused to proceed without me. About 2 p.m. we arrived at the town of Bayburt, and found that H. and the muleteers had already taken up their quarters at a clean and well-built khan owned by one Khalil Afendi. We at once proceeded to explore the town, which lies at the foot of a hill surmounted by an old fortress. Being too lazy to climb this hill, we contented ourselves with strolling through the bazaars, which form so important a feature of every eastern town, and afford so sure an index of the degree of prosperity which it enjoys. We were accompanied by the indefatigable Armenian, who, thinking to give me pleasure, exerted himself to collect a crowd of Persians, mostly natives of Khui and Tabriz, whom he incited to converse with me. A throng of idlers soon gathered round us to gaze and gape at our unfamiliar aspect and dress, which some, bolder or less polite than the rest, stretched out their hands to finger and feel. Anxious to escape, I took refuge in a barber's shop and demanded a shave, but the crowd again assembled outside the open window and continued to watch the proceeding with sustained interest. Meanwhile, Ali had not been idle, and on our return to the Khan, we enjoyed better fare, as well as better quarters, than had fallen to our lot since we left Trebizond. Our sixth day's march commenced soon after daybreak. The early morning was chilly, but later on the sun shone forth in a cloudless sky, and the day grew hot. The first part of our way lay near the river which flows through Bay Burt, and the scenery was a great improvement on anything that we had seen since leaving Gyumishkhane. We halted for our midday rest and refreshment by a clump of willow trees in a pleasant grassy meadow by the river. On resuming our march, we entered a narrow defile leading into the mountains of Kup Dog. A gradual ascent brought us to the summit of the pass, just below which, on the farther side, we came to our halting place, Pasha Punari, the view of the surrounding mountains standing out against the clear evening sky was very beautiful, and the little Khan at which we alighted was worthy of its delightful situation. We were lodged in a sort of barn, in which was stored a quantity of hay. How fragrant and soft it seemed! I still think of that night's sleep as one of the soundest and sweetest in my experience. Early on the morning of the seventh day, we resumed our march along a circuitous road, which, after winding downwards amongst grassy hills, followed the course of a river surrounded by stunted trees. We saw numerous large birds of the falcon kind, called by the Turks Dogon. One of these H brought down with his rifle while it was hovering in the air, to the great delight of the muleteers. At a village called Oshkala, we purchased honey, bread, and grapes, which we consumed while halting for the midday rest by an old bridge. Continuing on our way by the river, 
we were presently joined by a turbaned and genial Turk, who was travelling on horseback from Gyumish Khane to Erzerum. I was pleased to hear him use, in the course of conversation, certain words which I had hitherto only met with in the writings of the old poet Fuzuli of Baghdad, and which I had regarded as archaic and obsolete. The road gradually became more frequented than it had been since leaving Bayburt, and we passed numerous travellers and peasants. Many of the latter drove bullock carts, of which the ungreased axles sent forth the most excruciating sound. The sun had set before we reached our halting place, Yeni Khan, and so full was it that we had some difficulty in securing a room to ourselves. End of section three. Recording by Nicholas James Bridgewater. Recorded in London, England. Section four of A Year Amongst the Persians by Edward Granville Brown. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nicholas James Bridgewater. A Year Amongst the Persians by Edward Granville Brown. Section four. The eighth day of our march which was to conclude the first portion of our journey, saw us in the saddle betimes. After riding for four hours through a scorched-up plain, we arrived about 10.30 a.m. at the large village of Ilija, so named from its hot springs over which a bath had been erected. From this point, the gardens and minarets of Erzerum were plainly visible, and accordingly we pushed on without halting. Fully three hours elapsed, however, ere we had traversed the weary stretch of white dusty road which still separated us from our goal, and the sun was well past the meridian when we finally entered the gate of the city, and threaded our way through the massive fortifications by which it is surrounded. Erzerum has one hotel which stands midway in the scale of development between the Hotel d'Italie at Trebizond and an average caravanserai. Were these two towns connected by a railroad so as to bring them within a day's journey of one another, this institution might perhaps form a happy transition between the west and the east. As things are at present, it is too much like a caravanserai to be comfortable, and too much like a casino to be quiet. On alighting at this delectable house of entertainment, we were met by a young Armenian representing the bank on which our cheque was drawn, who informed us in very fair French that his name was Misak Venetian, and that his principal, Simon Dermunukian, had been apprised of our coming by a letter from Trebizond, and instructed to give us some help as we might need. After a brief conversation in the balcony of a coffee-room thronged with Turkish officers and enlivened by the strains of a semi-oriental band, he departed, inviting us to visit his chief so soon as we were at leisure. We now requested an attendant to show us to our room, and were forthright conducted to a large, dingy, uncarpeted apartment on the first floor lighted by several windows looking out upon the street and containing for its sole furniture a divan covered with faded chintz which ran the whole length of one side and a washing-stand 
placed in a curtained recess on the other. It was already occupied by a Turkish mudir, bound for the frontier fortress of Bayezid, whom the landlord was trying to dislodge so that we might take possession. This he very naturally resented, but when I apologized and offered to withdraw, he was at once mollified, declared that there was plenty of room for all of us, and politely retired, leaving us to perform our ablutions in private. Just as we were ready to go out, an officer of the Turkish police called to inspect our passports. So, while H. went to visit Mr. Deve, the acting British consul, I remained to entertain the visitor with coffee and cigarettes, an attention which he seemed to appreciate, for he readily gave the required visa, and then sat conversing with me till H. returned from the consulate. We next paid a visit to our banker, Simon Dermunukian, called by the Turks Simun Aga, a fine-looking old man who only spoke Turkish and Armenian, and whose appearance would have led one to suppose that the former, rather than the latter, was his native tongue. After the ordinary interchange of civilities, we drew a cheque for three or four pounds, and returned to the hotel to settle with the muleteers. On the way to Erzerum, these had frequently expressed a wish to go with us as far as Tehran, but since their arrival they had been so alarmed by fabulous accounts of the dangers of travelling in Persia, the inhospitality of the country, and the malignant disposition of the people, that they made no further allusion to this plan, and on receiving the money due to them, together with a small gratuity, took leave of us with expressions of gratitude and esteem. After a thoroughly Turkish dinner, I again proposed to go out, but the mudir told me that this was impossible, as the streets were not lighted, and no one was allowed to walk abroad after nightfall without a lantern. He offered, however, to introduce me to some acquaintances of his, who occupied an adjoining room. One of these was a Turk who spoke Persian, with a fluency and correctness rarely attained by his countrymen. The other was a Christian of Caesarea. Both were men of intelligence, and their conversation interested me so much that it was late before I retired to rest on the chintz-covered divan, which I would gladly have exchanged for the fragrant hay of Pasha Punari. Next day our troubles began. The news that two Englishmen were about to start for Persia had got abroad, and crowds of muleteers, Persians, Turks, and Armenians came to offer their services for this journey. The scene of turmoil which our room presented during the whole morning baffles description. While our ears were deafened with the clamour of voices, it was like the noisiest bazaar imaginable, with this difference, that whereas one can escape from the din of a bazaar when it becomes insupportable, this turmoil followed us wherever we went. An Armenian called Vartan demanded the exorbitant sum of five pounds Turkish per horse to Tabriz. A Persian offered to convey us thither in a mighty wagon which he possessed, wherein, he declared, we should perform the journey with inconceivable ease. This statement, which I was from the first but little disposed to credit, was subsequently denied in the most categorical manner by our friend the Mudir, who assured me that he had once essayed to travel in such a vehicle, but had been so roughly jolted during the first stage that he had sworn never again to set foot in it, and had completed his journey on horseback. Any lingering regrets which we might have entertained at having renounced the prospect of inconceivable ease held out to us 
by the owner of the wagon were entirely dispelled some days later by the sight of a similar vehicle hopelessly stuck and abandoned by its possessor in the middle of a river which we had to ford at length partly because no better offer seemed forthcoming partly from a desire to have done with the matter and enjoy a little peace and quietude for the remainder of our stay in erzerum we accepted the terms proposed by a persian muleteer called farach who proposed to supply us with five horses to tabriz for two pounds turkish and two mejidiyes a head to convey us thither in twelve days and to allow us the right of stopping for two days on the road at whatever place we might choose i now flattered myself that i should be allowed a little peace but i found that i had reckoned without my host no sooner had i satisfied myself as to the efficiency of farach's animals agreed to the terms proposed by him and accepted the pe a pledge of money which it is customary for the muleteer to place in the hands of his client as a guarantee that he will hold to the bargain and be prepared to start on the appointed day then our ears were assailed on all sides with aspersions on the honesty and respectability of the successful candidate farach so i was assured was a native of the village of seivan near khuy and the seivan lees were as was well known the wickedest most faithless and most dishonest people in persia in this assertion all the muleteers present agreed the only difference being that while the persians rested content with the reprobation of the savon lees the non-persians further emphasized it by adding that the persians were the wickedest most faithless and most dishonest people in the world at first i paid no attention to these statements but my suspicions were in some degree aroused by farach's disinclination to go before the persian consul and by the doubts expressed by venetian and simun Agha as to his honesty and trustworthiness with venetian i was somewhat annoyed because he being present when i engaged farach had withheld his advice till it was too late to be useful i therefore told him that he should either have spoken sooner or not at all to which he replied that it was still possible to rescind the bargain farach was accordingly summoned and requested to take back his pledge this however he resolutely declined to do and i could not help admitting that he was in the right finally venetian desisted from his attempts to annul the contract and indeed retracted to some extent the objections which he had raised against it what motive impelled him to this change of front i cannot say and i am unwilling to credit an assertion made to me by farach a few days later to the effect that the armenian's sole object in these manoeuvres was to extort a bribe from the poor muleteer and that having obtained this he was content to withdraw all opposition although these annoyances combined with a temporary indisposition due probably to the badness of the water supply somewhat marred the pleasure of our stay at erzerum the kindness shown us by mr deve the british consul and mr chambers an american missionary and his wife rendered it much more agreeable than it would otherwise have been before leaving we paid a visit to the persian consul who received us very courteously and gave us a letter to pasha khan of ovadek the persian warden of the marches from whom he added we should receive an escort to conduct us to khui should this be necessary beyond khui the country was perfectly safe and no such protection would be required the consul next inquired whether we were travelling with our own horses or with hired animals and on learning 
that the latter was the case, insisted on summoning the muleteer to admonish him. Knowing that Farach was unwilling to appear before the consul, I ventured to deprecate this proceeding, and made as though I had forgotten the muleteer's name. The consul, however, insisted, and at once dispatched some of his servants to make inquiries. These returned in a surprisingly short space of time, bringing with them the muleteer, whose appearance indicated the utmost disquietude. After demanding his name and that of his native place, the consul asked him whether it was true that he had promised to convey us to Tabriz in twelve days, and whether, if so, he had any intention of keeping this promise. To these questions, the muleteer replied, in a voice trembling with fear, that, perhaps, inshallah, we would do so. This statement was received by the consul with derision. You lie, Mr. Perhaps, cried he. You eat dirt, Mr. Inshallah. Hence, rascal, and be assured that if I hear any complaints about you, you shall give a full account of your conduct to me on your return to Erzerum. Whether in consequence of this admonition, or whether, as I believe, because the muleteer was really an honest fellow, we certainly had no cause for complaint, and, indeed, we were glad to re-engage Farach at Tabriz for the journey to Tehran. On Monday, 17th October, we quitted Erzerum. In consequence of the difficulty of getting fairly under way, to which I have already alluded, it is usual to make the first stage a very short one. Indeed, it is often merely what the Persians call Nagle Makan, change of place, a breaking up of one's quarters, a bidding farewell to one's friends, and a shaking oneself free from the innumerable delays which continue to arise as long as one is within the walls of an eastern town. We therefore did not expect to get farther than Hassan Qal'a, which is about three hours' ride from Erzerum. Before we had finished our leave-taking and settled the hotel bill, which only reached the modest sum of a hundred and eight piastres, about one pound sterling, for the two of us and Ali for three days, the rest of the caravan had disappeared, and it was only on emerging from the town that I was able to take note of those who composed it. There were, besides the muleteers, our friend the mudir and his companions and servants, who were bound for Bayezid, a Turkish zabtiye who was to escort us as far as Hassan Qal'a and three Persians proceeding to Tabriz. Of these last, one was a decrepit old man, the other two were his sons. In spite of the somewhat ludicrous appearance given to the old man by a long white beard, of which the lower half was dyed red with henna, the cause which had led him to undertake so long a journey, in spite of his advanced age, commanded respect and sympathy. His two sons had gone to Trebizond for purposes of trade, and had there settled. And although he had written to them, repeatedly entreating them to return to Tabriz, they had declined to comply with his wishes until eventually he had determined to go himself, and, if possible, persuade them to return home with him. In this attempt he had met with the success which he so well deserved. As we advanced towards the low pass of Deve Boyun, the camel's neck, over which our road lay, I was much impressed with the mighty redoubts which crowned the heights to the north-east and east of Erzerum, 
many of which have, I believe, been erected since the Russian war. Beyond these, and such instruction and amusement as I could derive from our travelling companions, there was little to break the monotony of the road till we arrived at our halting place about 3 p.m. As the Khan was full, we were obliged to be content with quarters even less luxurious, and even there the mudir, with prudent forethought, secured the best room for himself and his companions. Hassan Qal'a is, like Ilija, which is about equidistant from Erzurum on the other side, remarkable for its natural hot springs, over which a bath had been erected. The mudir was anxious to visit these springs, and invited us to accompany him. To this I agreed, but H, not feeling well, preferred to remain quiet. The bath consists of a circular basin, twenty-five or thirty feet in diameter, surrounded with masonry and roofed in by a dome. In the summit of the dome was a large aperture through which we could see the stars shining. The water, which is almost as hot as one can bear with comfort, bubbles up from the centre of the basin, and is everywhere out of one's depth. After a most refreshing bathe, we returned to our quarters. Next day we started about 6 a.m., and were presently joined by a Turkish mufti, proceeding to Bayezid, with whom I conversed for some time in Persian, which he spoke very incorrectly and with great effort. He was, however, an amusing companion, and his conversation beguiled the time pleasantly enough till we halted about midday at a large, squalid Armenian village called Kumasur. Our Turkish fellow travellers occupied the Mosafer Oda, or guest room, and intimated to us that they wished to be left undisturbed for their midday devotions, so we were compelled to be content with a stable. As the rest of the caravan had not yet come up, we had nothing for lunch but a few biscuits and a little brandy and water, which we fortunately had with us. Several of the Armenian villagers came to see us. They were apathetic and dull, presenting a sad contrast to the Armenians of the towns. They talked much of their grievances, especially of the rapacity of the Multezim, or tax-gatherer of the district, who had, as they declared, mortally wounded one of the villagers a few days previously because he had brought eight piastres short of the sum due from him. They said that the heaviest tax was on cereals, amounting to one in eight of their total value, and that, for the privilege of collecting this, the tax-gatherer paid a certain fixed sum to the government, and made what profit he could. Quitting this unhappy spot, as soon as the rest of our caravan appeared, we again joined the Mudir's party, which had been further reinforced by a Chavush, sergeant, and two Zabtiers, one of whom kept breaking out into snatches of song in the shrillest voice I ever heard. For some time we succeeded in keeping up with these, who were advancing at a pace impossible for the baggage animals but presently our horses began to flag, and we were finally left behind, in some doubt as to the road which we should follow. Shortly after this, my horse, in going down a hill to a river, fell violently and threw me on my face. I picked myself up and remounted, but having proceeded some distance, discovered that my watch was gone having probably been torn out of my pocket when I fell. We rode back and sought diligently for it, but without success, and while we were still so occupied, 
Farach the muleteer came up with Ali. These joined us in the fruitless attempt to find the lost watch, the former attributing my misfortune to the inconsiderate haste of the mudir, the latter attempting to console me with the philosophical reflection that some evil had evidently been destined to befall me, and that the loss of the watch had probably averted a more serious catastrophe. At length, the near approach of the sun to the horizon warned us that we must tarry no longer. And though we made as much haste as possible, it was dark before we reached the village of Delhi Baba. Here we obtained lodgings in a large stable, at one side of which was a wooden platform, raised some two feet above the ground and covered with a felt carpet. On this our host spread cushions and pillows, but the hopes of a comfortable night's rest which these preparations raised in our minds were not destined to be fulfilled, for the stable was full of fowls and the fowls swarmed with fleas. There were also several buffaloes in the stable, and these apparently were endowed with carnivorous insects, for during the night they ate up some cold meat, which was to have served us for breakfast. At this place I tasted buffalo's milk for the first time. It is very rich, but has a peculiar flavour, which is, to my mind, very disagreeable. On starting the next day, we found that the mudir, who had obtained quarters elsewhere in the village, had already set out. Neither did we again overtake him. Soon after leaving our halting place, we entered a magnificent defile leading into the mountains and surrounded by precipitous crags. On the summit of one of these crags, which lay to our left, was a ruined castle, said to have been formerly a stronghold of the celebrated bandit minstrel Kuroglu. The face of the rock showed numerous cave-like apertures apparently enlarged if not made by the hand of man and possibly communicating with the interior of the castle about noon we reached a kurdish village situated amidst grassy uplands at the summit of the pass and here we halted for a rest most of the male inhabitants were out on the hills looking after their flocks but the women gathered round us, staring, laughing, and chattering Kurdish. Some few of them knew a little Turkish, and asked us if we had any munjas to give them. This word, which I did not understand, appeared to denote some kind of ornament. On quitting this village, our way led us through fertile uplands, covered thinly with low shrubs on which hundreds of draught animals were feeding. The bales of merchandise, unladen from their backs, were piled up in hollow squares, in and around which the Persian camel drivers were resting, till such time as the setting of the sun, for camels rarely travel by day, should give the signal for departure. A little further on, we passed one of the battlefields of the Russian war, and were shown an earthwork close to the road, where we were told that Foreg Pasha had been killed. Soon after this, on rounding a corner, the mighty snow-covered cone of Mount Ararat burst upon our view across a wide hill-girt plain, into which we now began to descend. During this descent, we came upon a party of Kurdish mountbanks, surrounded by a crowd of peasants. In the midst of the group, a little girl in a bright red dress was performing a dance on stilts to the sound of wild music, produced by a drum and a flute. It was a pretty sight, and one which I would fain have watched for a time but the muleteers were anxious to reach the end of our day's journey, and indeed it was already dusk when we arrived at the village of Zaiti Kyan. 
the inhabitants of this place were as we entered it engaged in a violent altercation the cause of which i did not ascertain while a few turkish zabtiyas were making strenuous efforts to disperse them in which they eventually succeeded it was only after ali had been to half the houses in the village that he succeeded in obtaining a lodging for us in the house of a poor armenian family who were content to share with us their only room as usual no sort of privacy was possible numbers of people coming in to stare at us question us and watch us eat next day's march was both short and uninteresting at two p m we reached the large squalid village of Qara Kilisa. As the day was still young, and the place far from attractive, we were anxious to proceed farther, but this the muleteers declined to do, answering, after the manner of their class, that they had agreed to take us to Tabriz in twelve days from Erzerum, and that this they would do, but that for the rest we must allow them to arrange the stages as they thought fit. Farach concluded the argument by making a propitiatory gift of a melon, which he had just received from a fellow countryman whom he had met on the road, and, half amused, half annoyed, I was obliged to acquiesce in his arrangement. We obtained wretched quarters in the house of a very ill-favoured and inquisitive Armenian, and, after allaying our ill humour with tea, strolled through the village to see the Yuzbashi, or captain of the police, about securing a Zabtier as an escort for the morrow. From him we learned that our friend the Mudir had not forgotten us, for on his way through the village that morning he had left instructions that we were to be provided with a Zabtier, should we require one. The dustiness of the streets, combined with the inquisitiveness of the inhabitants, soon drove us back to our lodging, where a night disturbed by innumerable fleas concluded a miserable day. In spite of our desire to quit so unattractive a spot, we did not start till 7.45 a.m., a much later hour than usual partly because we knew that the stage before us was a short one and had no reason to anticipate better quarters at the end of it than those we were leaving partly because ali's whip had disappeared and could not be found till our host was informed that no money would be paid him until it was forthcoming whereupon it was speedily produced we were accompanied by a fine old armenian zabtier who presented a thoroughly soldierly as well as a very picturesque appearance the scenery through which we passed reminded me more of england or scotland than anything which i had seen since leaving home close to the road ran a beautiful clear river rippling down over its stony bed to join the western euphrates on either side of this lay undulating grassy hills beyond which appeared in the distance more lofty mountains. The warm cloudy day too, and the thin mists which lay on the hills, favoured the fancy that we were back once more in our native land. About 1 p.m. we reached our halting place, Toshli Choi, and found lodgings in a gloomy hovel which served the double purpose of a resting place for guests and a stable for buffaloes. The people, however, were better than the place. Our host was an old Persian with henna-dyed beard and nails, who manifested his good feeling toward us by plunging his hand with an introductory besmelah into a dish of poached eggs, which was set before us for luncheon his son a bright handsome lad of sixteen or seventeen made every effort to enliven us and on my inquiring whether there were any fish in the river offered to conduct us thither and show us not only where they were but how to catch them having collected several other youths 
he commenced operations by constructing a dam of stones and turf half across the river at a point where it was divided into two branches by a bed of shingle the effect of this was to direct the bulk of the water into the left-hand channel while the depth of that which remained in the right-hand channel at the lower end of which a boy was stationed to beat the water with a stick and so prevent the imprisoned fish from effecting their escape sunk to a few inches having completed these preparations the operators entered the water with sticks in their hands struck at the fish as they darted past thereby killing or stunning them and then picked them up and tossed them on to the bank one lad had a sort of gaff wherewith he hooked the fish very dexterously in less than an hour we had nearly fifty fish several of which must have weighed two and a half or three pounds some of these we ate for supper others we gave to the muleteers and to our fellow travellers they were not unpalatable and made a pleasing change from the fowls and eggs of which our fare had so long consisted although our lodging was not much superior in point of cleanliness and comfort to that of the preceding night it was with something like regret that i bade farewell to the kindly folk of Toshli Choi. Farach had started on in front with the baggage, leaving his brother Faisullah, of whom we had hitherto seen but little, to bear us company. This Faisullah was a smooth-faced, narrow-eyed, smug-looking, sturdy rascal, whose face wore a perpetual and intolerable grin, and whose head was concealed rather than crowned by the large low conical long-haired pawpaw which constitutes the usual headdress of the peasants inhabiting that region which lies just beyond the turco-persian frontier we were also accompanied by a turkish zabtiyeh who proved to be unusually intelligent for when we were come opposite to the village of Uchkilisa, which lies on the farther side of the river, he told us that there was an old Armenian church there which was worth looking at, and that we should by no means neglect to pay our respects to an aged Armenian ecclesiastic entitled by him the Morachas Effendi, who, as he assured us, enjoyed such influence in the neighbourhood that were he to give the command a hundred men would escort us to tabriz we therefore turned aside from our course to the infinite disgust of faisullah whose only desire was to reach the end of the stage as soon as possible and first proceeded to the church this was a fine old building but it had suffered at the hands of the Kurds during the Russian war, and the beautiful designs and paintings with which it had before that time been adorned had, for the most part, been destroyed by fire. Leaving the church, we passed the house and mill of the Morachas Effendi, who, on hearing our approach, came out to meet us, and begged us to enter his house and partake of some refreshment the opposition offered by faisullah to any further delay compelled us to decline his hospitality yet would he scarcely take nay for an answer saying that he was ashamed to let strangers pass by without alighting at his house finally seeing that we were firm in our resolve he bade us farewell with the words i pray almighty god that he will bring you in safety to tabriz it was with a sense of comfort and encouragement that we parted from the venerable and reverend old man but this feeling was presently changed to one of indignation against faisullah who had urged the length of the stage as a reason for hastening on when not much after one thirty p m we arrived at the wretched town of diyadin 
where we were to sleep for the last time on Turkish territory. A more desolate spot I do not think I have ever seen. The dirty, dusty town, which scarcely contains two respectable houses, stands in a barren, treeless waste, and is half encompassed by a vast, crescent-shaped chasm with precipitous sides. Heaps of refuse lie about in all directions, both before the doors of the miserable hovels which compose the town, and amongst the graves of the extensive and neglected cemetery which surrounds it. Of the two respectable houses which I have noticed, one belongs to the governor, the other is the post office. To the latter we paid a visit, and conversed for a while with the postmaster and telegraph clerk, for both functions were united in one individual, who was a Turk of Adrianople. He complained bitterly of the dullness of Diardin, where he had been for two years, and to which a marriage, contracted with a Kurdish girl, had failed to reconcile him. On returning to our lodging, we found that the aperture in the roof, which did duty for window and chimney alike, admitted so much wind and dust that we were compelled to cover it with sacking while to add to our miseries we discovered that all our candles were used up having eaten our supper by the dim light of a little earthenware lamp we therefore had no resource but to seek forgetfulness of our discomforts in sleep next morning twenty third october the seventh day of our departure from erzerum we were in the saddle by six a m my spirits were high, for I knew that before sunset we should enter the land which I had so long and so eagerly desired to behold. The Zabtier who accompanied us, remarkable for an enormous hooked nose, took pains to impress upon us the necessity of keeping well together, as there was some danger of robbers. Presently, on rounding a corner, a glorious view burst upon us. Ararat, which had been hidden from us by lower hills since we first saw it from the heights above Zeti Kyan, lay far to the left, its snowy summit veiled in clouds, which, however, left unconcealed the lower peak of little Ararat. Before us, at the end of the valley, Perched midway up the face of a steep rocky mountain lay the town and fortress of Bayezid, which keeps solitary watch over the northeast frontier of the Turkish Empire. This we did but see afar off, for, while two or three hours' march still separated us from it, we turned sharply to the right into the valley leading to Qizildize, the last village on Turkish soil. At this point we left the telegraph wires, which had, since our departure from Trebizond, kept us company and indicated the course of our road. Soon after midday we reached Ezildize, and leaving our baggage in the custom house, betook ourselves for rest and refreshment to a large and commodious khan. The custom house officials gave us no trouble, but as soon as we were again on the road, Farach informed us, with many lamentations, that they had extracted from him a sum of forty-five piastres, alleging, as a pretext for this extortion, that whereas he had brought seven horses with him on his last journey into Turkey, he was returning with only five that they suspected him of having sold the two missing horses in Turkish territory, and that they should therefore exact from him the duty payable on animals imported into the country for purposes of commerce. It was in vain that Farach protested that the two horses in question had died on the road, for they demanded documentary proof of this assertion which he was unable to produce. 
and indeed to me it seemed an absurd thing to expect a certificate of death for an animal which had perished in the mountains of asia minor the hook-nosed veteran who had accompanied us from diardin had yielded place to a fresh zabtie who rode silently before us for two hours during which we continued to ascend gradually through wild but monotonous hills till on reaching a slight eminence over which the road passed he reined in his horse and turning in his saddle said farther i cannot go with you for this is our frontier and yonder before you lies the persian land end of section four end of chapter two from england to the persian frontier recording by nicholas james bridgewater section five of a year amongst the persians by edward granville brown this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anthony Taubman A Year Amongst the Persians by Edward Granville Brown Chapter 3 From the Persian Frontier to Tabriz Che hosh poshad ke baraz entazori Be omadi rasid omidvori How good it is when one with waiting tired Obtaineth that which he hath long desired Saadi Kunje uzlat ke Talismate ajab dorad, fatahian da nazarehemate devashnast. The talisman of magic might, hid in some ruin's lonely site, emerges from its ancient night at the mild glance of dervishes. Hafiz, rendered by Herman Bicknell. There is always a pleasant sense of excitement and expectation in entering for the first time a foreign country. Especially is this the case when to visit that country has long been the object of one's ambition. Yet that which most sharply marks such a transition and most forcibly reminds the traveller that he is amongst another race, I mean a change of language, is not so observable by one who enters Persia from the northwest. For the inhabitants of the province of Azerbaijan, which forms this portion of the Persian Empire, uniformly employ a dialect of Turkish, which, though differing widely from the speech of the Ottoman Turks, is not so far removed from it as to render either language unintelligible to those who speak the other. If amongst the better classes in the towns of Azerbaijan, and here and there in the villages, the Persian language is understood or spoken, it is as a foreign tongue acquired by study or travel while the narrow, affected enunciation of the vowels, so different from the bold, broad pronunciation of Persia proper, and the introduction of the Y sound after K and G, at once serve to mark the province to which the speaker belongs. It is not until Ghazvin is reached, and only four or five stages separate the traveller from Tehran, that the Persian distinctly predominates over the Turkish language, while even four stages south of the capital, as far as the sacred city of Gom, the latter is still generally understood. The country immediately beyond the frontier was as desolate and devoid of cultivation as that which we had just quitted, and it was not until we reached the Persian frontier village of Ajavit that we have any opportunity of observing that change in, of costume which constitutes the other great sign of entry amongst a new race. Indeed, the approach of night which overtook us ere we reached our destination prevented us even then from getting more than a very partial idea of the differences which distinguish a Persian from a Turkish village. So far as we could see, however, the change was distinctly for the better. The square houses, built of unbaked clay, were clean and commodious, 
while a goodly array of poplar trees gave to the place an appearance of verdure which contrasted pleasantly with our too vivid recollections of the hideous waste of Diadin. Immediately on our arrival, we sent our letter of introduction, which had been given to us by the Persian consul at Erzurum, to Pasha Khan, the Sahadar, or Warden of the Marches, intending to pay our respects to him in the morning before our departure. While we were eating our supper, however, a message came from him to say that he would, if we pleased, receive us at once, as he was in the habit of rising late. As this invitation was practically equivalent to a command, we hastened, in spite of our weariness and disinclination to move, to respond to it, and were presently ushered by our host, who was one of the great man's retainers, into the presence of Pasha Khan, having previously removed our boots on an an intimation from the Farashes, who stood at the door of the presence chamber. We were invited to seat ourselves on the floor opposite the frontier chief, who sat in a corner of the room on the side next the door, reclining on cushions. On one side of him was seated his vazir, on the other a grim-looking secretary, whose face was adorned with a pair of fierce moustaches, and whose hand still held the letter of introduction which he had been reading to Pasha Khan. The warden of the marches conversed with me for a short time, in a somewhat fitful manner, in Persian, inquiring particularly about the terms on which England stood with Russia. Seeing, however, that he was disinclined to prolong the interview, and that he appeared moody and preoccupied, a fact due, as we subsequently learned, to a quarrel which had arisen between him and his brother, we were preparing to take our leave when several servants entered bearing trays of pilau and sherbet, of which, though we had already supped, we were compelled by politeness to partake. The sherbet was excellent, as was also the pilau, consisting of pieces of lamb's flesh buried in rice which we had to eat, awkwardly enough, with our hands. This accomplishment, which, in spite of assiduous efforts, I never succeeded in thoroughly acquiring, is far from being so easy as might at first sight appear. The rice is pressed by the four fingers into a wedge-shaped bolus, which is then thrust into the mouth by an upward motion of the terminal joint of the thumb placed behind it, any grains of rice which remain clinging to the fingers must then be collected by a semicircular sweep of the thumb into another smaller bolus, which is then eaten before a fresh handful of rice is taken up. It is wonderful what dexterity the Persians acquire in this method of eating, which is indeed far more cleanly and convenient than might be supposed. To the foreigner, however, it is hardly less difficult of acquisition than the Persian manner of sitting on the heels, and, if, if on the first attempt we did not meet with the ridicule of our entertainers, it was rather from their politeness than from any dexterity on our part. On the conclusion of the meal we took our leave, Pasha Khan ordering our host in his capacity of Farosh to accompany us on our journey as far as Kara Aine. For this we were very grateful, not so much because we hoped for any advantage from our escort, as because we feared that it might be larger, for a large escort naturally involves considerable expense. Next day, 24th October, we started a little before 8am, and we were now able to contrast the appearance of the numerous villages through which we had passed with those of the Turkish side of the frontier. The comparison was certainly very much to the advantage of Persia. The houses, surrounded by gardens of poplars, were neater, cleaner and better built than is usual in Turkey, while nearly every village contained at least one house of considerable size. 
The change in the costume of the people was equally striking. The fez had entirely disappeared, and its place was taken either by the thickly lined, close fitting skull cap of cloth trimmed with black wool, which is called shikari, or by the hideous long haired papakh of black or brown colour, which I have already noticed as constituting the headdress of our muleteers. Before we had gone very far, we were overtaken by two more of Pasha Khan's mounted irregulars, who appeared desirous of attaching themselves to us as an additional escort, in spite of our unwillingness to accept their services. About 2 p.m. we reached the village of Kaira Aine, which was to be our halting place for the night. Hearing that there was a bazaar, I was minded to visit it, but found it to be a single shop kept by a leper, whose stock in trade appeared to consist chiefly of small tawdry mirrors and very rank tobacco. On the following day we were joined by two more armed horsemen, making five in all, so that our cavalcade now presented a most imposing appearance, and there seemed to be every chance that, at this rate of proceeding, we should accumulate a small army before reaching Tabriz in order, as I believe, to sustain our flagging faith in their utility and to convince us of the danger of the road, an alarm of robbers was started by our escort as we were traversing a narrow defile, assuring us that only three days ago three men had been robbed and murdered in this very spot. They galloped wildly ahead, now cautiously ascending and peeping over the summit of a hillock now madly descending it at breakneck speed and scouring across the country. In the caravan all were huddled together in a compact mass and, in spite of our scepticism, Ali insisted on the rifle being got ready for action while he, he continued to brandish an old sword which he had bought at Erzurum in the most truculent manner Notwithstanding all these preparations, no robbers appeared, and after we had been sufficiently entertained by the evolutions of our escort, we were permitted to lapse once more into tranquillity. Early in the afternoon, after fording a river, the eminently picturesque bridge being broken down, and passing a pretty hamlet situated by the side of a stream, we arrived at the village of Zoroa where we halted for the night. Here we obtained very fair quarters in the house of a fine-looking old man with some knowledge of Persian. Four or five of the inhabitants came in to stare at us and to smoke their kalyans, hubble bubbles, with intermittent attempts to mend a broken door. Ali struck up a great friendship with our host and inspired by this, and the reflection that on the morrow we should reach a town of some importance made him a present of all that remained of our tea. Next day, 26th October, we found to our delight that our escort was reduced to two who still continued their attempts to scare us with alarms of robbers. Whether the road was indeed dangerous I do not know, but it was certainly amazingly bad. About midday, on emerging from a very fine gorge, we saw at our feet a wide and cultivated plain, surrounded almost entirely by mountains, except to the right, in the direction of Urumiye. In this plain lay the beautiful little city of Khoi, and, somewhat nearer to us, the suburb of Pire, both surrounded by a mass of gardens. The latter we reached in about an hour, and here we rested for a while, thence onwards to the very walls of Khoi, appropriately styled Darus Safa, the abode of delight. Our way lay through pleasant gardens of poplars, willows and fruit trees, and fields planted with cotton. At 3.30pm we entered the town and put up at a clean and well-constructed caravanserai. While the baggage was being unloaded, 
I perceived that we were undergoing an attentive scrutiny on the part of a magnificent looking Davish, who wore on his head a green turban, of which one end depended over his shoulder, and carried in his hand a shining battle axe. Presently he began to address inquiries to Ali, and, on learning from him that I spoke Persian, approached me and entered into conversation. He proved to be a native of, of Kerman, Mir Jalal al-Din by name, and his extraordinary fertility of imagination, which often carried him far beyond the bounds, not only of the probable, but of the possible, rendered him a very amusing companion, if not a very reliable informant. He at once constituted himself our guide, philosopher and friend, and hardly quitted us during the three days which we spent at Khoi, declaring that he perceived us to be excellent fellows, worthy of his society and conversation. He assured us that he had travelled much, and had thrice visited London, once in company with the Shah, that he had instructed members of the Russian royal family in Persian, and that besides this, his native tongue, he was conversant with no less than ten languages, including Kurdish, Russian, and the dialect of Sistan on the eastern frontier of Persia. Having given us these details about himself, he began to question us as to our destination, and on learning that we were bound for Tabriz, told us that we must on no account omit to visit the towns of Salmas, Khusravabad, and Dilmaran, more especially the latter in which he, as he declared, there were no less than a thousand English residents, who, through converse with Darvishes and Sufis, had become enlightened and philosophical. While we were engaged in conversation, a man entered the room to inquire our names and whence we came, the object for which this information was sought being, as Mir Jalal al informed us with perfect gravity, that it might be inserted in the newspapers of Tabriz. His imagination being now temporarily exhausted, our worthy friend bade us good night, and promising to be with us betimes in the morning, and to show us something of the town, left us us to repose. Our first business on awaking in the morning was to make inquiries as to the possibility of obtaining a bath in the adjacent hammam, and this indulgence was without difficulty accorded to us. On our return, we found our friend the Darvish awaiting our arrival. He at once launched out into a disquisition on things pertaining to his order. The true arif, or adept, he informed us, was distinguished by four external signs, the tabar, or axe, which serves to protect him during his wanderings in the desert from ferocious beasts, the keshkid, or gourd, slung on chains, in which he receives arms, the taj, or felt cap, embroidered with texts, which crowns his head, and the gishu, or long locks, which fall over his shoulders. He then showed me some pills, compounded, as he assured me, after a prescription of the sage Lochman, of a substance called Bash, and known by the name of Habe Nishat, or pills of gladness. One of these he offered me to eat, assuring me that it would not fail to produce a most delightful sense of exhilaration and ecstasy. But, although I complied with his invitation, I failed to observe any such effect. About 11 a.m. we accompanied him for a stroll through the town. He first took us to a neighbouring caravanserai and introduced us to a Syrian Christian of Arumiye named Simon Abraham, who practised the trade of a photographer and spoke English, which he had learned from the missionaries settled at that place very well. He, in his turn, introduced us to another Syrian Christian called Dr. Samuel, who kept a dispensary at the opposite side of the caravanserai, and who likewise possessed a good knowledge of English. Both received us very cordially, 
and did much to render pleasant our sojourn at Khuy. In the afternoon we were taken by the indefatigable Mir Jalal al-Din to visit a tekie, or retreat for dervishes, situated near the walls of the town. The dervishes, who were a most heterogeneous crew, including, besides Persians, Kurds and Negroes, received us very hospitably and gave us tea. On our return to the caravanserai, our companion introduced us to a ramal, or geomancer, who occupied a room adjacent to ours. This votary of the occult sciences, Mirza Taki by name, was a native of Kerman Shah. So far as I could see, he never quitted his cell, dividing his time between opium smoking, tea drinking, and casting the four dice-like brass cubes pivoted together, whereby he essayed to unravel the mysteries of the future. After offering us a share of his tea, he proceeded to cast his dice and tell me my fortune, scribbling on a piece of paper the while, somewhat as follows, three, two, one, two, counting the numbers uppermost on the dice. Praise be to Allah, thou wert born under a lucky star, one, one, three, four. Thy journey will be a long one, and seven months at least will elapse ere thou shalt see again thy native land. Two, two, four, two. I take refuge with Allah, the Supreme, the Mighty. What is it that I see? Thou shalt without doubt incur a great danger on the road. And indeed it seemeth to me that one will attempt thy life before thou reachest Tabriz. Four, three, one, four. Thou hast already lost, or wilt shortly lose, two things of value. I immediately thought of my watch, and then re- recollected that I had informed Mir Jalal din of its loss. Four, four, two, one. Our refuge is in God. A violent storm will overtake thee on thy voyage homewards, but from this thou wilt, inshallah, escape by means of a talisman which I will prepare for thee. 3113 On thy return home thou wilt marry and have four sons and three daughters. 4231 Thou hast, alas, several powerful en- enemies and an evil influence threatens thy star. But shouldst thou escape these, as, please God, thou wilt do, by the help of a charm which I will presently write for thee, thou wilt without doubt gain the favour of thy queen, and attain unto great prosperity, inshallah. Thy fortune, he continued, sweeping up the implements of his craft, is, praise be to Allah, far from bad, a proof of which is that thou hast fallen in with one truly skilled in the occult sciences and endowed with all kinds of knowledge, who is able not only to warn thee of the misfortunes which threaten thee, but also to provide thee with the means of averting, or at least of mitigating the same. The talismans which thou needest now are as follows. One, to protect thee from the attempt on thy life, which will be made before thou reachest Tabriz, one to ensure thy safety in the storm, which will assail thee on thy homeward voyage, one... Honoured sir, I interrupted at this point, before giving you the trouble of writing so many charms, I would fain have some further proof of the efficacy of your science. I do not indeed, like many of my countrymen, deny its existence. But of its truth, I would desire a proof which you can easily afford me. To to describe the events of the past is without doubt less difficult than to predict those of the future. Tell me then the name of my birthplace, the number of my brothers and sisters, and the adventures which have already befallen me. Then, indeed, shall I know for certain that you are a skilful magician, and that the science which you practice is not, as some of my unbelieving countrymen assert, 
a vain and useless thing. Reasonable as this request appeared to me to be, it did not seem to meet with the approbation of the geomancer, who appeared suddenly to lose interest in the conversation, seeing which we withdrew to our own room, where we subsequently received a visit from our Syrian friends. Next morning, before I was dressed, Mir Jalal al-Din appeared with two small manuscripts, both of which, he said, belonged to a poor Sufi who was willing to sell them for a small sum only because he was stricken down by a mortal disease. One of these manuscripts contained, besides the well-known philosophical poem of Sheikh Mahmud Shabestari, known as the Golshana Ruz, or Rose Garden of Mystery, a treatise on the mystical science of managing the breath, from which he read me several long extracts. The other consisted of a few scattered pages from a work on medicine, which, he gravely informed me, had been written by the hand of Galen himself, and discovered by himself and a comrade amongst the ruins of one of the pyramids destroyed by the English. Not wishing to hurt the feelings of my ingenious friend by giving expression to my doubts, and thinking that some compensation was due to him for the trouble which he had been at to entertain us, I agreed to purchase these manuscripts for the moderate sum which he named. End of section 5section 6 of a year amongst the persians by edward granville brown this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org a year amongst the persians by edward granville brown we next visited the dispensary of dr samuel whither h had already preceded us here, for the first time, I was able to appreciate the difficulties incidental to the practice of medicine amongst a people whose curiosity prompts them to hover round the physician long after their own cases have been dealt with, and who are only too eager to, to throw out hints on diagnosis and treatment whenever they get the opportunity. Our visit to the dispensary was so far unfortunate that, on returning to our caravanserai towards evening, after a stroll in the bazaar and a chat with the postmaster, I found a crowd of people assembled outside, who, on beholding me, cried out, He comes! The Firangi Hakim has arrived! and thronged after me into the square. This assembly consisted of several sick people, accompanied by a number of their friends and relatives, who, hearing that we had some knowledge of medicine, were anxious to consult us. On inquiry, I learnt that they had previously been attending Dr. Samuel, from whom they had obtained medicine, of which they had only made a very brief trial. I therefore told them that they had better give his treatment a fair chance before deserting it for some new remedy, especially as I was convinced, both by conversation with the Syrian doctor and by observation of his practice, that he was at least as competent as myself to advise them. It was with much regret that, on the following morning, 29th October, we prepared to quit Hoy. For some time I despaired of ever getting off. Inside the room where we were vainly attempting to pack our things were our Syrian friends, together with Mir Jalaluddin, who had come to bid us farewell. Outside were crowds of sick people come for advice and treatment, irregular soldiers anxious to be engaged as an escort and idle spectators, while above all vis was visible the ugly grinning face of Faisalala, the muleteer, trying to hasten our departure with cries of Gulach, which in the Turkish dialect of Azerbaijan signifies, let us go. At length, about 11 a.m., our preparations were completed, and we were on the point of starting when Mir Jalaluddin, who had disappeared for a while previously, approached me to bid me farewell, and to give me two more proofs of his good will. The first of these was a letter of introduction 
to a brother Darvish at Tabriz, who, he assured me, would very probably consent to accompany me on my travels, and would perhaps even return with me to my native country. Unfortunately, I was unable to put this statement to the test, and the letter was never used. The second was a small white circular object, looking like an unperforated and much-worn shirt button, which he said was a talisman, sufficient, in all probability, to protect me against the danger of being robbed or murdered, which had been predicted by the opium-smoking geomancer. As a further precaution, however, he added that I should do well, in the event of robbers making their appearance, to dismount from my horse, take a handful of dust from the road, blow on it, and scatter it around me, at the same time uttering the Bismillah, when the robbers would infallibly disperse. He then asked me to give him a Nazr, or offering of money, for the Darvishes, who would exert their influence to protect me from harm, and, having received this, he finally bade me farewell. Quitting the town by a gate opposite to that by which we had entered it, we passed through a long avenue of poplars, and shortly afterwards reached a point where the road bifurcated, one branch leading southwards in the direction of Arumie, and the other, which we pursued, eastwards towards the hills which we must cross to reach Tabriz. Near the summit of one of these hills was a small imamzade, or shrine, which, as Farah informed us, was reputed most efficacious in curing persons afflicted with hydrophobia, or bitten by a serpent. After a short stage of four hours, we reached a little village called Sayed Tajaddin, where we halted for the night. Next day we continued to ascend for about two hours until we reached the top of the pass. From this we had a magnificent view of the great salt lake of Urumie, glittering in the sun, and studded with numerous rocky islands, which, as an effect of the mirage, appeared deeply indented at the base. Descending by the dry bed of a river which did duty for a road, we soon entered the plain which skirts the lake on this its northern side. Here we fell in with a wandering snake-charmer, who, after exhibiting to us the immunity with which he handled his snakes, pressed us to buy pieces of dirty bread, which he assured us would prove an infallible remedy for snake-bites. This, however, I declined to do, for I thought myself sufficiently provided with talismans for the present. Before 2 p.m. we reached our halting-place, Tasuch, a large but uninteresting village, distant about a mile from the shore of the lake. Nothing worthy of note befell us here, except the loss of a purse of money, which event our friend the geomancer, had he known of it, might perhaps have claimed as the fulfilment of a part of his prediction. The following day's march took us to Dizahalil, a good-sized village with a fair bazaar, situated amidst gardens of poplars near the northeast corner of the lake. Here we obtained good quarters, where our host brought us, together with a present of flowers, an old copy of the Pilgrim's Progress, left behind by some previous traveller. Next day, Tuesday, 1st November, after a tedious march of nearly ten hours, broken by a short halt about 2 p.m., at a disconsolate village called Mian, we reached Tabriz, the capital of the province of Azerbaijan, the residence of the Valiad, or Crown Prince, and one of the largest, if not the largest, of the cities of Persia. Although we were provided with letters of introduction to Mr. Abbott, the British Consul, it was too late to think of presenting them that evening, and accordingly, after threading our way for nearly an hour through the vast suburbs which surround the city, we were glad to alight at the first respectable caravanserai which we came to. On the following morning we repaired to the British Consulate, and were very kindly received by Mr. Abbott and his wife, who invited us to be their guests during our sojourn in Tabriz. We gladly accepted this invitation, for we had not seen a European since leaving Erzurum, and had not slept in a proper bed since we quitted the Hôtel d'Italie at Trebizond. We remained at Tabriz four days. During this time we became acquainted with Mr. Whipple, one of the American missionaries, 
who kindly undertook to pilot us through the interminable labyrinth of bazaars, perhaps the most extensive in Persia, and the Turkish consul, Bejit Bey, who, in addition to an excellent knowledge of Persian, possessed the best temper, the keenest sense of humour, the cheeriest laugh, and the most voracious appetite that I have ever seen in one of his nation. Although Tabriz is so important a town, it offers few attractions to the sightseer, beyond the bazaars, the Blue Mosque, Masjid al Kabud, and the Citadel, Arg, of which the two last are said to date from the time of Harun al-Rashid. Both of these monuments of antiquity we visited on the second day after our arrival. The Blue Mosque is now little more than a ruin, but the handsome tiles and inscriptions which still adorn its walls bear witness to its ancient splendour. The Citadel, also said to have been originally a mosque, consists of a square enclosure with a single entrance, opposite to which rises a lofty, massive, rectangular tower, accessible by means of a staircase in the left lateral wall of the quadrangle. The opposite side of the quadrangle is formed by a large ambar, or magazine, now used as a storehouse for arms and ammunition. The view from the summit of the citadel is very extensive, and enabled me, in some degree, to realise the magnitude of the city, which lay below us like a map. From this height, in former days, criminals were sometimes hurled into the ditch below. On one occasion, we were informed, a woman condemned to suffer death in this manner was so buoyed up by the air inflating her loose garments that she reached the ground uninjured. Whether this story is true or false, I cannot say. Neither did I pay much attention to its recital, my thoughts being occupied with the tragic death of the young prophet of Shiraz, Mirza Ali Muhammad, better known as the Bob, which took place on 9th July 1850, at or near this spot. As I shall have to say a good deal about the Bobby religion in subsequent chapters, it may not be altogether out of place to give here a brief account of the life and death of its founder, although the history of these is well known, and has been repeatedly set forth. Footnote 1. See Cobenot's Religion et Philosophie dans l'Asie Centrale, Mirza Kozembeg's articles on Bob et les Bobby, in the Journal Asiatique for 1866, several articles by myself in the Journal of the Royal Asiatic Society for 1889 and 1892, The Traveller's Narrative, written to illustrate the episode of the Bob, edited, translated and annotated by me for the Syndics of the Cambridge University Press, 1891, and my forthcoming translation of the New History of Mirza Ali Muhammad the Bob, 1893. End of footnote. Mirza Ali Muhammad was born at Shiraz on 9th October 1820. His father, Syed Muhammad Reza, a cloth merchant in that town, died while he was still of tender age, leaving him to the care of his uncle, Haji Syed Ali. At the age of 17, he was sent to the port of Bushir on the Persian Gulf, where, while engaged in transacting the business with which he had been entrusted, he rendered himself conspicuous, not less by the austerity of his morals, than by the sweetness and amiability of his disposition. Addicted from an early age to religious meditation, he was soon impelled to abandon commercial pursuits, and to undertake a pilgrimage to Mecca, and the shrines of the Imams, so dear to every pious Persian, at Najaf and Kabbalah. Here he became the pupil of Haji Said Khazim of Rasht, a theologian who, notwithstanding the enmity and opposition of the orthodox Shiite clergy, had already begun to exert a considerable influence on Persian thought, and to gather round him a numerous band of ardent disciples. Mirza Ali Muhammad, in spite of his youth and retiring disposition, soon attracted the attention of this teacher, who did not fail to be struck by the sweet and thoughtful countenance of the young Shirazi. Nor was Syed Khazim the only one who yielded to a charm which few could wholly resist. Many other learned and devout men began to look with respect and affection on one whose humility only served to throw his other virtues into bolder relief. 
Thus were sown the seeds of that devotion, which was destined ere long to write the testimony of its sincerity in letters of blood throughout the length and breadth of the Persian land, and which was to prove once more to the world that all the torments which the tyrant can devise or the torturer execute are impotent to subdue the courage born of faith and enthusiasm. It is unnecessary for me to describe in detail the process whereby there grew up in the mind of Mirza Ali Muhammad a conviction that he was destined to become the reformer and saviour of his nation. Suffice it to say that, after a prolonged inward struggle, on 23rd May 1844, he proclaimed himself to the world as the Bob, or Gate, whereby men might win to the sacred mysteries and spiritual truths of which he had become the recipient. Before long he had gathered round himself a number of disciples. Amongst these were many of the most distinguished pupils of Said Khazim, whose recent death had left them temporarily without a recognised head. They eagerly adopted the doctrines of their former fellow-student, and began to preach them openly, wherever they went, so that in a short time the fame of Mirza Ali Muhammad was noised abroad throughout the whole of Persia, and everywhere men began to say that the Imam Mahdi had come at last for the deliverance of the nations, and the establishment of universal justice and peace. At first but little attention was paid to the new sect by the government or clergy, but towards the end of the summer of 1845 they began to be alarmed at its, at its rapid spread, and took measures to check its progress. The Bob, who had just returned from Mecca to Bushir, was brought to Shiraz and placed in confinement. His followers were prohibited from discussing his doctrines in public, and some of the more active were beaten, mutilated and expelled from the town. In the early summer of 1846, however, a plague broke out in Shiraz, and, during the general consternation caused by this, the Bob effected his escape and made his way to Isfahan, where he was well received by Manashir Khan, governor of that city, who afforded him protection and hospitality for nearly a year. Early in 1847, Manashir Khan died, and his successor, anxious to curry favour with the government, sent the Bob, under the care of an escort of armed horsemen, to the capital. So serious were the apprehensions already entertained by the government of a popular demonstration in the prisoner's favour, that his guards had received instructions to avoid entering the towns by which they must needs pass. At Kashan, however, a respectable merchant named Mirza Jani, footnote 1, Mirza Jani's chief claim to distinction is as the historian of the movement for which he gave his life. His history of primary importance for the study of Babism, contains a vast number of curious particulars, doctrinal and biographical, which have been omitted, not unintentionally, by later Babi writers. It is, however, extremely rare. So far as I know, only two manuscripts of it exist, and one of these contains only a third part of the work. Both these manuscripts belonged formerly to the Comte de Gobineau, and both are now in the Bibliothèque Nationale at Paris. See my translation of the New History, Introduction and Appendix 2. End of footnote. Mirza Jani, who subsequently suffered martyrdom for his faith, prevailed on them by means of a bribe to allow their prisoner to tarry with him two days. At the village of Khonlik, also near Tehran, a number of believers came out to meet the Bob, Amongst these was Mirza Hussain Ali of Nur in Mazandaran, who, at a later date, under the title of Bahu'lala, the Splendour of God, was recognised by the great majority of the Babis as their spiritual chief, and who, till his death, on 16th May 1892, resided at Acre in Syria, surrounded by a band of faithful followers and visited yearly by numbers of pilgrims. The late king, Muhammad Shah, and his chief minister, Haji Mirza Agassi, 
dreading the effect likely to be produced in the capital by the presence of the Bob, determined to send him to the fortress of Maku, on the northwest frontier of Persia, without allowing him to enter Tehran. Thither he was accordingly conveyed, but at Zanjan and Milan he received a popular ovation, and even at Maku it was found impossible to prevent him from receiving occasional letters and visits from his adherents. Nor did the plan of transferring him to the sterner custody of Yahya Khan, governor of the castle of Chihrik near Rumie, meet with much better success in this respect. Meantime, while the Bob was occupying the weary days of his imprisonment in compiling and arranging the books destined to serve as a guide to his followers, after the fate which he had but too much cause to apprehend should have removed him from their midst, his emissaries were actively engaged in propagating his doctrines. Fiery enthusiasm on the part of these was met by fierce opposition from the Orthodox party, headed by the clergy, and it needed only the confusion and disorder introduced into all departments of the empire by the death of Muhammad Shah, 5th October 1848, to bring the two factions into armed collision. The strife, once kindled, rapidly assumed the most alarming proportions, and the reign of the present king, Nasruddin Shah, was inaugurated by formidable insurrections of the Babis at Yazd, Niriz, Zanjan, and in Mazandaran. Of the latter two risings I shall have to say something when I come to speak of the places at which they occurred. For the present it is sufficient to state that, after the rising in Mazandaran had been suppressed with great difficulty and the sacrifice of many lives, a revolt which threatened to defy the united efforts of the whole Persian army broke out at Zanjan. Thereupon, by the advice of Mirza Taki Khan, at that time Prime Minister to the young king, an attempt was made to strike terror into the hearts of the insurgents, and to fill their minds with despair, by the public execution of the Bob, who, though innocent of any direct share in the plans or counsels of the rebels, was regarded as the source from which they drew the enthusiasm which inspired them with a resolution so obstinate, and a courage so invincible. Accordingly, orders were dispatched to Tabriz to bring the Bob thither from his prison house, and, after the form of a trial, to put him to death. After enduring all manner of insults at the hands of the government authorities, the clergy, and the rabble of the city, through the streets of which he was dragged for many hours, he was finally brought to the place of execution, near the citadel, a little before sundown. An immense crowd, drawn thither, some by sympathy, others by a vindictive desire to witness the death of one whom they regarded as an arch-heretic, but actuated for the most part, probably, by mere curiosity, was here assembled. Many of those who composed it were at least half convinced of the divine mission of the Bob. Others, who had come with feelings of animosity or indifference, were moved to compassion by the sight of the youthful victim, who continued to manifest the same dignity and fortitude which had characterized him during the whole period of his imprisonment. The Bob was not to suffer alone. The sentence which had been pronounced against him included also two of his disciples. One of these, Agha Sayyid Hussain of Yazd, who had been his companion and amanuensis during the whole period of his captivity, either actuated by a momentary but uncontrollable fear of death, or, as the Bobbies assert with more probability, obediently to orders received from his master, bidding him escape at all hazards and convey to the faithful the sacred writings of which he was the depository, declared himself willing to renounce the creed for which he had already sacrificed so much, and the master to whom he had hitherto so faithfully adhered. His recantation was accepted, and his life spared, but his death was only deferred for two years. In September 1852 he met the fate which he no longer affected to fear amongst the martyrs of Tehran. The other disciple was a young merchant of Tabriz, named Aram Muhammad Ali. Although every effort was made to induce him to follow the example of his comrade, and though his wife and little children were brought before him, entreating him with tears to save his life, 
he stood firm in his faith, and only requested that at the moment of death he might still be allowed to fix his gaze on his master. Finding all efforts to alter his decision unavailing, the executioners proceeded to suspend him alongside of his master at the distance of a few feet from the ground, by means of cords passed under the arms. As he hung thus, he was heard to address the bob in these words, Master, art thou satisfied with me? Then the file of soldiers, drawn up before the prisoners, received the command to fire, and, for a moment, the smoke of the volley concealed the sufferers from view. When it rolled away, a cry of mingled exultation and terror arose from the spectators, for, while the bleeding corpse of the disciple hung suspended in the air, pierced with bullets, the bob had disappeared from sight. It seemed indeed that his life had been preserved by a miracle, for, of the storm of bullets which had been aimed at him, not one had touched him. Nay, instead of death, they had brought him deliverance, by cutting the ropes which bound him, so that he fell to the ground unhurt. For a moment even the executioners were overwhelmed with amazement, which rapidly gave place to alarm as they reflected what effect this marvellous deliverance was likely to have on the inconstant and impressionable multitude. These apprehensions, however, were of short duration. One of the soldiers espied the bob, hiding in a guard-room which opened on to the stone platform over which he had been suspended. He was seized, dragged forth, and again suspended. A new firing party was ordered to advance, for the men who had composed the first refused to act again. And, before the spectators had recovered from their first astonishment, or the bobbies had had time to attempt a rescue, the body of the young prophet of Shiraz was riddled with bullets. The two corpses were dragged through the streets and bazaars, and cast out beyond the city gates to be devoured by dogs and jackals. From this last indignity, however, they were saved by the devotion of Suleiman Khan, and a few other believers, who, whether by force, bribes, or the influence of powerful friends, succeeded in obtaining possession of them. They were wrapped in white silk, placed in one coffin, and sent to Tehran, where, by order of Mirza Yahya Sob Ezel, the morning of eternity, who, though but twenty years of age, had been chosen to succeed the Bob, they were deposited in a little shrine called Imam Zadeh Masum, which stands by the Hamadan road, not far from Ribata Karim. Here they remained undisturbed for seventeen or eighteen years, till the schism originated by Beha deprived his half-brother Ezel of the supremacy in the Bobby church, which he had hitherto enjoyed, when they were removed by the Baha'is, to whom alone is now known the last resting place of the glorious martyrs of Tabriz. Section 7 of A Year Amongst the Persians by Edward Granville Brown This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For further information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Year Amongst the Persians by Edward Granville Brown Chapter 4 From Tabriz to Tehran We have a horror for uncouth monsters, but upon experience all these bugs grow familiar and easy to us. Less strange. On Monday, 7th of November, bidding farewell to our kind host, we quitted Tabriz as we had entered it, with Farah's animals, which we had decided to re-engage at 65 krans a head, nearly two pounds sterling, for our journey to the capital. Contrary to the general rule, we managed to begin our journey with a good long stage of eight farsakhs. We passed nothing of interest except a large sheet of water lying to the north of the road, on which were multitudes of waterfowl. And, as we had made a late start, it was more than an hour after sundown when we reached Haji Akpar, where we halted for the night. Next day we were joined on the road by a horseman of respectable appearance, who accompanied us on our journey as far as Miyane. His name, as I discovered, was Mirzo Hashim, 
and his conversation did much to beguile the tediousness of the way. Approaching the subject with some diffidence, I asked him to tell me what he knew about the Bobby insurrection at St. John. He answered that he could not tell me much about it, except that the insurgents, whose numbers hardly exceeded three hundred fighting men, held at bay an army of nearly ten thousand men for nine months. He added that he had himself known one of them who had succeeded in effecting his escape after the sack of the town, and who used to boast that he had with his own hand slain one thousand of the royal troops. In the course of the morning we passed a fine-looking, though somewhat ruined, building, situated on the left side of the road, opposite to the village of Dikine Tosh, which our companion informed us was a palace built for the Shah nearly forty years ago, on the occasion of his visiting this part of his dominions. Since then it has remained unused, and has been allowed to fall into disrepair. Another neglected palace of this sort exists farther east, at Sultaniye. Farther on we passed two fine old caravanserais, constructed with the care and solidity which characterise all the work done in the glorious days of the Safavi kings. These, however, we passed without halting, and pushed on to Kara Chiman, a picturesquely situated village lying somewhat to the south of the main road, in a little valley through which runs a river bordered with groves of poplar trees. Here we obtained very good quarters in a clean, well-constructed Balakhane upper room, commanding a fine view of the valley, river and village. Next morning, ninth of November, we passed, soon after starting, two large villages situated at some distance from the road, the one to the north, the other to the south. The former is called Bashsiz, the latter Bulgawar. Beyond these, there was little worthy of note in the parched-up, undulating country through which our road lay, until about 3 p.m. we reached our halting place, Suma where we obtained good quarters at the house of one Mashhadi Hassan. In the evening we received a visit from our travelling companion Mirzo Hoshim, and as our next stage would bring us to Miyane, which enjoys so evil a reputation by reason of the poisonous bugs which infest it, we asked him whether it was true, as is currently reported, that the bite of these animals proves fatal to a stranger. After assuring us that this was sometimes the case, he informed us that the so-called Miyane bug, or Mala, was not altogether confined to that town, but that it also occurred in Suma, the village wherein we then were. The villagers, he added, have the following curious story about its origin. Once upon a time, a native of Suma went to the neighbouring village of Hashtarud, where he became involved in a quarrel with the inhabitants, which culminated in his being murdered by them. From the body of the murdered man emerged a number of these malas, which established themselves in the village of Suma. Whenever a native of Hashtarud arrives there, they remember the blood feud which exists, and avenge the death of their ancestor by inflicting a fatal bite upon the descendant of his murderers. To all others, however, their bite, though painful, is comparatively harmless. Mirza Hashim then told us of the severity of the winters at Ardabil, and showed us a wooden cap with coverings for the ears, admirably adapted for a protection against severe cold. Having informed me that he had refused to sell it for fifteen krons, rather less than ten shillings, he offered to make me a present of it. Of course, I politely declined his offer, telling him that I could not consent to deprive him of so valuable a possession, for I had no need of the cap, and did not think it worth the sum he had mentioned. Europeans travelling in Persia have sometimes complained of what they regard as the meanness of the Persians in offering presents in return for which they expect money. It appears to me that this complaint arises from a failure to understand the fact that such an offer from a man of distinctly lower rank than oneself is merely tantamount to a declaration that he is willing to sell or exchange the article in question. When he offers to give it as a present, 
he merely uses the same figure of speech as did Ephron the Hittite in negotiating the sale of the cave of Machpelah with Abraham. All peoples make use, to a greater or less extent, of similar euphemisms, and we have no more right to blame a poor Persian for offering us a present, in return for which he expects to receive equivalent value, than to censure as sordid the desire expressed by a cabman to be remembered by us. As I have touched on this subject, I may as well say something about presents in general. There are not fewer than eight words more or less commonly used in Persian in this sense. Of these, three, viz. Armagan, Rah Avard, and Sargat, signify any object which one brings back from a journey to give to one's friends at home. Yadigar is a keepsake to remind the owner of the absent friend by whom it was given. Hadiye is a general term for any sort of present. There remain the terms ta'aruf, pishkesh, and in arm, each of which requires a somewhat fuller explanation. The first of these signifies a present given to someone of about the same social rank as the donor. In such cases, no return is usually expected, at any rate in money. Sometimes, however, the term is used by one who, while desirous of receiving the monetary equivalent of that which he offers, does not wish to admit his social inferiority to the person to whom the present is offered by using the term pishkesh. When, however, a peasant, servant, muleteer, gardener, or the like, offers a present of flowers, fruits, or fowls to the traveller, he calls it a pishkesh, offering, and for such he generally expects at least the proper value in money of the article so offered. When the present is something to which a definite monetary value can be assigned, e.g. an article of food, this is only right and proper. To expect a poor villager to supply travellers gratis with the necessaries of life, which he can often ill spare, and to blame him for desiring to receive the value of the same, is surely the height of absurdity. With presents of flowers the case is somewhat different. It often happens that the traveller, on visiting a garden, for instance, is confronted on his exit by a row of gardeners, each of whom offers him a bunch of flowers. He is then placed in rather a dilemma, for on the one hand he feels some delicacy in refusing what may, after all, be a gift prompted solely by courtesy and kindness, while on the other hand he may not care to pay several crowns for that which is of no use to him. Even in this case, I think that Europeans are partly to blame for a custom which has, in some of the more frequented parts of Persia, become an intolerable nuisance. My reason for believing that what sometimes amounts to little less than a system of extortion, theoretically capable of unlimited expansion, so long as there is a handful of flowers in the village and a peasant to bring and offer the same, originally grew out of a graceful and courteous custom of welcoming a stranger by presenting him with a nosegay, is that in parts of Persia less frequently visited by Europeans, such as the neighbourhood of Yezd or Kirmon, I have often been given a handful of roses or other flowers by a passing peasant, who continued on his way after the accomplishment of this little act of courtesy, without once pausing or looking back in expectation of receiving a reward. As regards the last kind of present, the in arm or gratuity, it is, as its name implies, one bestowed by a superior on an inferior, and is almost always given in the form of money. The term is applied not only to the presence of money spoken of above, but to the gratuities given to villagers in whose houses one puts up for the night, keepers of caravanserais and post-houses at which one alights, shagir chapars, who accompany one on each stage in posting to show the way and bring back the horses. Servants in houses at which one stays, and in short, any one of humble rank who renders one a service. To determine the amount which ought to be given in any particular case is sometimes rather a difficult matter for the traveller. A reliable native servant is of great use in this matter, and should the traveller possess such, 
he will do well to follow his advice until he is able to judge for himself. The most costly in alms, and those which one is most inclined to grudge, are such as must occasionally be given to the farashes of a governor or other great man, who are sent to bear a present from their master, or to meet the traveller and form his escort. To these I shall have occasion to allude again. I must now return from this digression to our march of the 10th of November. The day was cloudy and overcast, and soon after we had started, a gentle rain began to fall. We crossed the river Qizil Uzan in several places, and for a considerable distance wended our way along its broad, gravelly bed. Traversing the crest of a hill soon after midday, we came in full view of the little town of Mione, which looked very pretty with its blue domes and background of poplars and willows. We had no sooner reached the outskirts of the town than we were met by a number of the inhabitants, each eager to induce us to take up our quarters at his house, the advantages of which he loudly proclaimed. No sooner had we alighted at one place to examine the quarters offered than all the competitors of its owner cried out with one accord that if we put up there we should assuredly suffer from the bite of the poisonous bugs with which, they averred, the house in question swarmed. We accordingly moved on to another house where the same scene was repeated, each man representing his own house as the one place in the town free from this pest, and every one except the owner uniting in the condemnation of any quarters which we seemed likely to select. Finally, in despair, we selected the first clean-looking room which presented itself, and occupied it, regardless of the warnings of the disappointed competitors, who at length departed, assuring us that we had pitched on one of the very worst houses in the whole town. Soon after our arrival, we took a walk through the town, and visited the tolerably good bazaars, in which we purchased some dried figs, and a fruit called idar, or in Turkish khunab, somewhat resembling a small date with a very large stone, and the Imam Zade, of which the blue dome is the most conspicuous feature of Mione. Here, as it was Thursday evening, Shabi Jum'a, the eve of Friday, many people were assembled to witness a Tatziya, or representation of the sufferings of the Imams Hassan and Hussein. In the enclosure surrounding the building was seated a half-naked man, who held in his hand a scourge armed with iron thongs, wherewith he occasionally struck himself on the shoulders and back. All those who entered this enclosure, from which we were excluded, kissed the chains which hung in festoons across the gate. On returning to our quarters, we found a man who had brought his horse to consult us about its eye, which had received a slight injury. After advising him as to its treatment, we entered into conversation with him. He warned us that in spite of the apparent cleanliness of our lodging, he knew for certain that there were bugs in it. But on questioning him further, it appeared that his only reason for saying so was that he had seen one three years ago. Nevertheless, he advised us to take two precautions which he assured us would protect us from injury. Firstly, to keep a candle burning all night. Secondly, to take a small quantity of the spirit called Arak, just before going to bed. We neglected the first of these measures, but not the second, and whether, owing to this or to the absence of the Malas, we slept untroubled by the noxious insects which have given to Mione so evil a reputation. Our road next day led us towards the imposing-looking mass of the Qaflan Kuh, a tortuous path brought us to the summit of the pass, whence we again descended to the river, which we crossed by a fine bridge. On the other side of this bridge we were met by a man who besought us to help him in recovering his horse from the soldiers at an adjacent guardhouse, who had, as he alleged, forcibly and wrongfully taken it from him. We accordingly went with him to the guardhouse, and endeavoured to ascertain the truth of the matter, and, if possible, effect a satisfactory settlement. 
In answer to our inquiries, the soldiers informed us that they had reason to suspect that the horse had been stolen, as it was too valuable an animal to be the lawful property of the man in whose possession they had found it. They added that if he desired to recover it, he must go to Miyane and obtain a paper from some respectable citizen to certify that the horse really belonged to him, when it would be restored to him. With this explanation and promise, we were compelled to be satisfied, and proceeded on our way till we reached another pass. On crossing this, we entered on an immense flat tableland, the surface of which was thrown into conical mounds resembling gigantic ant hills, and thinly covered with mountain plants which perfumed the air with their fragrance. The ground was riddled with the holes of what appeared to be a kind of jerboa. These little animals were very fearless, and allowed us to approach quite close to them before they retreated into their burrows. About 4 p.m. we reached the compact and almost treeless village of Sarkhan, where we halted for the night. Just before reaching it, we came up with one of those caravans of the dead, so graphically described by Van Berry. The coffins, which differ in some degree from those used in Europe, the upper end being flat instead of convex, and furnished with two short handles like a wheelbarrow, were sewn up in sacking, to which was affixed a paper label bearing the name of the deceased. Each animal in this dismal caravan was laden with two or three coffins, on the top of which was mounted, in some cases, a man or woman, related probably to one of the deceased, whose bodies were on their way to their last resting place in the sacred precincts of Qum. We had no difficulty in getting lodgings at Salcham, for the place contains an extraordinary number of caravanserais, considering its small size, and the inhabitants vied with each other in offering hospitality. Next day, Saturday, 12th of November, we started early, being given to understand that a long stage lay before us. All day we followed the course of the river, which is a tributary of the Qizil Uzan, though here it seems to be known by the name of the Zanjan Ob. Dense fogs obscured the sun in the earlier part of the day, but these rolled away as the heat increased, leaving a cloudless sky. The air was perfumed with the scent of the plant which we had observed on the preceding day. On our march we passed three immense caravans, consisting respectively of a hundred and two, seventy-two, and thirty-nine camels, bearing merchandise to Tabriz. There is, to my mind, an indescribable dignity about the camel, who seems to eye one scornfully with a half-turned head as he passes majestically on his way, and the sight of a string of these animals was one of which I never grew weary. On the road we saw a serpent, as well as numbers of lizards, and a small tortoise, which our muleteers called Sparha, a word which I have never heard elsewhere, and which seems to be purely local. About 3 p.m. we reached the village of Nichbeg, where we halted. It is a squalid-looking place, devoid of trees, and only remarkable for a very fine old caravanserai of the Safavi period, which bears an inscription over the gateway to the effect that it was repaired by order of Shah Safi, who alighted here on his return from the successful siege of the fortress of Eliban. While copying this inscription, we were surprised and pleased to perceive the approach of Mr. Whipple, the American missionary, who was posting from Tabriz to Hamadan to visit his fellow workers there. Our next stage brought us to the considerable town of Zanjan, so celebrated for its obstinate defence by the Barbies against the royal troops in the year 1850. It lies in a plain surrounded by hills, and is situated near, but not on, the river called Zanjan Ob, which is, at this point, surrounded by gardens. The town has never recovered from the effects of the siege, for, besides the injury which it sustained from the cannonade, to which it was exposed for several months, a considerable portion was burnt by the besieged on one occasion, when they were hard-pressed by the enemy, to create a diversion. We entered the town by the western gate, passing on our left an extensive cemetery, of which two blue-domed imamzades constitute the most conspicuous feature. 
we alighted at a caravanserai near the bazaar, which we visited shortly after our arrival. It is not very extensive, being limited to one long street running east and west, more than half through the town, which is much longer in this direction than from north to south. The great drawback to St. John is the enormous number of beggars who throng its streets and importune the traveller for alms with cries of Allah Nejat Versin, Allah Nejat Versin, may God give you salvation. In this respect, it is unrivalled, so far as I have seen, by any town in Persia, with the exception of Kirman, and even there, though the poverty of the mendicant classes is probably greater, their importunity is far less. In the evening, we received a visit from a very rascally-looking Tehrani, with a frightful squint, who inquired if we had any arak and on learning that we had, requested permission to introduce some companions of his who were waiting outside. These presently appeared, and having done full justice to the arak, which they finished off, suggested that we might perhaps like to hear a song. Without waiting for an answer, one of them broke forth into the most discordant strains, shouting the end of each verse which struck him as peculiarly touching into the ear of the man who sat next to him who received it with a drunken simper and a languid bali yes as though it had been a question addressed to him when this entertainment had come to an end the eyes of our visitors fell on my pocket flask which they began to admire saying this bottle is very good and admirably adapted for the pocket but we have already given enough trouble as I affected not to understand the purport of their remarks, they presently departed, to our great satisfaction. From the difficulty which the squint-eyed man seemed to experience in getting his feet into his shoes, I fancied that our arak was not the first which he had tasted that night. End of section 7「Section eight of A Year Amongst the Persians by Edward Granville Brown. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For further information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Year Amongst the Persians by Edward Granville Brown. Chapter four from Tabriz to Tehran. We remained at Zanjan during the next day, for I was anxious to examine the town and its walls, with a view to obtaining a clearer idea of the history of the siege and the causes which had enabled the Barbi insurgents to keep the royal troops at bay so long. Sir Henry Bethoon, quoted by Watson in his History of Persia under the Qajar dynasty, says that in his opinion the place ought to have been subdued by a regular army in a few days, and, so far as I can judge, it possesses no natural advantages as a stronghold. It is true that it is surrounded by a wall, now destroyed in some places, but though this averages twenty or twenty-five feet in height, it is built of no stronger material than unbaked clay. The desperate resistance offered by the Barbies must therefore be attributed less to the strength of the position which they occupied than to the extraordinary valour with which they defended themselves. Even the women took part in the defence, and I subsequently heard it stated on good authority that, like the Carthaginian women of old, they cut off their long hair and bound it round the crazy guns to afford them the necessary support. The fiercest fighting was on the north and northwest sides of the town, by the cemetery and Tabriz Gate. Unfortunately, there was no one from whom I could obtain detailed information about the siege. This I regretted the more, because I was convinced that, could I have found them, there must have been many persons resident in Zanjan who had witnessed it, or even taken part in it. I had, however, at that time no clue to guide me to those who would probably have preserved the most circumstantial details about it, viz. the Barbies. There was, therefore, nothing to induce me to prolong my stay, and accordingly, after one day's halt, we left Zanjan on 15th of November for Sultaniyeh. 
The road from Zanjan to Sultaniye runs through a perfectly flat stony plain, bounded by low hills to the north and the south, and is devoid of interest. Nearly three hours before reaching the latter place, we could plainly see the great green dome of the mosque for which it is so celebrated. From a distance, this appeared to form part of a mass of buildings, which, on nearer approach, proved to be a large palace constructed in the modern style, and situated some way to the northwest of the mosque. We paid a visit to the mosque immediately on our arrival, and were shown over it by an old Sayyid, who spoke Persian. It is built in the shape of an octagon, and is surmounted by the large green dome, which forms so conspicuous a feature of the landscape. From one side of the octagon, that farthest from the road, is thrown out a rectangular annex containing the mihrab. The main entrance is on the east side. The interior of the building is lined with most exquisite tile-work and beautiful inscriptions in Arabic. In some places, where these tiles have been destroyed or removed, an older, deeper layer of still finer pattern is visible. As the mosque is no longer used, the European traveller meets with none of the difficulties which usually form an insuperable obstacle to visiting similar buildings in Persia. The village of Sultaniye must formerly have been a flourishing place, but it now consists of only a few hovels, which form a sad contrast to the ancient splendour of the mosque. As to the date when the mosque was built, our guide was unable to inform us, but he said that it had been repaired and beautified by Shah Khuda Bandeh, concerning whom he repeated some lines of doggerel, which we had already heard from the muleteer, and which ran as follows. A shah khuda bande, zulum kunande, iki ta'uk bir kande. O shah khuda bande, practiser of tyranny, two fowls to one village. The last line of this is Turkish. What event it alludes to, or what its real purport is, I was unable to ascertain. Our guide informed us that some time ago a European engineer had spent a week at this place, making elaborate plans and drawings of the mosque. Having completed our inspection, we offered a small sum of money to the old Sayyid who had accompanied us, but he bade us give whatever we wished to his son, a little boy, who had also followed us. I accordingly gave him two krans, which appeared to me a sufficient recompense for the amount of trouble we had given but the sayyid seemed to be of a different opinion remarking that it was a very trivial sum for people of distinction i asked him what reason he had for supposing that we were people of distinction to which he only replied that we were muhtar free to do as we pleased besides the mosque and the palace there are several little imamzades at sultaniye and i was anxious to remain another day to examine these Farach, however, appeared to divine my intention, and took pains to frustrate it, for he avoided me all the evening, instead of coming in after supper, as he usually did, to discuss the events of the day, and sent off all the baggage early in the morning, so that we had no course open to us but to proceed. After another uneventful stage, we reached our next halting place at Khurum Dere, a pretty village situated on a river, surrounded by poplars and willows, about 4.30 p.m. Here, as usual, we were very hospitably received by the villagers, two of whom came out some distance to meet us and conduct us to their house, where we were lodged in a very good upper room, thickly carpeted and furnished with eight large windows provided with shutters. Next day we started early, the muleteers pretending that they would try to reach Kazvin that evening, which, as I believe, they had from the first no intention of doing. Our road ran towards the northeast in the direction of a low range of hills. On reaching the highest point of the ridge, we could see before us the mighty range of the Elburz mountains, which separates Persian Iraq from the humid, richly wooded provinces bordering on the Caspian Sea. Between us and these mountains lay a wide, flat, stony plain, in which the position of Kazvin was clearly indicated by the thin pall of blue smoke which hung over it. Towards this plain our road now began to descend, and in a few minutes we arrived at the village of Kirishkin, where the muleteers announced their intention of halting for the night, 
a decision from which it was impossible to move them, and to which I was in great measure reconciled by the kindly welcome given to us by the inhabitants. Here indeed a marked change was observable in the people, who appeared much brighter, more intelligent, and more amiable than the natives of Azerbaijan. The latter, with their scowling faces and furtive grey eyes, are not popular amongst the Persians, whose opinion about the inhabitants of their metropolis, Tabriz, is expressed in the following rhyme. Zi Tabrizi bi juzi zi na bi ni, Haman bichta ki Tabrizi na bi ni. From a Tabrizi thou wilt see naught but rascality. Even this is best, that thou shouldst not see a Tabrizi. The change in the appearance of the people is accompanied by a change in language, for this was the first place we came to at which the Persian tongue appeared to preponderate over the Turkish. At this village we obtained the most sumptuous quarters in a large room, twenty-five feet long by fifteen wide, thickly spread with carpets. A few works of Persian poetry placed in niches in the wall showed that our entertainers united a taste for literature with a love of comfort. In the course of the evening we received a visit from our host and his sons. One of the latter, the one to whom the books chiefly belonged, was a bright intelligent youth who discussed the merits of various Persian and Turkish poets with great zest. I was much amused at one remark which he made. Speaking of the recently concluded Tatziyas, dramatic representations of various moving episodes in the lives of the Prophet and his successors, and especially of the scene wherein the Firangi ambassador at the court of Damascus, moved by the misfortunes and patience of the captive believers, embraces Islam, and is put to death by the cruel tyrant Yazid, he said, how I wish you had come here a little earlier, for then we could have borrowed your hats and clothes for the Firangis, and indeed you might have even taught us some words of your language to put in the mouths of the actors who personated them. As it was, not knowing anything of the tongue of the Firangis, we had to make the actors who represented them talk Turkish, which seemed to us the nearest approach possible to Firangi speech. Next day we reached Kazvin after a short stage, during which we descended into the plain of which I have already spoken. Here we intended to halt for a day to see the town, which is of considerable size and contains many fine buildings. Amongst these is a Mihman Khane, or guest house, which is one of a series constructed between Enzeli and Tehran, and thence as far south as Qum. At this, however, we did not put up, as I was anxious to cling for a few days longer to the more oriental abodes, to which I had become not only accustomed, but attached, and which I foresaw would have to be abandoned on reaching Tehran, in favour of more civilised modes of existence. Unfortunately, our muleteers, either through indifference or ignorance, took us to a very poor caravanserai, far inferior in comfort to the quarters which we had enjoyed since leaving Zanjan, where we had suffered in a similar way. Indeed, it is usually the case that the traveller, unless provided with introductions, fares less well in the towns than in the villages. We spent most of the following day in wandering through the bazaars and examining the appearance of the town and its inhabitants. The bazaars were much like those which we have already seen at Khui, Tabriz and Zanjan, but as regards the people, the advantage was decidedly in favour of the Kazvinis, who are more pleasing in countenance, more gentle in manners and rather darker in complexion than the Azerbaijanis. Persian is spoken by them universally, but almost all understand Turkish as well. The road from Resht to Tehran, which is the route usually taken by those entering Persia from Europe, passes through Kazvin. This road we now joined, and by it we proceeded to the capital, accomplishing the journey thither in three days. As it is probably the best known and the least interesting of all the roads in Persia, I will not describe it in detail, and will only notice certain points which appear worthy of mention. First of all, the Mihman Khanes, or guest houses, of which I have already spoken, merit a few words. They were built, I believe, by order of the present Shah, on his return from his first visit to Europe. 
They are intended to afford the traveller by the ordinary route to the capital greater comfort and better accommodation than are obtainable in caravanserais, and to fulfil in some degree the functions of a hotel. I cannot say that I was at all favourably impressed by these institutions, at the first of which, called Kishlach, we arrived on the evening of the day of our departure from Kazvin, 20th of November. It is true that they are well built, and stand in gardens pleasantly surrounded by trees, that the rooms are furnished with European beds, chairs, and tables, and that cooked food can be obtained from the attendants. But these advantages are, to my mind, far more than counterbalanced by the exorbitance of the charges and the insolence of the servants, which contrasted painfully with the ready hospitality, genial courtesy, and slight demands of the villagers, in whose humble but cleanly homes we had hitherto generally found a resting place at the end of our day's journey. The Mihman Khane, in short, has all the worst defects of a European hotel, without its luxury. Let me briefly describe our experiences at one, that of Kishlach, as a specimen which will serve for all. On our first arrival, we are discourteously told that there is no room. Remonstrances and requests are alike useless, so we prepare to move on and try to find a village where we can halt for the night, which is now rapidly advancing. We have hardly started, after a considerable delay, to allow of the baggage animals coming up, when a man runs after us and informs us that there is room. No explanation or apology is offered for the previous statement, but, as no other habitation is in sight, we decide to turn back. On dismounting, we are conducted to a room littered up, rather than furnished, with several beds, a number of cane-bottomed chairs, and a table or two. The windows are furnished with tawdry curtains, the walls are bedecked with tinselled mirrors and gaudy pictures, while on the washing-stand a single ragged toothbrush is ostentatiously displayed by the side of a clothes-brush, which would seem to be intended to serve as a hair-brush as well. While contemplating this chaos of luxury, and meditating somewhat sadly on the unhappy effect produced in eastern lands by the adoption of western customs, I became aware of a stir outside, and rushing out was just in time to see the Imam Jum'ah, or chief ecclesiastic of Tabriz, drive up in a carriage followed by a number of attendants in other vehicles. By the side of the road lay the bleeding carcass of a sheep, whose throat had just been cut to do honour to the approaching dignitary. This not very graceful custom is common in Persia, and Mr. Abbott, the British consul at Tabriz, informed me that he had great difficulty in preventing its performance whenever he returned to Persia after an absence in Europe. Before we retired for the night, not on the unattractive-looking beds, but, as usual, on our woolsey valises, we received another proof of the advance of European ideas in the neighbourhood of the capital, in the form of a bill, a thing which we had not seen since we left Erzerum, in which two krans were charged for service, which charge the bearer of the document was careful to inform us was not intended to prevent us from bestowing on him a further gratuity. The total amount of the bill was eight crowns, not much indeed, but about double the sum which we had usually expended for a night's lodging hitherto, and we were requested to settle it the same evening, a request which showed that a becoming suspicion of one's fellow creatures was amongst the European improvements introduced by the Mihman Khanes. The muleteers, who had been compelled to pay an exorbitant price for food for their animals, were not less disgusted than ourselves, and declared that they would henceforth avoid Mihman Khanes entirely. Next day, accordingly, passing two of these, we made a long stage, and halted about nightfall at a walled village called Kala'i Imam Jum'a, where we were assured by Farach that we should find everything that our hearts desired. Unless he fancied that our hearts would desire nothing but melon peel, which was scattered freely about the floor of the little cell where we took up our quarters, Farachi's promise must have been dictated less by a strict regard for truth than by a fear of being compelled by us to halt at a mihman khane. 
However, we eventually succeeded in obtaining some bread from a kindly Persian who had become cognizant of our need, and with this and the last remains of the preserved meats bought at Trebizond, we managed to appease our hunger, consoling ourselves with the thought that this would be our last night in the wilderness for the present, and that on the morrow we should be amongst the flesh-pots of Tehran. Next morning we were astir early, for the excitement of being so near the Persian capital made sloth impossible. Yet to me at least this excitement was not free from a certain tinge of sorrow at the thought that I must soon bid farewell to the faithful Farach, whom, notwithstanding his occasional obstinacy and intractability, I had learnt to like. Moreover, difficult as may be the transition from European to Asiatic life, the return is scarcely easier. I sighed inwardly at the thought of exchanging the free, unconstrained, open-air existence of the caravan for the restraints of society and the trammels of town life, and it was only when I reflected on the old friends I should see again and the new friends I hoped to make that I felt quite reconciled to the change before me. This day's march was the most interesting since leaving Kazvin. To the north, on our left hand, towered the long range of the Elburz mountains, much loftier and bolder in outline here than at their western extremity. Nor had we proceeded far when there burst suddenly on our view the majestic snow-capped cone of Mount Demavend, where, as ancient legend runs, the tyrant parricide, Zuhak, lies bound in chains. At the base of this giant wall are gentler slopes, covered with villages which serve as a summer retreat to the more opulent, when the heat of the capital has become intolerable. Near the road for some distance runs the river Karach, bright and rippling, while to the south of this numerous little villages set with poplars diversify the monotony of the grey stony plain. Once or twice we passed bands of soldiers returning from their military service to their homes in Azerbaijan, and then a mighty caravan of a hundred and eleven camels wending its slow course westward. Then all at once our eyes were dazzled by flashes of light reflected from an object far away towards the south, which shone like gold in the sun. This, I at first imagined, must be the situation of the capital, but I was mistaken, it was the dome of the holy shrine of Shah Abdul Azim, situated five or six miles south of Tehran, which, lying as it does somewhat in a hollow, is not clearly seen until it is almost reached. At length, however, at a little roadside tea-house where we halted for refreshment, we came in sight of it. Many such tea-houses formerly existed in the capital, but most of them were closed some time ago by the order of the Shah. The reason, commonly alleged for this proceeding, is that they were supposed to encourage extravagance and idleness, or, as I have also heard said, evils of a more serious kind. Outside the town, however, some of them are still permitted to continue their trade, and provide the bona fide traveller with refreshment, which, needless to say, does not include wine or spirits. At length, about sunset, we entered the city by the Derwazayi Nav, New Gate, and here we were accosted by one Yusuf Ali, who, though he wore the Persian dress, was, as he proudly informed us, a British subject of Indian nationality. We asked him what accommodation was to be found in Tehran. He replied that there were two hotels, one kept by a family called Prevost, of French or Swiss extraction, the other by a man called Albert and advised us to go to the latter, because it was cheaper. As, however, we purposed making a sojourn of some length in the capital, and the comfort of our abode was therefore a matter of more importance than when we were halting only for a night or two, we determined to inspect both places on the following day, and in the meantime, as it was now late, to take up temporary quarters at a caravanserai situated not far from the gate whereby we had entered. End of section 8。section 9 of a year amongst the Persians by Edward Granville Brown 
This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For further information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Year Amongst the Persians by Edward Granville Brown Chapter 5. Tehran There was a most ingenious architect, who had contrived a new method for building houses, by beginning at the roof, and working downwards to the foundation, which he justified to me by the light practice of those two prudent insects, the bee and the spider, swift. Hitherto I have, in describing my travels, followed pretty closely the journals which I kept during their continuance, only amplifying such things as appeared unfamiliar or interesting, and suppressing or abridging entries which I deemed to be of consequence to no one but myself. Now, however, a different plan becomes necessary, for since I continued at the Persian capital for about ten weeks, and since many days passed uneventfully, either in study or in conversation with friends and acquaintances, a full record of this period would necessarily be both prolix and unprofitable. I shall therefore include in this chapter all that I have to say about the people, topography, institutions, public buildings, gardens, squares, palaces, mosques, and educational establishments of Tehran, to which I shall add a short notice on the royal family, a description of some entertainments to which I was admitted as a guest, and a few anecdotes illustrative of the Persian genius and character. Now, my stay at Tehran was divided into two periods, differing somewhat in character. During the first, which began on the second day after our arrival, 24th of November, and ended with the departure of my companion, H, on the 29th of December, we lodged at Prevost's Hotel, and were for the most part occupied with sightseeing and social distractions, from both of which we derived much profit and pleasure but when we had become thus generally conversant with the life of the capital h who had no special interest in the language literature or science of the persians and whose time was moreover limited desired to continue his journey to the persian gulf while i finding at tehran facilities for the prosecution of my studies which i was unwilling to let slip wished to remain there so, finding our objects incompatible, we were compelled to separate. He left Tehran for the south on 29th of December, taking with him our Turkish servant Ali, who was unwilling to remain in Persia longer than he could help, since he found the people and the climate equally uncongenial. These then journeyed gradually southward, halting for a while at the chief towns through which they passed, until about the beginning of April they reached Bushir, and thence took ship homewards. Soon after their departure, about the beginning of the new year, 1888, I was invited by my friend, the Nawab Mirza Hassan Ali Khan, a Persian nobleman, whose acquaintance I had made in London, to take up my abode with him in a house which he had rented near the English embassy. Of this kind offer I very gratefully availed myself, and continued for the remainder of my stay in Tehran, i.e. till the 7th of February, 1888, an inmate of his house, to my great pleasure and advantage. For my whole desire was, as my host well knew, to obtain as full an insight as possible into Persian life, and though he was thoroughly conversant with the English language, yet out of regard for me he rarely talked with me save in Persian, except that in the evening he would sometimes ask me to read with him a chapter of Carlyle's Heroes and Hero Worship, which work, by reason of the favourable opinion of the Prophet Muhammad, entertained by the author, is very highly esteemed by Mohammedans acquainted with English. Moreover, most of my host's visitors and all his servants were Persian, and spoke for the most part only Persian, though his younger brother, an officer in the Persian army, and two of his nephews, whom I had known in London, had been educated partly in England, and spoke English extremely well, so that I was not only able, but forced to make much progress in speaking and understanding. 
and during all this time I was able to benefit by the teaching of a very able scholar, Mirza Asadullah of Sabzawar, a pupil of the late Haji Mullah Hadi of Sabzawar, the greatest philosopher whom Persia has produced during the present century. Thus was I enabled to obtain some insight into the philosophical doctrines current in Persia, of which I shall say something in the next chapter. The European colony in Tehran is considerable, and the society which it affords equally remarkable for distinction and hospitality. It comprises the corps diplomatique attached to the different embassies, and almost every European nation of note is represented, as well as the United States of America. The staff of the Indo-European Telegraph, the American missionaries, several merchants and men of business, and a few Europeans employed in the Persian service. From many of these I received much hospitality and kindness, which I shall not soon forget, and on which I would gladly dwell, did I feel justified in so doing. But my business at present is not to attempt an inadequate discharge of personal obligations, a discharge, moreover, which would probably be unacceptable to those to whom I am so indebted, but to depict with such fidelity as I may the life, character, and customs of the Persians. Of the European colony, then, I will say no more than this, that it is associated in my mind with every feeling of gratitude and every pleasant remembrance which kindness and hospitality received in a strange land can evoke in the heart or impress on the mind of the recipient. Tehran, as every one knows, was not always the capital of Persia. In the most ancient days, the province of Fars, or Persia proper, and at a later time, Isfahan, generally enjoyed this dignity. At other times, when, on the decay of some great dynasty, the empire was split up into numerous fragments, princes of different dynasties often reigned over one or two provinces, fixing the seat of government at the most important town in their dominions. Under the Safavi kings, when the ancient greatness of Persia enjoyed a temporary revival, it was Isfahan which was graced by their splendid court. About a century ago, when the great struggle between the Zend dynasty and the present reigning family of Qajars was in progress, the former, represented by the noble and generous Karim Khan, had its capital at Shiraz, while the latter, personified by that atrocious and bloodthirsty tyrant, Akka Muhammad Khan, fixed their headquarters at Tehran. On the final victory of the latter, the northern city, situated as it is near the lands from which sprung the originally Turkish tribe of the Qajars, was definitely raised to the rank of capital, and has enjoyed this dignity ever since while each of the three kings who succeeded the founder of the dynasty has further exerted himself to enlarge and beautify the city. Tehran, as it is at present, is a large town lying in a slight hollow, just sufficient to prevent its being seen from any distance on the plain, roughly speaking circular in shape, and entirely surrounded by walls of unbaked clay, and for the most part by a ditch as well. Access is given to the interior by twelve gates, which are as follows. Between the north and east, 1. The derwaze beh jetabad 2. The derwaze ye daulat 3. The derwaze ye shamran Leading to the gardens, palaces and villages situated to the north of the city on the slopes of Elburs. Between the east and south, 4 the derwaze ye daushan tepe leading to the shah's hunting palace of daushan tepe or hare hill five derwaze ye dulab the mill gate six the derwaze ye mashhad the mashhad gate between the south and west seven the derwaze ye shah abdul azim through which passes the great caravan road to the south eight the derwaze ye ghar the cave gate nine the derwaze ye now the new gate between west and north ten the derwaze ye gumruk the custom house gate eleven 
the Derwazeye Kazvin, the Kazvin Gate, 12. the Derwazeye Astavani, the Racecourse Gate, to the north of the city are numerous gardens, some, like Beh Jetabad and Yusufabad, situated within a short walk of the walls, some in the villages of Shimran, like Kulahak and Tajrish, which serve as summer retreats to the Europeans and rich Persians, distant five or six miles from the town, and others yet more distant on the slopes of El Burs. Some of the gardens belonging to the royal family are very beautifully laid out, as, for example, the garden called Kamra Niye, which is the property of the Shah's third son, the Na'ibus Sultana. The Persians take the greatest delight in their gardens, and show more pride in exhibiting them to the stranger than in pointing out to him their finest buildings. Yet to one accustomed to the gardens of the West, they appear, as a rule, nothing very wonderful. They generally consist of a square enclosure surrounded by a mud wall, planted with rows of poplar trees in long straight avenues, and intersected with little streams of water. The total absence of grass seems their greatest defect in the eyes of a European, but apart from this they do not, as a rule, contain a great variety of flowers, and except in the spring, present a very bare appearance. But in the eyes of the Persian, accustomed to the naked stony plains which constitute so large a portion of his country, they appear as veritable gardens of Eden and he will never be happier than when seated under the shade of a poplar by the side of the stream, sipping his tea and smoking his kalyan. What I have said applies to the great majority of gardens in Persia, but not to all, for some of those in Shiraz are very beautiful, and except for the lack of the well-trimmed lawns which we regard as so indispensable to the perfect beauty of a garden, might well defy all competition. Many of the gardens near Tehran are cultivated by Gebrs, the remnant of the ancient faith of Zoroaster. The headquarters of Zoroastrianism in Persia are at Yezd and Kirman, in and about which cities there may be in all some 7,000 or 8,000 adherents of the old creed. In other towns they are met with but sparingly, and are not distinguished by the dull yellow dress and loosely wound yellow turban which they are compelled to wear in the two cities above mentioned. As I shall speak of this interesting people at some length when I come to describe my stay amongst them in the only two places in Persia where they still exist in any numbers, I will not at present dwell on their characteristics further than to allude briefly to their dachme or Tower of Silence, situated two or three miles south of Tehran, on one of the rocky spurs of the jagged mountain, called Kohi Bibi Shahbanu. Bibi Shahbanu was the daughter of the unfortunate Yezdigir III, whose sad fate it was to see the mighty empire of the Sasanians and the ancient religion of Zoroaster fall in one common ruin before the savage onslaught of the hitherto despised Arabs, ere he himself, a hunted fugitive, perished by the hand of a treacherous miller in whose house he had taken refuge. The daughter subsequently married Hussein, the son of Ali, thus uniting the royal blood of the house of Sasan with the holy race of the Imams, and the kindred of the Arabian prophet. To this union is perhaps to be attributed in some degree the enthusiasm with which the Persians, bereft of their old religion, espoused the cause of Ali and his successors, or in other words the Shiite faction of the Mohammedans, against the usurpations of those whom the Sunnis dignify with the title of Khalifa, or vice-regent of the Prophet. After the calamities suffered by the family of Ali at the hands of their ruthless foes, Bibi Shahbanu is said to have fled to Persia, and to have found a refuge from her oppressors in the mountain just to the south of Tehran, which still bears her name. It is said that the place where she hid is still marked by a shrine, which has the miraculous property of being inaccessible to men though women may visit it unimpeded. Where this shrine is, I do not know, 
neither did I make any attempt to test the truth of the legend. The Gebrsdachme is situated midway up a sharp ridge which descends from the summit of this mountain on the northern side, and is a conspicuous object from a distance. It consists of a circular tower of clay or unbaked brick, of the greyish colour common to all buildings in Persia. The wall, which is provided with no door or gate, is about forty-five feet high on the outside. Inside, as we could see by ascending the spur on which it stands to a point which overlooks it, its height, owing to the raised floor, is probably not more than ten feet. The floor of the tower consists of a level surface broken at regular intervals by rectangular pits. Whenever a Zoroastrian dies, his body is conveyed hither and deposited by two of his co-religionists, set apart for this duty, inside the Dachme and over one of these pits. The carrion birds which hover round this dreary spot soon swoop down, tear it in pieces and devour its flesh, till nothing is left but the disarticulated bones, which fall into the pit below. Little, therefore, remains to tell of those who have been laid in this charnel house, and from the ridge above, where I could see almost the whole of the interior, I counted not more than two skulls and a few long bones. Of course, the total number of Zoroastrians in Tehran is very small, and the deaths do not probably exceed two or three a year, which may to some extent explain the paucity of remains in the Dachme. Yezd and Kirmon have each two Dachmes similarly constructed, and situated in like manner on the spurs of mountains at a distance of several miles from the city. These five Dachmes constitute, so far as I know, the total number now in use in Persia. This method of disposing of the dead often strikes Europeans as very disgusting, and indeed it would clearly be inapplicable to a thickly populated flat country with a humid atmosphere. In Persia, however, where the air is so clear, the sun so strong, the population so sparse, and mountains so numerous, I can well imagine that no inconvenience was caused by its adoption, even in the days when the whole population was Zoroastrian. Near the mouth of the valley, which lies to the north of the Kuhi Bibi Shahbanu, and on the opposite side to the Dachme, is a tablet cut in the rock, in rough imitation of the ancient monuments about Persepolis, bearing the figure of a king and an inscription in modern Persian. Though of such recent date, it possesses none of the clearness still discernible in its Sasanian prototypes, and the writing on it is already almost illegible. Below this, at the end of the valley, are to be seen the remains of gigantic mud walls, which are said to have formed a portion of the ancient city of Rai, Rages, though by some this is supposed to have lain farther from Tehran, towards the east, near the present village of Varami. Rather nearer to the Shah Abdul Azim road, which crosses the mouth of the valley at right angles, are two high brick towers, one of which is called the Tower of Toghrul. Of the little town of Shah Abdul Azim itself, which is chiefly notable for its very fine mosque and its very detestable population, the place being what is called Bast, that is, a sanctuary or city of refuge, where all criminals are safe from pursuit. I shall have something to say in another chapter. It was to this place that the railway of which such great things were expected, and which it was hoped might be extended farther south, perhaps even to the Persian Gulf, was laid from Tehran. When I returned there in the autumn of 1888, on my way home, this railway was open, and was running some eight or ten trains a day, each way. Its prosperity, alas, was short-lived. Before the end of the year it was torn up and completely wrecked by a mob, exasperated at the accidental death of a man who had tried to leap from the train while it was in motion. That the friends of this man, whose death was brought about solely by his own folly and rashness, acted unreasonably in revenging themselves on the railway, I do not for a moment wish to deny. 
that the deep-seated prejudice against this and other European innovations which found its manifestation in this act is equally unreasonable, I am not, however, disposed to admit. I think that the jealousy with which the Persian people are prone to regard these railways, tramways, monopolies, concessions and companies, of which so much has been heard lately, is both natural and reasonable. These things, so far as they are sources of wealth at all, are so, not to the Persian people, but to the Shah and his ministers on the one hand, and to the European promoters of the schemes on the other. People who reason about them in Europe too often suppose that the interests of the Shah and of his subjects are identical, when they are, in fact, generally diametrically opposed, and that the Shah is an enlightened monarch, eager for the welfare and progress of a stubborn and refractory people who delight in thwarting his benevolent schemes, when in reality he is a selfish despot, devoid of public spirit, careful only of his own personal comfort and advantage, and most averse to the introduction of liberal ideas amongst the people whose natural quickness, intelligence, and aptitude to learn cause him nothing but anxiety. He does everything in his power to prevent the diffusion of those ideas which conduce to true progress, and his supposed admiration for civilization amounts to little more than the languid amusement which he derives from the contemplation and possession of mechanical playthings and ingenious toys. I can only pause to notice one other object of interest outside the city walls, to wit the pleasantly situated palace of Daushan Tepe, which means in Turkish Hare Hill, where the Shah often goes to pursue the chase, to which he is passionately devoted. This palace of dazzling whiteness stands on an eminence to the northeast of the town and forms a very conspicuous feature in the landscape. Besides the palace on the hill, there is another in a garden on its southern side, attached to which is a small menagerie belonging to the Shah. This collection of animals is not very extensive, but includes fine specimens of the Persian lion, Shir, whose most famous haunt is in the forests of Dashti Arjin, between Shiraz and Bushir, as well as a few tigers, Babur, leopards, Palang, and baboons, Shangal. Section 10 of A Year Amongst the Persians by Edward Granville Brown. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For further information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Year Amongst the Persians by Edward Granville Brown. Having spoken of what is without the city, I must now say something about the chief monuments contained within its walls. These are very few, and for the most part of little interest. Tehran is an essentially modern town, and as such lacks the charm which invests Isfahan, Shiraz, Yezd, and other Persian cities of more respectable antiquity. In the eyes of its own inhabitants, however, it appears the ne plus ultra of splendour. It has two European hotels. It is intersected, especially in the northern quarter, by several wide straight thoroughfares, some of which are even lighted by gas, and one of which certain Europeans and their Persian imitators are pleased to designate the Boulevard des Ambassadeurs. There are also several large squares, some of which are embellished with tanks and fountains worthy of a sincere admiration. In addition to all this, the bazaars, situated in the southern quarter, are extensive and flourishing. The situation of the town, in full view of the snow-capped mountains of El Burz, is unquestionably fine, and the air is clear and exhilarating. In a word, it is a pleasant place to stay in, rather than an interesting place to see. Nevertheless, some of my readers may desire to obtain a clearer notion of what is, after all, the present capital of Persia. Let me ask them, then, to accompany me in imagination for a stroll through the northern quarter of the city, in which are situated most of the parks, palaces, and public buildings, all the embassies, except the Russian, 
and the residences of almost all the Europeans and many of the more opulent and influential Persians. We will begin our walk at the northern end of the Khiabani Allah ud Boulevard des Ambassadeurs, a fine, broad, straight avenue running almost due north and south. Entering this from the north, through the wasteland which intervenes, or did intervene six years ago, between it and the Behjetabad and Daulat gates, we first pass, on the right-hand side, the fine garden and buildings of the English embassy. Lower down on the same side are the German and American legations. Near the latter, a street running westwards leads to the church, schools and residences of the American missionaries. On the left, east side of the avenue, the finest building is the Turkish embassy, remarkable for a magnificent gate adorned with an inscription in letters of gold. On the same side are the French and Italian legations, and a little lower down, the office of the Indo-European Telegraph. Beyond this are a few European shops, as well as the two hotels already mentioned. Opposite these are several more shops, one of which belongs to a photographer, a Russian, I believe, who sells excellent photographs at the very cheap price of four tumans, about twenty-four shillings, a hundred. Below this point, as well as in some places above it, the sides of the avenue are formed by colonnades of brick, within which are situated a few small Persian shops, dealing chiefly in groceries. Passing under an archway, guarded by sentries, we enter the northwest corner of the Meidani Topkhane, or Artillery Square. This is of great size, and is surrounded by barracks, the white walls of which are profusely decorated with rude representations of the national symbol, the lion and the sun. From this square emerge five great streets or avenues, one, sometimes called the Rue de Gaz, on the east side, two on the south, and two, one of which we have already traversed, on the north. Leaving the three which belong to the eastern portion of the square for future consideration, we continue in a direct southward line across the western end, and enter another avenue, which leads us past some of the Persian government offices, the road opposite to which is during a considerable part of the day blocked by carriages and horses, into a very pretty square, well paved and girt with trees, called the Maidana Yarg, Citadel Square. The central portion of this is occupied by a large basin of water of octagonal shape, surrounded by gas lamps. At its southern end is a raised stone platform on which stands a large gun mounted on wheels. This gun is remarkable in common with Shah Abdul Azim, the royal stables and sundry other places, as affording sanctuary to those who are pursued by the law. It has indeed the disadvantage of being a very small city of refuge, and one which would not long be tenable. Nevertheless, for the time being, the fugitive is safe in its shadow. Quitting the Maidani Yarg, and traversing a short bazaar containing a few small shops, we come out into another broad street, which at this point runs at right angles to our path, but which, if we turned to the left and followed its course eastward, would be found to bend gradually into a northerly direction, and would conduct us back to the Meidani Topkhane. By this road we propose to return, but before doing so, let us take a glance at the intricate mazes of the bazaar. To do this, we cross the road and enter a square known as Sabze Meidan, or Herb Market. In its centre is the usual tank of water, and it is surrounded by the shops of watchmakers, tobacconists, and other tradesmen, mostly of Armenian nationality. We cross towards its southern side, and enter the hat-maker's bazaar, Kucheyakula Duzan, where any variety of Persian headdress may be purchased, from the light cloth hat affected by the Armenians, and Europeanized Virangi Ma'ab, Persians, costing only three or four crowns, about two shillings, to the genuine lambskin kula, costing thirty, forty, or even fifty crowns.
Having passed the hat-makers, we come to the shoemakers, and if we continue our way, perseveringly, towards the south, we shall eventually arrive at the gate of Shah Abdul Azim, unless, as may easily happen, we lose our bearings hopelessly in the labyrinthine mazes which we must traverse, distracted either by a string of majestic camels, past which we contrive to edge ourselves, or by a glittering array of antique gems, seals, and turquoises, exposed in a case at our very elbow. As, however, we have already visited the Dachmei in the mountain of Bibi Sharbanu, and the ruins of Ray, and as we shall pass through Shah Abdul Azim on our journey southwards, it is unnecessary to explore the bazaar any farther at present. Bazaars, after all, are much alike, not only in Persia, but throughout the Mohammedan world. There are the same, more or less tortuous, vaulted colonnades, thronged with horses, camels, and men, the same cool recesses in which are successively exhibited every kind of merchandise, the same subdued murmur and aroma of spices, which form a tout ensemble so irresistibly attractive, so continually fresh, yet so absolutely similar, whether seen in Constantinople, or Kirman, Tehran, or Tabriz. Instead of pursuing our way farther, therefore, we strike to the left from the shoemaker's bazaar, and without even pausing to examine the array of saddles, bridles, whips, saddle-bags, leather water-bags, and other travellers' requisites exhibited to our gaze, make for the bazaar i Dumbali Khandak, market behind the moat, and following this for a while, soon emerge once more into the broad open street, which we crossed at a point farther west, to reach the Sabze Maidan. At the point where we have now entered it, it has already begun to assume a northerly direction, to reach the Maidan i Topkhane, towards which we again bend our steps. On our left we pass the very modern-looking palace, called Shamsulimara, the sun of architecture, with its lofty tower, and come to the Darul Fanun, or university. Here English, French, Russian, medicine, both ancient and modern, mathematics, and other useful accomplishments are taught on European methods. The students vary in age from mere boys to youths of eighteen or nineteen, and are distinguished by a military-looking uniform. They not only receive their education free, but are allowed one meal a day and two suits of clothes a year at the public expense, besides being rewarded, in case of satisfactory progress and good conduct, by a very liberal distribution of prizes at the end of the session. Arabic, theology, and metaphysic do not enter into the curriculum, but are relegated to the ancient madrasas attached to some of the mosques, and endowed by pious bequests. The best madrasas, however, must be sought for, not in Tehran, but in Isfahan, the former capital. Just above the Darul Funun is another fine building, intended, I believe, to serve as a central telegraph office, which shall combine the hitherto separated European and Persian branches. Not far above this we re-enter the Maidani Topkhane, this time at the southeast corner. To our right, the Rue de Gaz emerges from the square and runs eastward. In it dwells a Turkish hair-cutter of well-deserved fame, but beyond this it possesses few features of interest, and we may therefore pass it by and cross to the northeast corner of the square, whence we enter another avenue similar to and parallel with the Khiaibani ala Uddawla, in which we commenced our walk. This avenue is bounded on the right by a fine garden, the Bari la Lezar, garden of the tulip bed, which belonged, I believe, to the talented Riza Kuli Khan, generally known as the Lala Bashi, or chief tutor of the Shah, whose numerous works, varied in matter but uniform in merit, are alone sufficient to prove that Persian literary ability has not, as some would pretend, ceased to exist. 
Little else besides this claims our attention here, and if we pursue our way up this avenue, we shall finally reach a point where it is crossed by another broad road running at right angles to it. This latter, if we follow it to the left, will bring us out where we started from, in front of the English embassy. Although the walk just described has led us through most of the principal streets and squares, and past a number of the chief buildings and palaces, a few objects of interest which lie apart from the route traversed deserve a brief notice. First amongst these I will mention, because it can be disposed of in a very few words, another large square called Maidani Mashk, Drill Square, which lies to the northwest of the Maidani Topkhane. Though somewhat smaller than the latter, it is very spacious and serves admirably the purpose to which, as its name implies, it is appropriated, that of a place d'armes, or exercising ground for the troops. Next to this, the palace called Nigaristan, picture gallery, which was the favourite residence of the second king of the present dynasty, Fat Ali Shah, deserves mention. It is situated at no great distance from the English embassy, and derives its name from the numerous highly finished paintings with which the walls of some of its chambers are decorated. In the largest room I counted not less than 118 full-length portraits, which included not only Fat Ali Shah and his numerous sons and ministers, but also the staffs of the French and English embassies, headed respectively by General Gardan and Sir John Malcolm, then resident at the Persian court, the names of all these being indicated in Persian characters. The portraits, which seem to have been carefully and accurately executed, were completed in the year A.H. 1228, A.D. 1812 to 1813, by one Abdullah, as is witnessed by an inscription placed under them. The only other noticeable feature of the Nigaristan is a beautiful marble bath, furnished with a long, smooth glissoire, called by the Persians Sursurak, the slide, which descends from above to the very edge of the bath. Down this slope the numerous ladies of Fat Ali Shah's harem used to slide into the arms of their lord, who was waiting below to receive them. It remains to say a few words about the mosques, which are of less interest than those of almost any other Mohammedan city of equal size. One of the finest is quite recent, and was indeed still in process of construction when I visited it. It was commenced by the late Sipah Sadar, whose career is generally reported to have been brought to an abrupt close by a cup of Qajar coffee, while he was in retirement and disgrace at Mashhad. The construction of the mosque, rudely interrupted by this sad event, was subsequently resumed by his brother, the Mushirud Dawla, whom I had the honour of visiting. He received me with the easy courtesy characteristic of the Persian nobleman, questioned me as to my studies, the books I had read, and the towns I proposed to visit on leaving Tehran and after allowing me to inspect the various rooms, some furnished in Persian and others in European style, in his large and beautiful house, kindly sent a servant with me to show me the mosque, which I might otherwise have had difficulty in seeing. The fine large court of the mosque, in the centre of which is a tank of water, is surrounded by lofty buildings, devoted partly to educational, partly to religious purposes. On the walls of these is inscribed on tiles the waqf name, or detail of endowment, in which is set forth the number of professors and students of theology and the kindred sciences who are to be maintained within the walls of the college. Of the former there were to be four, and of the latter, I think, one hundred and fifty. It is generally very difficult to visit the interior of mosques in Persia, for in this respect the Shi'ite Mohammedans are much more strict than the Sunnis, and a non-Muslim can as a rule only enter them in disguise. I once resorted to this expedient to obtain a glimpse of another mosque in Tehran, the Masjid-i-Shah, 
which I visited with two of my Persian friends. Although we only remained in it for a very short time, we did not wholly escape the critical gaze of sundry mullahs, who kept hovering round us, and I was not sorry to emerge once more into the bazaar, for the consequences of discovery would have been, to say the least of it, disagreeable. From the little I have seen of the interiors of Persian mosques, I should say that they were decidedly less beautiful than those of Constantinople or Cairo. I have already had occasion to speak of the Darul Funun, or university, and I mentioned the fact that it included a school of medicine. Through the kindness of Dr. Tholazan, the Shah's physician, I was enabled to be present at one of the meetings of the Majlis Isikhat, Congress of Health, or Medical Council, held once a week within its walls. The assembly was presided over by the learned Mukhbirud Dawla, the Minister of Education, and there were present at it sixteen of the chief physicians of the capital, including the professors of medicine, both the followers of Galen and Avicenna, and those of the modern school. The discussion was conducted for the most part in Persian, Dr. Tholazan and myself being the only Europeans present. But occasionally a few remarks were made in French, with which several of those present were conversant. After a little desultory conversation, a great deal of excellent tea flavoured with orange juice, and the inevitable kalyan or water-pipe, the proceedings commenced with a report on the death-rate of Tehran, and the chief causes of mortality. This was followed by a clear and scientific account of a case of acute ophthalmia successfully treated by inoculation, the merits of which plan of treatment were then compared with the results obtained by the use of jekiriti, called in Persian chazmi khurus, and in Arabic ainuddik, both of which terms signify cock's eye. Reports were then read on the death rates and causes of mortality at some of the chief provincial towns. According to these, Kirman Shah suffered chiefly from ague, dysentery and smallpox, while in Isfahan, Kirman and Shahrud, typhus or typhoid joined its ravages to those of the above-mentioned diseases. My faith in these reports was, however, somewhat shaken when I subsequently learnt that they were in great measure derived from information supplied by those whose business it is to wash the corpses of the dead. Some account was next given of a fatal hemorrhagic disease which had lately decimated the Yomut Turkmans. As these wild nomads appeared to entertain an unconquerable aversion to medical men, no scientific investigation of this outbreak had been possible. Finally, a large stone, extracted by lithotomy, was exhibited by a Persian surgeon, and after a little general conversation, the meeting finally broke up about 5 p.m. I was very favourably impressed with the proceedings, which were, from the first to last, characterised by order, courtesy, and scientific method, and from the enlightened efforts of this centre of medical knowledge, I confidently anticipate considerable sanitary and hygienic reforms in Persia. Already in the capital these efforts have produced a marked effect, and there, as well as to a lesser extent in the provinces, the old Galenic system has begun to give place to the modern theory and practice of medicine. End of section 10a Year Amongst the Persians by Edward Granville Brown 
Having now spoken of the topography, buildings, and institutions of the capital, it behoves me to say something about its social aspects. I begin naturally with the royal family. Of Nasiruddin Shah, the reigning king, I have already said something. His appearance has been rendered so familiar in Europe by his three visits to the West, that of it I need hardly speak. He has had a long reign, if not a very glorious one, for he was crowned at Tehran on 20th of October 1848, and there seems every likelihood that he will live to celebrate his jubilee. He came to the throne very young, being not much more than seventeen or eighteen years of age. Before that time he had resided at Tabriz as governor of the province of Azerbaijan, an office always conferred by Qajar sovereigns on the crown prince. The Qajars, as I have already said, are of Turkish origin, and the language of Azerbaijan is also a dialect of Turkish. Whence it came about that Nasiruddin Shah, on his accession, could scarcely express himself at all in Persian, a fact to which Dr. Polak, about that time his court physician, bears testimony. Even now, though he habitually speaks and writes Persian, and has even composed and published some poems in that language, he prefers, I believe, to make use of Turkish in conversation with such of his intimates as understand it. I wish to insist on the fact that the reigning dynasty of the Qajars are essentially of Turkish race, because it is often overlooked, and because it is of some political importance. When the Shah was in England, for instance, certain journals were pleased to speak of him as a descendant of Cyrus, which is about as reasonable as if one should describe our own Prince of Wales as a descendant of King Arthur. The whole history of Persia, from the legendary wars between the Kiyanian kings and Afrasiyab down to the present day, is the story of a struggle between the Turkish races, whose primitive home is in the region east of the Caspian Sea and north of Khurasan on the one hand, and the southern Persians of almost pure Aryan race on the other. The distinction is well marked even now, and the old antipathy still exists finding expressions in verses such as those quoted above at page 77, and in anecdotes illustrative of Turkish stupidity and dullness of wit, of which I shall have occasion to give one in a subsequent chapter. Ethnologically, therefore, there is a marked distinction between the people of the north and the people of the south, a distinction which may be most readily apprehended by comparing the sullen, moody, dull-witted, fanatical, violent inhabitants of Azerbaijan with the bright, versatile, clever, sceptical, rather timid townsfolk of Kirman. In Fars, also, good types of the Aryan Persian are met with, but there is a large admixture of Turkish tribesmen, like the Kashkais, who have migrated and settled there. Indeed, this intermixture has now extended very far, but in general the terms northern and southern may, with reservation, be taken as representing a real and significant difference of type in the inhabitants of Persia. Since the downfall of the Caliphate and the lapse of the Arabian supremacy, the Turkish has generally been the dominant race, for in the physical world it is commonly physical force which wins the day, and dull, dogged courage bears down versatile and subtle wit. Thus it happens that today the Qajars rule over the kinsmen of Cyrus and Shapur, as ruled in earlier days the Ghaznavids and the Seljuks. But there is no love lost between the two races, as any one will admit who has taken the trouble to find out what the southern peasant thinks of the northern court, or how the Qajars regard the cradle of Persia's ancient greatness. Of the Shah's character I do not propose to add much to what I have said already, for in the first place I am conscious of a prejudice against him in my mind arising from the ineffaceable remembrance of his horrid cruelties towards the Babis, and in the second place I enjoyed no unusual facilities for forming a weighty judgment. I have heard him described by a high English official 
who had good opportunities of arriving at a just opinion, as a liberal-minded and enlightened monarch, full of manliness, energy, and sound sense, who in a most difficult situation had displayed much tact and wisdom. It must also be admitted that, apart from the severities practised against the Barbies, which, with alternate remissions and exacerbations, have continued from the beginning of his reign down to the present time, his rule has been, on the whole, mild and comparatively free from the cruelties which mar nearly every page of Persian history. During the latter part of his reign, especially, executions and cruel punishments, formerly of almost daily occurrence, have become very rare, but this is partly to be attributed to the fear of European public opinion, and desire to be thought well of at Western courts and in Western lands, which exercise so strong an influence over his mind. For most of the more recent Barbie persecutions, the Shah was not directly responsible. It was his eldest son, the Zilus Sultan, who put to death the two martyrs of Isfahan in 1879, and Mirza Ashraf of Abade in 1888. And it was in his jurisdiction, though during his absence, that the persecutions of Sikhti and Najaf Abad occurred in the summer of 1889 while the cruel murder of seven innocent barbies at yezd in may eighteen ninety lies at the door of prince jalalud daula son of the zilus sultan and grandson of the shah the last barby put to death actually by the shah's order was i think the young messenger mirza badi who brought from acre and delivered into the king's own hands at tehran the remarkable apology for the Barbi faith addressed to him by Beha Ullah. This was in July 1869. In extenuation of the earlier and more wholesale persecutions, it has been urged that the Barbies were in rebellion against the crown, and that the most horrible of them, that of September 1852, was provoked by the attempt made by three Barbies on the Shah's life. But this attempt itself, apart from the fact that, so far as can be ascertained, it was utterly unauthorized on the part of the Barbi leaders, was caused by the desperation to which the Barbies had been driven by a long series of cruelties, and especially by the execution of their founder in 1850. Amongst the victims also were several persons who, inasmuch as they had been in captivity for many months, were manifestly innocent of complicity in the plot, notably the beautiful Kuratul Ain, whose heroic fortitude, under the most cruel tortures, excited the admiration and wonder of Dr. Polak, the only European, probably, who witnessed her death. These executions were not merely criminal, but foolish, the barbarity of the persecutors defeated its own ends, and instead of inspiring terror, gave the martyrs an opportunity of exhibiting a heroic fortitude, which has done more than any propaganda, however skilful, could have done to ensure the triumph of the cause for which they died. Often have I heard Persians who did not themselves belong to the proscribed sect, tell with admiration how Suleiman Khan, his body pierced with well nigh a score of wounds, in each of which was inserted a lighted candle, went to the place of execution, singing with exultation, Yakdas Jami Badeva Yakdas Zulfiyar, Raksi Junin Mayana Yemi Danam Arzust. In one hand the wine cup, in the other the tresses of the friend, such a dance do I desire in the midst of the market-place. The impression produced by such exhibitions of courage and endurance was profound and lasting. Nay, the faith which inspired the martyrs was often contagious, as the following incident shows. A certain Yezdi Ruff, noted for his wild and disorderly life, went to see the execution of some Barbies, perhaps to scoff at them. But when he saw with what calmness and steadfastness they met torture and death, his feelings underwent so great a revulsion that he rushed forward, crying, Kill me too! I also am a Barbie! 
and thus he continued to cry till he too was made a partaker in the doom he had come out only to gaze upon during my stay in Tehran, I saw the Shah several times, but only once sufficiently near to see his features clearly. This was on the occasion of his visiting the new telegraph office on his way to the university, where he was to preside over the distribution of prizes. Through the kindness of Major Wells, then superintendent of the Indo-European Telegraph in Persia, H. and myself were enabled to stand in the porch of the building while the Shah entered, surrounded by his ministers. We afterwards followed him to the university, and witnessed the distribution of prizes, which was on the most liberal scale, most of the students, so far as I could see, receiving either medals or sums of money averaging three or four tumans, about one pound. The Shah sat in a room opening out into the quadrangle, where the secretaries of state, Mustalfis, professors and students were ranged in order. Around him stood the princes of the royal family, including his third son, the Naibut Sultana, and the ministers of state. The only person allowed to sit beside him was his little favourite, Mani Jak, who accompanied him on his last journey to Europe. The Shah's extraordinary fondness for this child, for he did not, at the time I saw him, appear to be more than eleven or twelve years old, was as annoying to the Persian aristocracy as it was astonishing to the people of Europe. It galled the spirit of the proud nobles of Persia to watch the daily increasing influence of this little wizened, sallow-faced Kurdish lad, who was neither nobly born, nor of comely countenance, nor of pleasant manners and amiable disposition, to see honours and favours lavished upon him and his ignoble kinsmen, to be compelled to do him reverence and bespeak his good offices. All this now is a thing of the past. Within the last year or so, Ghulam Ali Khan, the Kurd, better known as Mani Jak, which in the Kurdish tongue signifies a sparrow, and some while dignified by the title of Azizus Sultan, the darling of the king, fell from favour and was hurled from the pinnacle of power down to his original obscurity. The cause of his fall was, I believe, that one day, while he was playing with a pistol, the weapon exploded and narrowly missed the Shah. This was too much, and Mani Jak and his favoured kinsmen were shorn of their titles and honours, and packed off to their humble home in Kurdistan. Perhaps it was, after all, as well for them, for the darling of the king was far from being the darling of the court. Sooner or later his fall was bound to come, and had it been later, it might have been yet more grievous. The Shah has five sons. Two of these, the Salarul Mulk and the Ruknul Mulk, were, at the time of which I write, mere children. They were described as beautiful and attractive boys, but neglected by their father in favour of Mani Jak. The third son is entitled Naibu Sultana. He resided in Tehran, and to him was entrusted the government of the city and the supreme military command. The two elder sons were born of different mothers, and as the mother of Vali Acht was a princess, he, and not his elder brother, was chosen as the successor to the throne. That the Zilu Sultan inwardly chafed at being thus deprived of his birthright is hardly to be doubted, though he was in the meanwhile compensated for this, in some measure, by being made governor of the greater part of southern Persia, including the three important cities of Shiraz, Yezd, and Isfahan, at the last of which he resided in almost regal state. Here he collected together a considerable body of well-drilled troops, who were said to be more efficient and soldierly than any of the regiments in Tehran. Besides these, he had acquired a number of guns, and his magazines were well provided with arms and ammunition. In view of these preparations, and the energy and decision of character discernible in this prince, it was thought possible that, in the event of his father's death, he might dispute the crown with his younger and gentler brother, the Vali Ahd, in which case it appeared not improbable that he might prove victorious, or at least succeed in maintaining his supremacy over southern Persia. 
All such speculations, however, were cast to the winds by an utterly unforeseen event which occurred towards the end of February 1888, while I was at Isfahan. In the beginning of that month, both the Zilu Sultan and the Vali Ahd had come to Tehran, the former from Isfahan, the latter from Tabriz, to pay a visit to their father. A decoration was to be presented to the former by the English government for the protection and favour which he had extended to English trade and enterprise, towards which he had ever shown himself well disposed. Suddenly, without warning, came the news that he had been deprived of all his governments, with the exception of the city of Isfahan, that he and some of his ministers who had accompanied him to the capital were kept to all intents and purposes prisoners within its walls, that his deputy governors at Yezd, Shiraz and other towns were recalled, and that his army was disbanded, his artillery removed to Tehran, and his power effectually shattered. On first hearing from the Shah that of all the fair regions over which he had held sway, Isfahan only was left to him, he is reported to have said in the bitterness of his heart, You had better take that from me too, to which the Shah replied, I will do so, and will give it to your son, Prince Jalal ud then governor for his father at Shiraz. This threat was, however, not carried out and the Zilus Sultan still possesses the former capital as a remnant of his once wide dominions. Passing from the Shah and his sons, we must now turn our attention to one or two other members of the royal family. Foremost amongst these is, or rather was, for he died in 1888 while I was still in Persia, the Shah's aged uncle. Ferhad Mizar, Muttamadu Dawla, with whom, through the kindness of Dr. Torrance of the American Missionary Establishment, and by means of his interest with Prince Ihtishamut Dawla, the son of Ferhad Mizar, and since the downfall of the Zilu Sultan, governor of Shiraz and the province of Fars, I obtained the honour of an interview. We found him seated amidst a pile of cushions in his Andarun, or inner apartments, surrounded by well-stocked shelves of books. He received us with that inimitable courtesy whereby Persians of the highest rank know so well how to set the visitor completely at his ease, and at the same time to impress him with the deepest respect for their nobility. I was greatly struck by his venerable appearance and dignified mien, as well as by the indomitable energy and keen intelligence expressed by the flashing eye and mobile features, which neither old age nor bodily infirmity was able to rob of their animation. He talked much of a book called Nisab, written by himself to facilitate the acquisition of the English language, with which he had some acquaintance, to his countrymen. Of this work he subsequently presented me with a copy, which I value highly as a souvenir of its illustrious author. It is arranged on the same plan as the Arabic Nisabs, so popular in Persia. That is to say, it consists of a sort of rhymed vocabulary, in which the English words, represented in the text in Persian characters, and repeated in English characters at the head of the page, are explained successively by the corresponding Persian word. The following lines, taken from the commencement of the work, and here represented in English characters, will serve as a specimen of the whole. Dahmahi day, jami meidi, e nigari mahru, kashami miyan di mariach gardad mushbu, hid sarast u nurs bini, lip labast u. I chu chasma. Tooth dindan, foot pool, u hand, dust o face, ru. Gushu garden, iru nick, cheek chire, tang a madzaban. Naf nivildan, u pistan ra bosom, huan hiar mu. In the north of day give the cup of wine, O moon-faced beauty, so that by its fragrance the palate of the intellect may become perfumed as with musk. Head is sar, and nose beneath, lip is lab, and eye like chasm. Tooth din dan, foot pool, and hand dust, and face ru. Gush and gardan, ear and neck, cheek chihre, tongue becomes zaban. Recognize naf as navel. 
and Pistana's bosom, call hair mu. I doubt greatly whether such a method of learning a language would commend itself to a European student, but with the Persians endowed as they are with a great facility for learning by heart, it is a very favourite one. Prince Farhad Birzar professed a great kindness for the English nation as well as for their language. Nor, if the following narrative be true, is this to be wondered at, since his life was once saved by Sir Taylor Thompson, when endangered by the anger of his nephew the Shah. Fleeing from the messengers of the king's wrath, he took refuge in the English embassy, and threw himself on the protection of his friend the ambassador, who promised to give him shelter so long as it should be necessary. Soon the royal Farashis arrived, and demanded his surrender, which demand was unhesitatingly refused. They then threatened to break in by force and seize their prisoner, whereupon Sir Taylor Thompson drew a line across the path, and declared that he would shoot the first man who attempted to cross it. Thereupon they thought it best to retire, and Ferhad Mirza remained for a while the guest of the British Embassy, during which time Sir Taylor Thompson never suffered him to partake of a dish without first tasting it himself, for it was feared that, violence having failed, poison might perhaps be employed. Ultimately the Shah's anger subsided, and his uncle was able again to emerge from his place of refuge. Before the close of our audience, Ferhad Mirza asked me how long I intended to stop in Tehran, and whither I proposed to go on leaving it. I replied that my intention was to proceed to Shiraz as soon as the spring set in, since that it was the Darul Ilm, abode of knowledge, and I thought that I might better pursue my studies there. That, replied Ferhad Mirza, is quite a mistake. Five hundred years ago Shiraz was the Darul Ilm, but now that has passed, and it can only be called the Darul Fisk, abode of vice. Firhad Mirza has little reason to like Shiraz, nor has Shiraz much better reason to like Firhad Mirza. He was twice governor of that town and the province of Fars, of which it is the capital, and was so unpopular during his administration that when he was recalled the populace did not seek to hide their delight, and even pursued him with jeers and derisive remarks. Ferhad Mirza swore that the Shirazis should pay for their temporary triumph right dearly, and he kept his word. After a lapse of time he was again appointed governor of the city that had insulted him, and his rule, never of the gentlest, became sterner than ever. During his four years of office, ending about 1880, he is said to have caused no less than 700 hands to be cut off for various offences. In one case a man came and complained that he had lost an ass, which was subsequently found amongst the animals belonging to a lad in the neighbourhood. The latter was seized and brought before Firhad Mirza, who, as soon as the ass had been identified by the plaintiff, ordered the hand of the defendant to be cut off without further delay, giving no ear to the protestations of the poor boy that the animal had, of its own accord, entered his herd, and that he had not, till the accusation of theft was preferred against him, been able to discover its owner. Besides these minor punishments, many robbers and others suffered death. Not a few were walled up alive in pillars of mortar, there to perish miserably. The remains of these living tombs may still be seen just outside the Derwaze ye Kasab Khane slaughterhouse gate at Shiraz, while another series lines the road as it enters the little town of Abadi, situated near the northern limit of the province of Fars. On another occasion, a certain Sheikh Mazkur, who had revolted in the Garamsir, or hot region, bordering on the Persian Gulf, and had struck coins in his own name, was captured and brought to Shiraz, together with two of his followers, one of whom was his chief executioner. Firhad Birza first compelled the Sheikh to eat one of his own coins, and then caused him and his followers to be strangled and suspended from a lofty gibbet, as a warning to the disaffected. Notwithstanding his severity, Perhad Mirza enjoyed a great reputation for piety, and had accomplished the pilgrimage to Mecca.
His son, as I have said, was, early in 1888, appointed governor of Shiraz, where the reputation of his father caused his advent to be looked forward to with some apprehension. The only other member of the Persian royal family whom I met was one of the brothers of the Shah entitled Izud Dawla, who, if less important a personage than Ferhad Mirza, was by no means less courteous. He asked many questions about recent inventions in Europe, manifesting an especial interest, so far as I remember, in patent medicines and dynamite. Having now completed all that I have to say about the reigning dynasty, I will speak shortly of Persian dinner parties at Tehran. As these are seen in a more truly national form in the provinces, where chairs, tables, knives and forks have not yet obtruded themselves to such an extent as in the semi-Europeanized capital, I shall leave much that I have to say on this subject for subsequent pages. Most of the Persians with whom I was intimate at Tehran had adopted European habits to a considerable extent, and during my residence there I was only on two occasions present at a really national entertainment. The order of procedure is always much the same. The guests arrive about sundown and are ushered into what corresponds to the drawing-room, where they are received by their host and his male relations, for women are of course excluded. Talyans, water pipes, and wine or undiluted spirits, the latter being preferred, are offered them, and they continue to smoke and drink intermittently during the whole of the evening. Dishes of argil, pistachio nuts, and the like are handed round or placed near the guests, and from time to time a spit of kebabs, pieces of broiled meat, enveloped in a folded sheet of the flat bread called nane sangak is brought in. These things bring out the flavour of the wine and serve to stimulate, and at the same time appease, the appetite of the guests, for the actual supper is not served till the time for breaking up the assembly has almost arrived, which is rarely much before midnight. As a rule, music is provided for the entertainment of the guests. The musicians are usually three in number. One plays a stringed instrument, the sitar, one a drum, Dun bark, consisting of an earthenware framework shaped something like a huge egg cup and covered with parchment at one end only. The third sings to the accompaniment of his fellow performers. Sometimes dancing boys are also present who excite the admiration and applause of the spectators by their elaborate posturing, which is usually more remarkable for acrobatic skill than for grace, at any rate according to our ideas. These, however, are more often seen in Shiraz than at Tehran. Occasionally the singer is a boy, and if his voice be sweet and his appearance comely, he will be greeted with rapturous applause. At one entertainment to which I had been invited, the guests were so moved by the performance of the boy singer that they all joined hands and danced round him in a circle, chanting in a kind of monotonous chorus, Barakala, Kuchulu, Barakala, Kuchulu, God bless thee, little one, God bless thee, little one, till sheer exhaustion compelled them to stop. When the host thinks that the entertainment has lasted long enough, he gives the signal for supper, which is served either in the same or in another room. A cloth is laid on the floor, round which are arranged long flat cakes of pebble bread, which do double duty as food and plates. The meats, consisting for the most part of pilaus and chilaus of different sorts, are placed in the centre, together with bowls of sherbet, each of which is supplied with a delicately carved wooden spoon, with deep boat-shaped bowl, whereof the sides slope down to form a sort of keel at the bottom. The guests squat down on their knees and heels round the cloth, the host placing him who he desires most to honour on his right side at the upper end of the room, i.e. opposite the door. At the lower end, the musicians and minstrels take their places, and all, without further delay, commence an attack on the viands. 
the consumption of food progresses rapidly with but little conversation for it is not usual in persia to linger over meals or to prolong them by talk which is better conducted while the mouth is not otherwise employed if the host wishes to pay special honour to a guest he picks out and places in his mouth some particularly delicate morsel in about a quarter of an hour from the commencement of the banquet most of the guests have finished and washed their hands by pouring water over them from a metal ewer into a plate of the same material brought round by the servants for that purpose they then rinse out their mouths roll down their sleeves again partake of a final pipe and unless they mean to stay for the night depart homewards either on foot or on horseback preceded by a servant bearing a lantern such is the usual course of a persian dinner party and the midday meal nahar to which guests are sometimes invited differs from it only in this that it is shorter and less boisterous although i have described the general features of such an entertainment in some detail i fear that i have failed to convey any idea of the charm which it really possesses this charm results partly from the lack of constraint and the freedom of the guests partly from the cordial welcome which a persian host so well knows how to give partly from the exhilarating influence of the wine and music which though so different from that to which we are accustomed produces in such as are susceptible to its influence an indescribable sense of subdued ecstasy but more than all from the vigour variety and brilliancy of the conversation there is no doubt that satiety produces somnolence and apathy as is so often seen at english dinner parties hence the persians wisely defer the meal till the very end of the evening when sleep is to be sought during the earlier stages of the entertainment their minds are stimulated by wine music and mirth without being dulled by the heaviness resulting from repletion this no doubt is one reason why the conversation is as a rule so brilliant but beyond this the quick versatile subtle mind of the persian stored as it usually is with anecdotes historical literary and incidental and freed for the time being from the restraint which custom ordinarily imposes on it flashes forth on these occasions in coruscations of wit and humour interspersed with pungent criticism and philosophical reflections which display a wonderful insight hence it is that one rarely fails to enjoy thoroughly an evening spent at a persian banquet and that the five or six hours during which it lasts hardly ever hang heavily on one's hands the persians have only two full meals in the day nahar which one may call indifferently either breakfast or lunch since on the one hand it is the first meal of the day and on the other it is not taken till a little before noon and sham or supper which as i have already stated is eaten the last thing before retiring for the night besides these two meals tea is taken on rising in the morning and again in the afternoon the usual way in which a persian of the upper classes spends his day is then somewhat as follows he rises early often before sunrise which indeed he must do if devotionally inclined for the morning prayer and after drinking a glass or two of tea without milk of course and smoking a kalyan sets about the business of the day whatever it may be about noon or a little earlier he has his breakfast nahar which differs little from supper as regards its material after this especially if the season be summer he usually lies down and sleeps till about three p m from this time till sunset is the period for paying calls so he either goes out to visit a friend or else stays at home to receive visitors in either case tea and kalyans constitute a prominent feature in the afternoon's employment casual visitors do not as a rule remain long after sunset and on their departure unless an invitation to supper has been given or received the evening is quietly passed at home till the time for supper and bed arrives in the case of government employees as well as shopkeepers tradesmen and others whose hours of work are longer 
a considerable portion of the afternoon may have to be spent in business, but in any case this rarely lasts after 4 or 5 p.m. Calls may also be paid in the early morning, before the day's work commences. The true Persian life is, however, as I have before remarked, much better seen in the provinces than in the capital, where European influences have already wrought a great change in national customs. Further remarks on it will therefore find a fitter place in a subsequent chapter. End of section 11section twelve of a year amongst the persians by edward granville brown this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for further information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org a year amongst the persians by edward granville brown I must now return to my life in the Nawab's house, and the society which I there met. Amongst the visitors were a certain number of Afghans, who had formed the suite of Ayub Khan before his attempted escape, and who were now to be transferred to Rawalpindi in India, by way of Baghdad. The arrangements for their journey were entrusted mainly to my host, and for a time few days passed without his receiving visits from some of them. On these occasions I used often to remain in the room during the conversation, half of which, although it was conducted in Persian, was nearly unintelligible to me, for the Afghans speak in a manner and with an accent quite peculiar to themselves. These Afghans, who wore coloured turbans wound round a conical cap, after the Indian fashion, were troublesome and cantankerous fellows, seeming never to be satisfied, and always wanting something more, a larger allowance of money, more horses, or more sumptuous litters for the journey. As a rule, too, their expressions betokened cruelty and deceit, though some of them were fine-looking men, especially an old mullah called Qazi Abdus Salam, who had held an important position under the late Amir, Shir Ali. For the most part, however, the visitors were Persians, and of these a large proportion were natives of Shiraz, to whose eulogies of their beloved city, for all Shirazis are intensely patriotic, I used to listen with unwearying delight. They would praise the beautiful gardens, the far-famed stream of Ruknabad, the soft, sweet speech of the south, and the joyousness of the people. But when I exclaimed that Shiraz must be a very paradise, they would shake their heads sadly and say, The place indeed has no fault. Vali sahibi nadarad, but it has no master, thinking perhaps of the happy time when the virtuous and noble Karim Khan, the Zend, held his court there, and rejoiced in his palace, when he heard the sounds of merriment from the town, that his people should be free from care and sadness. One constant visitor was the Nawab's brother-in-law, Akka Muhammad Hassan Khan of the Qashqai tribe, which dwells in the neighbourhood of Shiraz. When he had ceased for a while the disquisitions on philosophy, which were his favourite theme, and had temporarily exhausted the praises of the master, as he called his teacher in the science, Mirza Abul Hassan Idilbe, he too used to revert to the inexhaustible subject of the beauties of his native land. You must on no account postpone your visit to Shiraz later than the Nauruz, the Persian New Year's Day, which corresponds with the vernal equinox, he would say, for then indeed there is no place on the face of the earth so beautiful. You know what the Shaykh, i.e. Sa'di, says, Khasha tafaruj Nauruz, khasse dar Shiraz, ki bar dilim marde musafir, as Watanash. Pleasant is the New Year's outing, especially in Shiraz, which turns aside the heart of the traveller from his native land. In the evening, when I was alone with the Nawab, or his brother Issa Khan, a colonel in the Persian army, or my old friends, his nephews, 
the talk would turn on religion, philosophy, or literature. Sometimes they would entertain me with anecdotes of celebrated men and accounts of curious superstitions and customs. Sometimes the Nawab would play on the sitar on which he was a proficient, while sometimes they would explain to me the intricacies of Mohammedan prayers and ablutions, and the points wherein the Shiites differ from the Sunnis, both in practice and belief. They did not fail on these occasions to point out the meaning which underlies many of the ordinances of Islam. The fast of Ramadan, they said, appears to you a most grievous burden for a prophet and legislator to lay upon his followers, but in truth in this is its very value, for, as it is enjoined on all alike, the rich are made to realise what hunger and thirst, which they would otherwise never experience, really are. Thus they are enabled to understand the condition of those who are always exposed to these trials, and brought to sympathise with them and to strive to ameliorate their lot more than they would otherwise do. So too with our prayers and the ablutions by which they must be preceded. It is true that there is no special virtue in praying and washing oneself five times a day, but it is evident that one who is enjoined to remember his Creator thus often, and to keep his body pure and clean, will always have these objects in view, and will never through negligence fall into forgetfulness of God and disregard of personal cleanliness. Moreover, we are forbidden to pray in any place which has been forcibly taken from its owner, or in which he does not give us permission to perform our devotions. This continually serves to remind us to be just and courteous in all our dealings, that our prayers may be acceptable to God. Sometimes a conversation was of a lighter character, and turned on the sayings of witty and learned men, their ready replies and pungent sarcasms. Of these anecdotes I will give a few specimens. Shaykh Sa'di was unrivalled in ready wit and quickness of repartee, yet even he once met his match. It happened in this wise. The young prince of Shiraz, who was remarkable for his beauty, went one day, accompanied by his retinue, to visit a mosque which was being built by his orders, and which is still standing. As he passed by a workman who was digging, a piece of mud flew up from the spade and touched his cheek. Sa'adi, who was walking near him, saw this, and immediately exclaimed, making use of a quotation from the Qur'an, Ya laitani kuntu turaba. Oh, would that I were earth! The prince, hearing Sa'di speak, but failing to catch his remark, asked, What does the Shaykh say? Another learned man who was present instantly interposed, May I be thy sacrifice? It was naught but a quotation from the holy book. Faqal al kafiru, Ya laitani kuntu turaba. And the infidel said, Oh, would that I were earth! Sa'di had made use of the quotation, forgetting for the moment in whose mouth the words were placed. His rival had not forgotten, and while appearing merely to justify Sa'di, succeeded in applying to him the opprobrious term of kafir, infidel. Obeid Zakani was another celebrated poet, chiefly noted for the scathing satires which flowed from his pen. Even when he was on his deathbed, his grim humour did not desert him. Summoning successively to his side his two sons and his daughter, he informed them, with every precaution to ensure secrecy, that he had left behind for them a treasure which they must seek for on a particular hour of a certain day after his death and burial, in a place which he indicated. Be sure, he added in conclusion, that you go thither at that hour, and at no other, and above all keep what I have said secret from my other children. Shortly after this the poet breathed his last, and when his body had been consigned to the grave, and the day appointed for the search had come, each of his three children repaired secretly to the spot indicated. Great was the surprise of each to find that the others were also present, and evidently bent on the same quest. Explanations of a not very satisfactory character ensued, and they then proceeded to dig for the treasure. 
Sure enough, they soon came on a large parcel, which they eagerly extracted from its place of concealment and began to unfold. On removing the outer covering, they found a layer of straw, evidently designed to protect the valuable and perhaps fragile contents. Inside this was another smaller box, on opening which a quantity of cotton wool appeared. An eager examination of this brought to light nothing but a small slip of paper on which something was written. Disappointed in their search, but still hoping that this document might prove of value, either by guiding them to the real treasure or in some other way, they hastily bore it to the light and read these words. Khudai danad, uman dana, mutu ham dani, ki yak fulus na darad, obey di zakani. God knows, and I know, and thou too knowest, that obe di zakani does not possess a single copper. Whether the children were able to appreciate this final display of humour on the part of their father is not narrated by the historian. Satire, though, for obvious reasons, cultivated to a much smaller extent than panegyric, did not by any means cease with the death of Obed Zakani, which occurred about the year A.D. 1370. The following, composed on the incapable and crotchety Haji Mirza Akhasi, Prime Minister of the late King Muhammad Shah, may serve as an example. Nagzash dar mulki shah haji dirami, kardhachi kanat utup harbi shukami, namazra idastra az an kanat nani, na khaye dushmanra az an tup ghani. The haji did not leave a single dirham in the domains of the king. Everything small or great he expended on kanats and guns. Kanats which convey no water to the fields of his friends, and guns which inflicted no injury on his enemy. The wasteful and useless extravagance of Haji Mirza Akasi, here held up to ridicule, was unfortunately far from being his greatest or most pernicious error. It was he who ceded to the Russians the sole right of navigating the Caspian Sea. Remarking with a chuckle at his own wit, Ma murgabi nistin, ki abishar lazim daste bashim. We are not waterfowl that we should stand in need of salt water. To which he presently added the following sage reflection. Parayi mushti abishur nami sharad kamishirini dustru talch namud. It wouldn't do to embitter the sweet palate of a friend for the sake of a handful of salt water. Readiness is a sine qua non in a Persian poet. He must be able to improvise at a moment's notice. One day, Fat Ali Shah was riding through the bazaars, surrounded by his courtiers, when he happened to notice amongst the apprentices in a coppersmith's shop a very beautiful boy, whose fair face was begrimed with coal dust. Begirdi arizi miskar nishaste gardi zogal. Around the cheeks of the coppersmith has settled the dust of the coal, said the king, improvising a hemistitch. Now, Sir Laureate, turning to his court poet, cap me that if you can. Sadai mis bifalak mi ravad ki mach giriftast. The clang of the copper goes up to heaven because the moon is eclipsed, rejoined the Laureate, without a moment's hesitation. To appreciate the appositeness of this verse, the reader must know that a beautiful face is constantly compared by the Persians to the moon, and that when there is an eclipse of the moon, it is customary in Persia to beat copper vessels to frighten away the dragon, which is vulgarly supposed to have eaten it. This rhetorical figure called Husni Ta'lil, whereby an observed effect is explained by a fanciful cause, is a great favourite with the Persian poets. Here is another instance of a more exaggerated type in a verse addressed by the poet Rasikh to his sweetheart. Husni mahra ba ta sanjitam bimizani kiyas palema bar falakshud utamandi barzamin. 
I weighed thy beauty against that of the moon in the balance of my judgment. The scale containing the moon flew up to heaven, and thou wert left on the earth. Could a neater compliment, or one more exaggerated, be imagined? It is the fashion of some scholars to talk as if literary and poetical talent were a thing of the past in Persia. No mistake could possibly be greater. Everyone is aware of that form of hallucination, whereby the past is glorified at the expense of the present, that illusion which is typified both in the case of individuals and nations, in the phrase, the happy days of childhood. Men not only forget the defects and disagreeables of the past, and remember only its glories, but they are very apt to weigh several centuries of the past against a few decades of the present. Where, the enthusiastic admirer of older Persian literature exclaims, are the Rudagis, the Firdauses, the Nizamis, the Omakhayams, the Anvaris, the Sa'adis, the Hafizis, the Jamis, of the glorious past? Where are such mighty singers to be found now? Leaving aside the fact that these immortal bards ranged over a period of five centuries, and that when, at certain periods, the munificent patronage of some prince collected together a number of contemporary poets, as at the so-called Round Table of Sultan Mahmud of Ghazni, posterity, perhaps wisely, often neglected to preserve the works of more than one or two of them, it may confidently be asserted that the present century has produced a group of most distinguished poets whose works will undoubtedly, when duly transfigured by the touch of antiquity, go to make up portions and parcels of the glorious past. Of modern Persian poets, the greatest is perhaps Ka'ani, who died about A.D. 1854. In panegyric and satire alike he is unrivalled, and he has a wealth of metaphor, a flow of language, and a sweetness of utterance scarcely to be found in any other poet. Although he lacks the mystic sublimity of Jami, the divine despair of Omar Khayyam, and the majestic grandeur of Fidowsi, he manifests at times a humour rarely met with in the older poets. One poem of his, describing a dialogue between an old man and a child, both of whom stammer, is very humorous. The child, on being first addressed by the old man, thinks that his manner of speech is being imitated and ridiculed, and is very angry. But on being assured, and finally convinced, that his interlocutor is really afflicted in the same way, he is appeased, and concludes with the words, ma ma man ham gu Gungam ma ma mislit tu 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 ham gu gu gungi ma ma mislim ma ma man. I also am a stammerer like unto thee. Thou also art a stammerer like unto me. The best poets at present living are Mirza Yi Farhang and Mirza Yi Yezdani, both of whom I met at Shiraz. They are the only two surviving brothers of Mirza Davari, also a poet of great merit. Their father, whose nom de guerre was Wissal, was widely famed for his poetic talent, and their sons already manifest unmistakable signs of genius. The conversation of my kind friends, who desired that I might become acquainted with everything calculated to illustrate Persian life, did not, however, confine itself only to the masterpieces of national poetry. Nursery rhymes and schoolboy doggerel also came in for a share of attention. As a specimen of these, I may quote the following. Tabat yada abila, achun bikesh tavila. Kalash bidi bimire, javash bidi namire, which may be paraphrased thus: Abu Lahab's pride shall fall. Put the master in the stall. He will die if chaff you give. Give him oats, and he will live. I have already alluded to practical jokes and described one perpetrated by a wit of the fourteenth century. Let me add another of the present day, which, if rougher than that of Obadi Zakani, was at least intended to convey a salutary lesson to the person on whom it was practised. 
Amongst the dependents of the governor of a certain town was a man who was possessed by the desire to discover some means of rendering himself invisible. At length he had the good fortune, as he thought, to meet with a dervish who agreed, for a certain sum of money, to supply him with some pills which would produce the desired effect. Filled with delight at the success which appeared at length to have crowned his efforts, the would-be dabbler in the occult sciences did not fail to boast openly before his comrades, and even before the governor, that on a certain day he would visit them unseen, and prove the efficacy of his new acquisition. On the appointed day, having taken one or two of the magical pills, he accordingly came to the governor's palace, filled with delightful anticipations of triumph on his own part, and envious astonishment on the part of his friends. Now the governor was determined, if possible, to cure him of his taste for the black art, and had therefore given orders to the sentries, servants, and other attendants, as well as to his own associates, that when the would-be magician arrived, they were all to behave as though they were unable to see him. Accordingly, when he reached the gate of the palace, he was delighted to observe that the sentries omitted to give him the customary salute. Proceeding further, he became more and more certain that the dervish's pills had produced the promised effect. No one looked at him, no one saluted him, no one showed any consciousness of his presence. At length he entered the room where the governor was sitting with his associates. Finding that these two appeared insensible to his presence, he determined to give them a proof that he had really been amongst them in invisible form, a fact which they might otherwise refuse to credit. A kalyan or water-pipe was standing in the middle of the room, the charcoal in it still glowing. The pseudo-magician applied his lips to the mouthpiece and began to smoke. Those present at once broke out into expressions of astonishment. Wonderful, they exclaimed. Look at that kalyan. Though no one is near it, it is just as if someone were smoking it. Nay, one can even hear the gurgle of the water in the bowl. Enchanted with the sensation he had caused, the invisible one became bolder. Some lighted candles were in the room. One of these he blew out. Again exclamations of surprise arose from the company. Marvellous, they cried. There is no wind, yet suddenly that candle has been blown out. What can possibly be the meaning of this? The candle was again lighted, and again promptly blown out. In the midst of fresh expressions of surprise, the governor suddenly exclaimed, I have it! I know what has happened! So-and-so has no doubt eaten one of his magical pills, and is even now present amongst us, though we cannot see him. Well, we will see if he is intangible as well as invisible. Ho there, bacha ha! Bring the sticks, quick! Lay about you in all directions. Perhaps you will be able to teach our invisible friend better manners. The Farashis hastened to rain down a shower of blows on the unfortunate intruder, who cried out loudly for mercy. "'But where are you?' demanded the governor. "'Cease to be invisible, and show yourself that we may see you.' "'Oh, master!' cried the poor crestfallen magician. "'If I be really invisible, how happens it that all the blows of the Farashis reach me with such effect?' I begin to think that I have been deceived by that rascally dervish, and that I am not invisible at all. On this, amidst the mirth of all present, the sufferer was allowed to depart, with a recommendation that in future he should avoid the occult sciences, an injunction which one may reasonably hope he did not soon forget. End of section 12「Section 13 of A Year Amongst the Persians」by Edward Granville Brown. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For further information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Year Amongst the Persians by Edward Granville Brown. Chapter 6 Mysticism, Metaphysic, and magic. Gufta goye kufru din, achir bi yak jami kashad, khwab yak khwabast, ama mukhtalif ta'abir ha. 
free thought and faith, the upshots one, they wrangle o'er a name. Interpretations differ, but the dream is still the same. Sa'ib. Hichkazuk da'i az kari jihan, baz nakard. Har ki amad girihi chand barin tar fuzud. No one yet hath unravelled a knot from the skein of the universe, and each who came and essayed the same, but made the tangle worse. The most striking feature of the Persians as a nation is their passion for metaphysical speculation. This passion, so far from being confined to the learned classes, permeates all ranks and manifests itself in the shopkeeper and the muleteer, as well as in the scholar and the man of letters. Not to give some account of this aspect of Persian life would, then, be a grave omission, calculated to prevent the reader from obtaining a just impression of the national character. That dogmatic theology is unfavourable to speculation is obvious, and, as few theological systems are more dogmatic and uncompromising than that of Islam, it might be expected that Persia, being one of the strongholds of the Mohammedan faith, would afford at best a sterile soil for the growth of other systems. Such, however, is far from being the case. Persia is, and always has been, a very hotbed of systems, from the time of Manis and Mazdak in the old Sasanian days, down to the present age, which has brought into being the Barbies and the Shaykhis. When, in the seventh century, the warlike followers of the Arabian prophet swept across Iran, overwhelming, in their tumultuous onslaught, an ancient dynasty and a venerable religion, a change apparently almost unparalleled in history was in the course of a few years brought over the land where for centuries the ancient hymns of the Avesta had been chanted and the sacred fire had burnt, the cry of the Mu'ezin, summoning the faithful to prayer, rang out from minarets reared on the ruins of the temples of Ahura Mazda. The priests of Zoroaster fell by the sword, the ancient books perished in the flames, and soon none were left to represent a once mighty faith but a handful of exiles flying towards the shores of India, and a despised and persecuted remnant in solitary Yezd and remote Kirman. Truly it seemed that a whole nation had been transformed, and that henceforth the Aryan Persian must not only bear the yoke of the Semitic lizard-eater, whom he had formerly so despised, but must further adopt his creed, and almost, indeed, his language. Yet, after all, the change was but skin-deep, and soon a host of heterodox sects born on Persian soil, Shiites, Sufis, Ismailis, philosophers, arose to vindicate the claim of Aryan thought to be free, and to transform the religion forced on the nation by Arab steel into something which, though still wearing a semblance of Islam, had a significance widely different from that which one may fairly suppose was intended by the Arabian prophet. There is indeed another view possible, that of M. Gobineau, whose deep insight into Persian character entitles his opinion to careful consideration, videti, that from the very beginning there were latent in the Mohammedan religion the germs of the most thoroughgoing pantheism, and that Muhammad himself did but revive and formulate somewhat differently the ancient beliefs of Mesopotamia. Whether this be true or not, and the point is one which, in my opinion, cannot be regarded as altogether settled until the history of Sufism amongst those of Arab race shall have been more carefully studied, there is no doubt that certain passages in the Qur'an are susceptible to a certain degree of mystical interpretation. Take, for instance, the 17th verse of the 8th chapter, where God reminds Muhammad that the victory of Bedr was only in appearance won by the valour of the Muslims. Falam taktuluhum wa lakin allaha katalahun wa ma rameta id rameta wa lakin allaha rama and thou didst not slay them, but God slew them, and thou didst not shoot when thou didst shoot, 
but God shot. Although there is no need to explain this otherwise than as an assurance that God supported the faithful in their battles, either by natural or, as the commentators assert, by supernatural means, and although it lends itself far less readily than many texts in the New and even in the Old Testament to mystical interpretation, it nevertheless serves the Persian Sufis as a foundation stone for their pantheistic doctrines. The Prophet, they say, did not kill when men fell by his hand. He did not throw when he cast the handful of stones which brought confusion into the ranks of the heathen. He was in both cases but a mirror wherein was manifested the might of God. God alone was the real agent, as he is in all the actions which we, in our spiritual blindness, attribute to men. God alone is, and we are but the waves which stir for a moment on the surface of the ocean of being, even as it runs in the tradition, God was, and there was naught but he, and it is now even as it was then. Shall we say that God's creation is coexistent with him? Then we are Manichaeans and dualists, nay polytheists, for we associate the creature with the creator. Can we say that the sum of being was increased at the time when the phenomenal world first appeared? Assuredly not, for that would be to regard the being of God as a thing finite and conditioned, because capable of enlargement and expansion. What then can we say, except that even as God, who alone is endowed with real existence, was in the beginning and will be in the end, if indeed one may speak of beginning and end, where eternity is concerned, and where time, the element of this illusory dream which we call life, has no place, alone in his infinite splendour, so also, even now, he alone is, and all else is but as a vision which disturbs the night, a cloud which dims the sun, or a ripple on the bosom of the ocean. In such wise does the Sufi of Persia read the Qur'an and expound its doctrine. Those who are familiar with the different developments of mysticism will not need to be reminded that there is hardly any soil, be it ever so barren, where it will not strike root. Hardly any creed, however stern, however formal, round which it will not twine itself. It is indeed the eternal cry of the human soul for rest, the insatiable longing of a being wherein infinite ideals are fettered and cramped by a miserable actuality, and so long as man is less than an angel and more than a beast, this cry will not for a moment fail to make itself heard. Wonderfully uniform, too, is its tenor. In all ages, in all countries, in all creeds, whether it come from the Brahmin sage, the Greek philosopher, the Persian poet, or the Christian quietist, it is in essence an enunciation more or less clear, more or less eloquent, of the aspiration of the soul to cease altogether from self and to be at one with God. As such it must awaken in all who are sensible of this need an echo of sympathy, and therefore I feel that no apology is required for adding a few words more on the ideas which underlie all that is finest and most beautiful in Persian poetry and Persian thought. To the metaphysical conception of God as pure being, and the ethical conception of God as the eternally holy, the Sufi superadds another conception, which may be regarded as the keynote of all mysticism. To him, above all else, God is the eternally beautiful, Janani Hakiki, the true beloved. Before time was, he existed in his infinite purity, unrevealed and unmanifest. Why was this state changed? Why was the troubled phantasm of the contingent world evoked from the silent depths of the non-existent? Let me answer in the words of Jamit, who, perhaps of all the mystic poets of Persia, best knew how to combine depth of thought with sweetness and clearness of utterance. Poor as is my rendering of his sublime song, it may still suffice to give some idea of the original. The passage is from his Yusuf ur Zulaikha, 
and runs as follows. In solitude, where being signless dwelt, and all the universe still dormant lay, concealed in selflessness, one being was exempt from I or thouness, and apart from all duality, beauty supreme, unmanifest except unto itself, by its own light, yet fraught with power to charm the souls of all, concealed in the unseen, an essence pure, unstained by aught of ill, no mirror to reflect its loveliness, nor comb to touch its locks, the morning breeze ne'er stirred its tresses, no collyrium lent lustre to its eyes, no rosy cheeks o'ershadowed by dark curls like hyacinth, nor peach-like down were there, no dusky mole adorned its face, no eye had yet beheld its image, to itself it sang of love in wordless measures, by itself it cast the dye of love. But beauty cannot brook concealment and the veil, nor patient rest unseen and unadmired, twill burst all bonds, and from its prison casement to the world reveal itself, See where the tulip grows in upland meadows, how in balmy spring it decks itself, and how amidst its thorns the wild rose rends its garment, and reveals its loveliness. Thou too, when some rare thought or beauteous image, or deep mystery flashes across thy soul, canst not endure to let it pass, but holdst it that perchance in speech or writing thou mayest send it forth to charm the world. Wherever beauty dwells, such is its nature and its heritage, from everlasting beauty which emerged from realms of purity to shine upon the worlds, and all the souls which dwell therein. One gleam fell from it on the universe and on the angels, and this single ray dazzled the angels till their senses whirled like the revolving sky. In diverse forms each mirror showed it forth, and everywhere its praise was chanted in new harmonies. Each speck of matter did he constitute a mirror, causing each one to reflect the beauty of his visage. From the rose flashed forth his beauty, and the nightingale, beholding it, loved madly. From that light the candle drew the lustre which beguiles the moth to immolation. On the sun his beauty shone, and straightway from the wave the lotus reared its head. Each shining lock of Lila's hair attracted Majnun's heart, because some ray divine reflected shone in her fair face. Twas he to Shirin's lips who lent that sweetness which had power to steal the heart from Parviz and from Ferhad life. His beauty everywhere doth show itself, and through the forms of earthly beauties shines obscured as through a veil. He did reveal his face through Joseph's coat, and so destroyed Zuleicha's peace. Where'er thou seest a veil, beneath that veil he hides. Whatever heart doth yield to love, he charms it. In his love the heart hath life, longing for him the soul hath victory. That heart which seems to love the fair ones of this world, loves him alone. Beware, say not. He is all beautiful, and we his lovers, thou art but the glass, and he the face, confronting it, which casts its image on the mirror. He alone is manifest, and thou in truth art hid. Pure love, like beauty, coming but from him, reveals itself in thee. If steadfastly thou canst regard, thou wilt at length perceive he is the mirror also, he alike, the treasure and the casket, I and thou, have here no place, and are but fantasies, vain and unreal. Silence, for this tale is endless, and no eloquence hath power to speak of him. Tis best for us to love, and suffer silently, being as naught. But is this the sum of the Sufi's philosophy? Is he to rest content with earthly love, because he knows that the lover's homage is in truth rendered, not to the shrine at which he offers his devotion, 
but to the divine glory, the Shekinah, which inhabits and irradiates it? Not so. Let us listen once more to the utterance of Jami. Be thou the thrall of love, make this thine object, for this one thing seemeth to wise men worthy. Be thou love's thrall, that thou mayst win thy freedom, bear on thy breast its brand, that thou mayst blithe be. Love's wine will warm thee, and will steal thy senses. All else is soulless stupor and self-seeking. Remembrances of love refresh the lover whose voice when lording love e'er waxeth loudest. But he that drained a draught from this deep goblet, in the wide worlds not one would wot of Majnoon. Thousands of wise and well-learned men have wended through life who since for love they had no liking, have left nor name nor note nor sign nor story, nor tale for future time nor fame for fortune. Sweet songsters midst the birds are found in plenty, but when love's law is taught by the love-learned, of moth and nightingale they most make mention. Though in this world a hundred tasks thou tryest, tis love alone which from thyself will save thee, even from the earthly love thy face avert not, since to the real it may serve to raise thee. Ere ABC are rightly apprehended, how canst thou con the pages of thy Qur'an? A sage, so heard I, unto whom a student, came craving counsel on the course before him, said, If thy steps be strangers to love's pathways, depart, learn love, and then return before me. For shouldst thou fear to drink wine from form's flagon, thou canst not drain the draught of the ideal. But yet beware, be not by form belated. Strive rather with all speed the bridge to traverse. If to the bourn thou fain wouldst bear thy baggage, upon the bridge let not thy footsteps linger. The renunciation of self is the great lesson to be learnt, and its first steps may be learnt from a merely human love. But what is called love is often selfish, rarely absolutely unselfish. The test of unselfish love is this, that we should be ready and willing to sacrifice our own desires, happiness, even life itself, to render the beloved happy, even though we know that our sacrifice will never be understood or appreciated, and that we shall therefore not be rewarded for it by an increase of love or gratitude. Such is the true love which leads us up to God. We love our fellow creatures because there is in them something of the divine, some dim reflection of the true beloved, reminding our souls of their origin, home and destination. From the love of the reflection we pass to the love of the light which casts it, and, loving the light, we at length become one with it, losing the false self and gaining the true, therein attaining at length to happiness and rest, and becoming one with all that we have loved, the essence of that which constitutes the beauty alike of a noble action, a beautiful thought, or a lovely face. Such, in outline, is the Sufi philosophy. Beautiful as it is, and worthy as it is of deeper study, I have said as much about it as my space allows, and must pass on to speak of other matters. Mysticism is in its nature somewhat vague and difficult to formulate, varying in character, between an emotional philosophy and a devotional religion. On one side of it stands metaphysic, and on the other theology. Of Mohammedan theology I do not propose to speak, save incidentally, as occasion arises. Neither is this the place to treat systematically of the various schools of philosophy which have sprung up in Persia. Of the earlier ones, indeed, one may say generally that they are adaptations of either Aristotle or Plato, and that they may most fitly be described as the scholasticism of Islam. Of two of the later philosophers, however, Mullah Sadra of Shiraz and Haji Mullah Hadi of Sabzawar, I shall say a few words, inasmuch as they mark a new development in Persian thought, 
while at the same time they are less known in Europe than the Avicennas, the Ghazalis, and the Farabis of earlier days. Mullah Sadruddin Muhammad ibn Ibrahim ibn Yahya, commonly known as Mullah Sadra, flourished in the latter half of the 17th century. He was the son of a rich merchant of Shiraz, who had grown old without being blessed with a son. Being very desirous of leaving an heir to inherit his wealth, he made a vow that if God would grant him this wish, he would give the sum of one tuman, about six shillings, a day to the poor for the rest of his life. Soon afterwards Mullah Sadra was born, and the father faithfully accomplished his vow till his death. When this occurred, Mullah Sadra, who had already manifested an unusual aptitude for learning and a special taste for philosophy, decided, after consulting with his mother, to bestow the greater portion of the wealth which he had inherited on the poor and to go to Isfahan to prosecute his studies. It was the time when the Safavi kings ruled over Persia with their capital at Isfahan, and the colleges of that city were famed throughout the east. Mullah Sadra inquired on his arrival there who were the most celebrated teachers of philosophy, and was informed that they were three in number, Mir Abul Qasim Fandaraski, Mir Muhammad Bakir, better known as Mir Damad, and Shaykh Behauddin Amili. He was first presented himself before Mir Damad, and asked for advice as to his studies. The latter replied, If you want inward meaning only, go to Mir Fandaraski. If you want mere outward form, go to Sheikh Beha. But if you desire to combine both, then come to me. Mullah Sadra accordingly attended the lectures of Mir Damad regularly, but did not fail to profit as far as possible by the teaching of the other professors. At length it happened that Mir Damad desired to undertake the pilgrimage to Mecca. He therefore bade each of his pupils compose, during his absence, a treatise on some branch of philosophy, which should be submitted to him on his return, in order that he might judge of the progress they had made. Acting on his injunction, Mullah Sadra wrote his first great work, the Shawahid e Rububiye, Evidences of Divinity, which he presented to his teacher on his return from the pilgrimage. Some time afterwards, when Mullah Sadra was walking beside Mir Damad, the latter said to him, Sadra Jan, kitabi mera az mayan burdi. Oh, my dear Sadra, thou hast taken my work out of the midst, meaning that he had superseded it by the work which he had just composed. This generous recognition of his merit by his teacher was the beginning of a wide celebrity which has gone on increasing till this day. Yet this celebrity brought him into some danger from the fanatical mullahs who did not fail to detect in his works the savour of heterodoxy. It was during his residence at Qum especially that his life was jeopardised by the indignation of these zealots, but on many occasions he was subjected to annoyances and persecutions. He lived at a time when the clerical power was paramount and philosophy in disrepute. Had he lived later, he might have been the recipient of favours from the great and have enjoyed tranquillity and perhaps even opulence. As it was, his was the glory of once more bringing back philosophy to the land whence it had been almost banished. Mullah Sadra gained numerous disciples, some of whom, such as Mullah Muhsin Ifais, attained to great fame, and left behind him a multitude of books, mostly in Arabic, of which the Shawahidi Rububiyya, already mentioned, and a more systematic and voluminous work called the Asfari Araba'a, four treatises, enjoy the greatest reputation. The three points claimed as original in Mullah Sadra's teaching are as follows. 1. His axiom Basit ul hakikat kulul ashya walaisa bishay minha. The element of real being is all things, yet is none of them. 2. 
his doctrine that the cognition of any object only becomes possible by the identification of the knower with the known. 3. His assertion that the imagination is independent of the physical organism and belongs in its nature to the world of the soul, hence that not only in young children but even in animals it persists as a spiritual entity after death. In this point he differed from his predecessors, who held that it was only with the development of the rational soul that immortality became possible. I must now pass on to Haji Mullah Hadi of Sabzawar, the greatest Persian philosopher of the 19th century. He was the son of Haji Mahdi, and was born in the year Anohejirai 1212, A.D. 1797 to 8. He began his studies when only seven years old, under the tuition of Haji Mullah Hussain of Sabzawar, and at the early age of twelve composed a small treatise. Anxious to pursue his studies in theology and jurisprudence, he visited Mashhad in company with his teacher, and remained there for five years, living in the most frugal manner, not from necessity, for he was far from poor, but from choice and continuing his studies with unremitting ardour. When, in his seventeenth year, he heard of the fame of Mullah Ali Nuri, who was then teaching in Isfahan, he was very anxious to proceed thither at once, but was for several years prevented from so doing by the opposition of his friends. Ultimately, however, he was enabled to gratify his wishes, and to take up his residence at Isfahan, where he diligently attended the lectures of Mullah Ali Nuri. He appears, however, to have received more advantage from the help of one of Mullah Ali's pupils, named Mullah Ismail, the one-eyed. In Isfahan, he remained for seven years, devoting himself with such avidity to the study of philosophy that he rarely slept for much more than four hours out of the twenty-four. To combat slothfulness, he was in the habit of reposing on a cloak spread on the bare brick floor of the little room which he occupied in the college, with nothing but a stone for his pillow. The simplicity, and indeed austerity, of his life was far from being his chief or only merit. Being possessed of private means greatly in excess of what his simple requirements demanded, he used to take pains to discover which of the students stood most in need of pecuniary help, and would then secretly place sums of money varying from one to five or even ten to mons, six shillings to three pounds, in their rooms during their absence, without leaving any clue which could lead to the identification of the donor. In this manner he is said to have expended no less than one hundred thousand tomans, about thirty thousand pounds, while he was in Isfahan, leaving himself only so much as he deemed necessary for his own maintenance. Having completed his studies at Isfahan, he made a pilgrimage to Mecca, whence he returned by way of Kirman. There he remained for a while and married a wife, whom he took back to his native town of Sabzawar. Soon after his return he paid another visit to Mashhad, and remained there ten months, giving lectures on philosophy, but soon returned thence to settle in Sabzawar, whither his increasing renown began to draw students from all parts of Persia. During the day he used to give two lectures, each of two hours' duration, on metaphysics, taking as his text either some of the writings of Mullah Sadra or his own notes. The rest of his time was spent for the most part in study and devotion. In person he was tall of stature, thin and of slender frame, his complexion was dark, his face pleasing to look upon, his speech eloquent and flowing, his manner gentle, unobtrusive, and even humble. His abstemiousness was such that he would never eat more than the limited number of mouthfuls which he deemed necessary, neither would he accept the invitations which he often received from the great. He was always ready to help the widow, the orphan, and the stranger, and ever exemplified in his demeanour the apothegm of Bu Alicina, Avicenna, Adrifu Hashun, Bashun, Basamun, 
wa kaifa la wa huwa farhanu bil haki wa bikuli shai. The Gnostic is gentle, courteous, smiling, and how should it be otherwise, since he rejoices in God and in all things? The complete course of instruction in philosophy which he gave lasted seven years, at the end of which period those students who had followed it diligently were replaced by others. Many, of course, were unable to complete their education, but on the whole nearly a thousand satisfactorily accomplished it. Till within three days of his death, Haji Mullah Hadi never disappointed his eager audience of a single lecture, and he was eagerly engaged in teaching when struck down by the disease which terminated his life. The eager throng of students surrounded him in a circle while he was speaking of the essence and attributes of God, when suddenly he was overcome by faintness, and laid down the book which he held in his hand, saying, I have so often repeated the word hu, hu, he, i.e. God, in which sense only the Arabic pronoun is used by Persians, that it has become fixed in my head, and my head, following my tongue, seems to keep crying hu, hu. Having uttered these words, he laid down his head and fainted, and two days later he peacefully passed away in the year Anno Hegirai 1295. Anno Domini, 1878. Sincerely mourned by those to whom he had been endeared alike by his learning and his benevolence. He was buried, according to instructions contained in his will, outside the Mashhad gate of Sabzawar. A handsome tomb has been raised over his grave by orders of the Grand Vizier, and the spot is regarded as one of great sanctity, and is visited by numerous pilgrims. So died, after a noble and useful life, the sage of Sabzawar. His major works amount to about seventeen in number, including an elementary treatise on philosophy, written in Persian, in an easy style, at the request of the Shah, and entitled Asrar al-Hikam, Secrets of Philosophy. He was a poet as well as a metaphysician, and has left behind him a divan in Persian, as well as two long and highly esteemed versified treatises in Arabic, one on logic, the other on metaphysic. He had three sons, of whom the eldest, who was also by far the most capable, survived him only two years. The other two are still, 1893, living at Sabzawar, and one at least of them still teaches in the college on which his father's talents shed so great a lustre. The pupils of the sage of Sabzawar entertained for him an unbounded love and veneration. They even believe him to have been endowed with the power of working miracles, keramat, though he himself never allowed this statement to be made before him. My teacher, Mirza Asad Ullah, informed me, however, that the following was a well-known fact. Haji Mullah Hadi's son-in-law had a daughter who had been paralysed for years. One night, a year after the Hadji's death, she saw him in a dream, and he said to her, Arise, my daughter, and walk. The excessive joy which she experienced at seeing him and hearing these words caused her to wake up. She immediately roused her sister, who was sleeping beside her, and told her what she had dreamt. The latter said, you had better get up and try if you can walk. Perhaps there is more in the dream than mere fancy. After a little persuasion, the girl got up and found, to her delight, that she really was able to walk quite well. Next day she went to the Haji's tomb to return thanks, accompanied by a great crowd of people, to whom her former affliction was as well known as her present recovery was obvious. Another event, less marvellous, however, than the above, was related to me as follows. When a detachment of the army was passing through Sabzawar, a soldier, who had been given a requisition for corn for the horses, drawn on a certain mullah, brought the document to Haji Mullah Hadi, and asked him in whose name it was drawn, as he himself was unable to read. 
the haji looked at it and knowing that the mullah who was therein commanded to supply the corn was in impoverished circumstances and could ill support the loss replied i must supply you with what you require go to the storehouse and take it accordingly the soldier carried off as much corn as he needed and gave it to the horses in the morning however on entering the stable the soldiers found that the corn was untouched inquiries were made whence it came and on its being discovered that it was the property of the haji it was returned to him this story soon gained currency and credence amongst the officers and men alike and added not a little to the haji's reputation notwithstanding that he himself continued to make light of it and even to deny it it may not be amiss to give some details as to the course of study which those who desired to attend the Hajj's lectures were expected to have already pursued, and the subjects in which they had to produce evidence of proficiency before they were received as his pupils. These preliminary studies were as follows. 1. Grammar, Rhetoric, etc. Ebedie, also called Preliminaries. Mukaddamat. Under this head is included a competent knowledge of Arabic and its grammar, with ability to read such works as Jamit's commentary, Suyuti, and the Mutawwal. 2. Logic. Mantic, as contained in such treatises as the Kubra, the Shamsiya, and the Shahi Matali. 3. Mathematics, including Euclid and astronomy, which is studied pari passu with logic. 4. Elements of jurisprudence, fiqh. 5. Scholastic theology, ilm kelam, as set forth in the following works. 1. The Hidayet of Maybudi, a concise but knotty compendium of the elements of this science in Arabic. 2. The Tajrid of Nasiruddin of Dus, with the commentary of Mullah Ali Kushji. 3. The Shawarik of Mullah Abdur Razak Lahiji, the son-in-law of Mullah Sadra. Those students who were able to show that they had acquired a satisfactory knowledge of these subjects were allowed to enrol themselves as the pupils of Haji Mullah Hadi and to commence their study of metaphysic proper, Hikmatillahi, as set forth in his works and in those of Mullah Sadra. End of section, th section 14 of A Year Amongst the Persians by Edward Granville Brown. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For further information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Year Amongst the Persians by Edward Granville Brown. Chapter 6 Mysticism, Metaphysic and Magic. Part 2. I trust that I have succeeded in making it sufficiently clear that the study of Persian philosophy is not a thing to be lightly undertaken, and that proficiency in it can only be the result of diligent application combined with good natural capacity. It is not a thing to play with in a dilettante manner, but is properly regarded by its votaries as the highest intellectual training and the crown and summit of all knowledge. It was not long ere I discovered this fact, and, as it was clearly impossible for me to go through a tenth part of the proper curriculum, while at the same time I was deeply desirous of becoming, in some measure at least, acquainted with the most recent developments of Persian thought, I was fain to request my teacher, Mirza Asadullah, to take compassion on my infirmities, and to instruct me, as far as possible, and in as simple a manner as possible, concerning the essential practical conclusions of the doctrines of which he was the exponent. This he kindly exerted himself to do, 
and though any attempt at a systematic enunciation of Haji Mullah Hadi's philosophy, even were I capable of undertaking it, would be out of place here, I think that it may not be uninteresting if I notice briefly some of its more remarkable features, not as derived from his writings, but as orally expounded to me with explanations and illustrations by his pupil and disciple. As in the Sufi doctrine, being is conceived of as one. Alvoyudo hakikatun vahidatun basitatun valahu maratibu mutafadila. Being is a single, simple reality, and it has degrees differing in excellence. Poetically, this idea is expressed in the following quatrain. Majmu'ai kaun rabi kanuni sabak. Kardim tasafu farakan ba'davarak, hakka kina khwanti munadidim daru juzdati hak, kusifati datiyai hak. Like a lesson book, the compendium of the universe, we turned over, leaf after leaf. In truth we read and saw therein naught save the essence of God and the essential attributes of God. The whole universe, then, is to be regarded as the unfolding manifestation or projection of God. It is the mirror wherein he sees himself, the arena wherein his various attributes display their nature. It is subsequent to him, not in sequence of time, for time is merely the medium which encloses the phenomenal world, and which is indeed dependent on this for its very existence, but in sequence of causation just as the light given off by a luminous body is subsequent to the luminosity of that body in causation, inasmuch as the latter is the source and origin of the former, and that whereon it depends and whereby it subsists, but not subsequent to it in time, because it is impossible to conceive of any time in the existence of an essentially luminous body antecedent to the emission of light therefrom. This amounts to saying that the universe is co-eternal with God, but not co-equal, because it is merely an emanation dependent on him, while he has no need of it. Just as the light proceeding from a luminous body becomes weaker and more diffuse as it recedes from its source, so the emanations of being become less real, or in other words more gross and material, as they become farther removed from their focus and origin. This gradual descent or recession from the primal being, which is called Kausin Nuzul, Arc of Descent, has in reality infinite grades, but a certain definite number, seven, is usually recognized. Man finds himself in the lowest of these grades, the material world, but of that world he is the highest development, for he contains in himself the potentiality of reascent by steps corresponding to those in the Ark of Descent, to God, his origin, and his home. To discover how this return may be effected, how the various stages of the Kaus Isu'ud, Ark of Ascent, may be traversed, is the object of philosophy. The soul of man is corporeal in origin, but spiritual in continuance. A nafso fil huduthi jismaniya, wa fil baqa itakunu ruhaniya, Born of matter, it is yet capable of a spiritual development which will lead it back to God, and enable it, during the span of a mortal life, to accomplish the ascent from matter to spirit, from the periphery to the centre. In the Ark of Ascent also are numerous grades, but here again, as in the Ark of Descent, seven are usually recognised. It may be well at this point to set down in tabular form these grades as they exist both in the macrocosm or arc of descent and in the microcosm or arc of ascent, which is man. 1. Arc of ascent, seven principles in man. Lata ifis sabba. 1. The most subtle principle, akha. 2. The subtle principle, khafa. 3. The secret. Sir. 4. The heart. Kalb. 5. The spirit. Ruh. 6. The soul. Nafs. 7. The nature. Tab. 2. Arc of descent. Series of emanations. 1. 
exploration of the world of divinity. Sayadat alam ilahut. 2. The world of divinity. Alam ilahut. 3. The world of the intelligences. Alam i jabarut. 4. The world of the angels. Alam i malakut. 5. The world of ideas. Alam i matna. 6. The world of form. Alam i surat. 7. The material world. Alam i tabi'at. I do not think that these first two should stand thus, for at most they only mark two different phases in the experience of the soul, an attaining into the world of divinity and a journeying therein. My impression is that they should be replaced thus. 1. The world of divinity, i.e. the divine essence, Ailami Lahut. 2. The world of the attributes, Ailami Rahut. This corresponds to the views given in the commentaries on the Fusus of Shaykh Muhyiddin ibn al-Arabi and other similar works, where the five planes, Hazrati Khams, which coincide with the first five grades given here, i.e. those which belong to the spiritual world, are discussed. I have not, however, considered myself justified in making any alteration in Mirza Asadullah's scheme. A few words of explanation are necessary concerning the above scheme. Each stage in either column corresponds with that which is placed opposite to it. Thus, for instance, the mere matter which in the earliest stage of man's development constitutes his totality corresponds to the material world to which it belongs. In the material world, the arc of descent has reached its lowest point. In man, the highest product of the material world, the ascent is begun. When the human embryo begins to take form, it rises to the world of soul, thus summing up in itself two grades of the arcs. It may never ascend higher than this point, for, of course, when the upward evolution of man is spoken of, it is not implied that this is effected by all, or even by the majority of men. These seven principles do not represent necessarily coexisting components or elements, but successive grades of development, at any one of which, after the first, the process of growth may be arrested. The race exists for its highest development, humanity for the production of the perfect man, in Sani Kamil, who, summing up as he does all the grades of ascent from matter, the lowest point of the series of emanations, to God, is described as the microcosm, the compendium of all the planes of existence, hazrat Jamit, or sometimes as the sixth plane, hazrat Sadisa, because he includes and summarizes all the five spiritual planes. It has been said that some men never rise beyond the second grade, the world of soul or form, these are such as occupy themselves entirely during their lives with sensual pursuits, eating, drinking, and the like. Previously to Mullah Sadra, it was generally held by philosophers that these perished entirely after death, inasmuch as they had not developed any real spiritual principle. Mullah Sadra, however, took great pains to prove that even in these cases where the rational soul, nafsi natika, had not been developed during life, there did exist a spiritual part which survived death and resisted disintegration. This spiritual part he called imaginations, khiala. Yet even in this low state of development, where no effort has been made to reach the plane of the reason, a man may lead an innocent and virtuous life. What will then be the condition after death of that portion of him which survives the body? It cannot re-enter the material world, for that would amount to metempsychosis, which, so far as I have been able to ascertain, is uncompromisingly denied by all Persian philosophers. Neither can it ascend higher in the spiritual scale, for the period during which progress was possible is past. Moreover, it derives no pleasure from spiritual or intellectual experiences, and would not be happy in one of the higher worlds, even could it attain thereto. It desires material surroundings, and yet cannot return to the material world. It therefore does what seems to it the next best thing. 
it creates for itself subjective pseudo-material surroundings, and in this dream dwelling it makes its eternal home. If it has acted rightly in the world according to its lights, it is happy, if wrongly, then miserable. The happiness or misery of its hereafter depends on its merit, but in either case it is purely subjective and absolutely stationary. There is for it neither advance nor return. It can neither ascend higher nor re-enter the material world, either by transmigration or resurrection, both of which the philosophers deny. What has been said above applies, with slight modifications, to all the other grades, at any rate the lower ones. If a man has, during his life in the world, attained to the grade of the spirit, the third grade in order of ascent, and acquired rational or intellectual faculties, he may still have used these well or ill. In either case he enters after death into the world of ideas, where he is happy or miserable according to his deserts. But, so far as I could learn, any one who has during his life developed any of the four highest principles passes after death into a condition of happiness and blessedness, since mere intellect without virtue will not enable him to pass beyond the third grade, or world of the spirit. According to the degree of development which he has reached, he enters the world of the angels, the world of the intelligences, or the world of divinity itself. From what has been said, it will be clear that a bodily resurrection and a material hereafter are both categorically denied by the philosophers. Nevertheless, states of subjective happiness or misery, practically constituting a heaven or hell, exist. These, as has been explained, are of different grades in both cases. Thus, there is a paradise of actions, Jalatul Af'al, where the soul is surrounded by an ideal world of beautiful forms, a paradise of attributes, Janatus Sifat, and a paradise of the essence, Janatus Zat, which is the highest of all, for there the soul enjoys the contemplation of the divine perfections, which hold it in an eternal rapture, and cause it to forget and cease to desire all those objects which constitute the pleasure of the denizens of the lower paradises. It is indeed unconscious of aught but God, and is annihilated or absorbed in him. The lower subjective worlds, where the less fully developed soul suffers or rejoices, are often spoken of collectively as the alam imithal, world of similitudes, or the alam i bazakh, world of the barrier or border world. The first term is applied to it because each of its denizens takes a form corresponding to his attributes. In this sense, Omar Khayyam has said, Ruzi ki jezai har sifat khwahad bud, kadri to be kadri ma'rifat khwahad bud, dar husni sifat hush ki dar uzi jeza, hashrit to be surati sifat khwahad bud. On that day when all qualities shall receive thy recompense, thy worth shall be in proportion to thy wisdom. Strive after good qualities, for in the day of recompense thy resurrection shall be in the form of the attribute. Thus a greedy, gluttonous man takes the form of a pig, and it is in this sense only that metempsychosis, tanasuch, is held by the Persian philosophers. On this point my teacher was perfectly clear and definite. It is not uncommon for Sufis to describe a man by the form with which they profess to identify him in the world of similitudes. Thus I have heard a Sufi say to his antagonist, I see you in the world of similitudes as an old toothless fox, desirous of preying upon others, but unable to do so. I once said to Mirza Asadullah, that if I rightly understood his views, hell was nothing else than an eternal nightmare, whereat he smiled and said that I had rightly apprehended his meaning. Although a soul cannot rise higher than that world to which it has assimilated itself during life, it may be delayed by lower affinities in the world of the barrier on its way thither. All bad habits, even when insufficient to present a permanent obstacle to spiritual progress, 
tend to cause such delay, and to retard the upward ascent of the soul. From this it will be seen that the denizens of the world of the barrier are of three classes, two of these being permanent, and abiding for ever in the state of subjective happiness or misery which they have merited, and the third consisting of souls temporarily delayed there to undergo a species of probation before passing to the worlds above. On one occasion I put the following question to Mirza Asadullah. Two persons, A and B, have been friends during their lifetime. The former has so lived as to merit happiness hereafter, the latter misery. Both die and enter the world of the barrier, there receiving forms appropriate to their attributes. The one, moreover, is happy, the other wretched. Will not A have cognizance of B's miserable condition, and will not this knowledge tend to mar his felicity? To this question my teacher replied as follows. A's world is altogether apart from B's, and the two are entirely out of contact. In A's world are present all things that he desires to have in such form as he pleases, for his world is the creation of his imaginative faculty, freed from the restraints of matter and the outward senses, and endowed with full power to see what it conceives. Therefore, if A desires the presence of B as he knew him formerly, B will be present with him in that form under which he was so known, and not in the repulsive form which he has now assumed. There is no more difficulty in this than in a person dreaming in ordinary sleep that he sees one of his friends in a state of happiness, when at that very time his friend is in great pain or trouble. Such in outline are the more remarkable features of this philosophy as expounded to me by Mirza Asad Ullah. That it differs considerably from the ideas formed by most European scholars of the philosophy current in Persia, as represented in the books, I am well aware. I can only suppose that Gobineau is right as to the extent to which the system of Ketman, concealment of opinions, prevails in Persia, a view which my own experience strongly tends to confirm. He says, for example, in speaking of Mullah Sadra, Religion et philosophie dans l'Asie centrale, page 88, in whose footsteps Haji Mullah Hadi for the most part followed, le soin qu'il prenait de déguiser ses discours, il était nécessaire qu'il le prît surtout de déguiser ses livres. C'est ce qu'il a fait et à les lire en se ferait l'idée la plus imparfaite de son enseignement. Je dis à les lire sans un maître qui possède la tradition, autrement on y pénètre sans peine. Such a system of concealment may seem strange to those accustomed to the liberty of thought enjoined in Europe, but it is rendered necessary in the East by the power and intolerance of the clergy. Many a philosopher like Sheikh Shihabuddin Sukhravardi, many a Sufi like Mansouri Halaj, has paid with his life for too free and open an expression of his opinions. For the rest, many of the ideas here enunciated bear an extraordinary similarity to those set forth by Mr. Sinnett in his work entitled Esoteric Buddhism. Great exception has been taken to this work, and especially it has been asserted that the ideas unfolded in it are totally foreign to Buddhism of any sort. Of this I am not in a position to judge. Very possibly it is true, though even then the ideas in question may still be of Indian origin. But whatever the explanation be, no one, I feel sure, can compare the chapters in Mr. Sinnett's book, entitled respectively the Constitution of Man, Devachan, and Kamaloka, with what I have written of Haji Mullah Hadi's views on the nature of man and his hereafter, without being much struck by the resemblance. Certain other points merit a brief notice. The physical sciences, as known to Persian philosophy, are those of the ancients. Their chemistry regards earth, air, fire, and water as the four elements, their astronomy is simply the Ptolemaic system. Furthermore, they regard the universe as finite, and adduce many proofs, some rather ingenious, others weak enough, against the contrary hypothesis. Of these I will give one only as a specimen. 
Let us suppose, they say, that the universe is infinite. Then from the centre of the earth draw two straight lines, diverging from one another at an angle of sixty degrees to the circumference, and produce them thence to infinity. Join their terminal points by another straight line, thus forming the base of the triangle. Now, since the two sides of the triangle are equal, for both were drawn from one point to infinity, therefore the angles at the base are equal, and since the angle at the apex is sixty degrees, therefore each of the remaining angles is sixty degrees, and the triangle is equilateral. Therefore, since the sides are infinite in length, the base is also infinite in length. But the base is a straight line joining two points, videte, the terminal points of the sides. That is to say, it is limited in both directions. Therefore, it is not infinite in length, neither are the sides infinite in length, and a straight line cannot be drawn to infinity. Therefore, the universe is finite, quod erat demonstrandum. This theorem scarcely needs comment. It, along with the endless discussions of a similar nature on the indivisible atom, Galhari Fard, and the like, is an inheritance from the scholastic theology, Ilmi Kalam, the physics of which have been retained by all Persian metaphysicians up to the present day. A few words may be said about the psychology of the system in question. Five psychic faculties, corresponding to the five senses, are supposed to exist. These, with their cerebral seats, are as follows. Forebrain. 1. The compound perception, hissi mushtarake, which has the double function of receiving and apprehending impressions from without. It is compared to a two-faced mirror, because on the one hand it reflects the outward world as presented to it by the senses, and on the other, during sleep, it gives form to the ideas arising in the mutasarifa, which will be mentioned directly. 2. The imagination, khiyal, which is the storehouse of forms. 3. The controlling or coordinating faculty, mutasarifa, which combines and elaborates the emotions or ideas stored in the vahime, and the images stored in the imagination. It is therefore called the keeper of the two treasuries. Midbrain. 4. The emotional faculty, Vahime, which is the seat of love, hate, fear, and the like. Hindbrain. 5. The memory, Hafiza, which is the storehouse of ideas. All these faculties are partial percipients, Mudricati jus ie, and are the servants of the reason, Akli kulit insani, or nafsit natika, which is the general percipient, mudriki kulli. Of these faculties, the imagination would appear to be regarded as the highest, since, as we have seen, in those cases in which the reason or rational soul, nafsi natika, is not developed, it constitutes that portion of the individual which survives death and resists disintegration. Indeed, these five faculties are better regarded as different stages in the development of the reason. Nothing below the plane of the imagination, however, survives death, e.g. in the lowest animals whose culminating faculty is a sense of touch, like worms, death brings about complete disintegration. Finally, a few words may be added concerning the view taken of the occult sciences. I was naturally desirous to learn to what extent they were recognised as true, and accordingly questioned Mirza Asadullah on the matter. His reply, which fairly represents the opinions of most thoughtful Persians of the old school, was briefly to this effect. As regards geomancy, ilmi rami, and astrology, ilmi nujum, he had no doubt of their truth, of which he had had positive proof. At the same time, of the number of those who professed to understand them, the majority were impostors and charlatans. Their acquisition was very laborious and required many years' patient study, and those who had acquired them and knew their value were, as a rule, very slow to exhibit or make a parade of their knowledge. 
As regards the interpretation of dreams, he said that these were of three kinds, of which only the last admits of interpretation. These three classes are as follows. 1. Dreams due to disordered health. Due to the predominance of 1. Blood, red things such as fire, etc. are seen. 2. Bile, yellow things such as the sun, gold, etc. are seen. 3. Phlegm, white things such as water, snow, etc. are seen. 4. Melancholy, black things such as ink, etc. are seen. 2. Dreams arising from the impressions produced during waking hours. 3. Dreams not arising from the external or internal causes above enumerated. These are reflections obtained during sleep from the world of similitudes, alam imithal. In some rare cases they indicate events as they actually will occur. Generally, however, they show them forth in a symbolical manner and require interpretation, just as every man has his appropriate form in the world of similitudes, so also has everything else. Knowledge, for instance, is symbolized by milk, an enemy by a wolf, etc. I discussed the occult sciences with several of my friends to discover as far as possible the prevailing opinion about them. One of them made use of the following argument to prove their existence. God, he said, has no buch, stinginess, avarice. It is impossible for him to withhold from any one a thing for which he strives with sufficient earnestness. Just as, if a man devotes all his energies to the pursuit of spiritual knowledge, he attains to it, so, if he chooses to make occult sciences and magical powers the object of his aspirations, they will assuredly not be withheld from him. Another of my intimate friends gave me the following account of an attempt at conjuration, Ihazari Jin, at which he had himself assisted. My uncle Mirza, he said, whose house you may perhaps see when you visit Shiraz, was a great believer in the occult sciences, in the pursuit of which, indeed, he dissipated a considerable fortune, being always surrounded by a host of magicians, geomancers, astrologers, and the like. On one occasion something of value had disappeared, and it was believed to have been stolen. It was therefore determined to make an attempt to discover the thief, by resorting to a conjuration, which was undertaken by a certain Sayyid of Shiraz, skilled in these matters. Now you must know that the operator cannot himself see the forms of the jinnis whom he evokes. He needs for this purpose the assistance of a young child. I, being then quite a child, was selected as his assistant. The magician began by drawing a talismanic figure in ink on the palm of my hand, over which he subsequently rubbed a mixture of ink and oil, so that it was no longer visible. He then commenced his incantations, and before long I, gazing steadily, as I had been instructed to do, into the palm of my hand, saw, reflected in it, as it were, a tiny figure, which I recognised as myself. I informed the magician of this, and he commanded me to address it in a peremptory manner, and bid it summon the king of the jinnis, Malikul Jin. I did so, and immediately a second figure appeared in the ink mirror. Then I was frightened, and began to cry, and hastily rubbed the ink off my hand. Thereupon another boy was brought, and the same process was repeated, till the king of the jinnis appeared. Tell him to summon his vizier, said the magician. The boy did so, and the vizier also appeared in the ink mirror. A number of other jinnis were similarly called up, one by one, and when they were all present, they were ordered to be seated. Then the magician took a number of slips of paper, wrote on each of them the name of one of those resident in the house, and placed them under his foot. He then drew out one without looking at it, and called out to the boy, Who is here? The boy immediately read off the name in question in the ink mirror. The same process was repeated till the name of one of the servants in the house was reached. Well, said the magician, why do you not tell me what you see in the mirror? I see nothing, answered the boy. 
Look again, said the magician, gaze more fixedly on the mirror. After a little while the boy said, I see no name, but only the words Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, in the name of God, the merciful, the clement. This, said the magician, which I hold in my hand, is the name of the thief. The man in question was summoned and interrogated, and finally confessed that he had stolen the missing article, which he was compelled to restore. In this connection, it may not be out of place to give the experiences of another experimenter in the occult sciences, who, although at the time sufficiently alarmed by the results he obtained, subsequently became convinced that they were merely due to an excited imagination. My informant in this case was a philosopher of Isfahan, entitled Amin Nush Shariat, who came to Tehran in the company of his friend and patron, Banan ul Mulk, one of the chief ministers of the Zillus Sultan. I saw him on several occasions and had long discussions with him on religion and philosophy. He spoke somewhat bitterly of the vanity of all systems. I have tried most of them, he said. I have been in turn Mussulman, Sufi, Shaykhi, and even Borbi. At one time of my life I devoted myself to the occult sciences and made an attempt to obtain control over the jinnis. Tashiri Jin, with what results I will tell you. You must know, in the first place, that the modus operandi is as follows. The seeker, after this power, chooses some solitary and dismal spot, such as the Hazar Dere at Isfahan, the place selected by me. There he must remain for forty days, which period of retirement we call Chille, he spends the greater part of his time in incantations in the Arabic language, which he recites within the area of the mandal, or geometrical figure, which he must describe in a certain way on the ground. Besides this, he must eat very little food, and diminish the amount daily. If he has faithfully observed all these details, on the twenty-first day a lion will appear, and will enter the magic circle. The operator must not allow himself to be terrified by this apparition, and above all must on no account quit the mandal, else he will lose the results of all his pains. If he resists the lion, other terrible forms will come to him on subsequent days, tigers, dragons, and the like, which he must similarly withstand. If he holds his ground till the fortieth day, he has obtained his object, and the jinnis, having been unable to get the mastery over him, will have to become his servants and obey all his behests. Well, I faithfully observed all the necessary conditions, and on the twenty-first day, sure enough, a lion appeared and entered the circle. I was horribly frightened, but all the same I stood my ground, although I came near to fainting with terror. Next day a tiger came, and still I succeeded in resisting the impulse which urged me to flee. But when, on the following day, a most hideous and frightful dragon appeared, I could no longer control my terror, and rushed from the circle, renouncing all further attempts at obtaining the mastery over the jinnis. When some time had elapsed after this, and I had pursued my studies in philosophy further, I came to the conclusion that I had been the victim of hallucinations excited by expectation, solitude, hunger, and long vigils, and with a view to testing the truth of this hypothesis, I again repeated the same process which I had before practised, this time in a spirit of philosophical incredulity. My expectations were justified. I saw absolutely nothing and there is another fact which proves to my mind that the phantoms I saw on the first occasion had no existence outside my own brain. I had never seen a real lion then, and my ideas about the appearance of that animal were entirely derived from the pictures which may be seen over the doors of baths in this country. Now the lion which I saw in the magic circle was exactly like the latter in form and colouring, and therefore, as I need hardly say, differed considerably in aspect from a real lion. In Tehran I saw another philosopher of the same reputation, Mirza Abdul Hassani Jilbe, 
the last of these names is the tachallus or nom de guerre under which he writes poetry for he is a poet as well as a metaphysician unfortunately i did not have the advantage of any prolonged conversation with him and even such as i had chiefly considered in answering his questions on the different phases of european thought he was greatly interested in what i told him about the theosophists and vegetarians and was anxious to know whether the plymouth brethren were believers in the transmigration of souls although as will have already appeared i acquired a considerable amount of information about certain phases of persian thought during my sojourn in tehran there was one which notwithstanding my most strenuous efforts and diligent inquiries had hitherto eluded all my attempts to approach it this one was Borbeism, of the history of which i have already had occasion to speak more than once and to which i shall have to refer repeatedly in the course of subsequent chapters although i exerted to the utmost all the skill all the tact and all the caution which i had at my command i was completely foiled in my attempts to communicate with the proscribed sect i heard something about them it is true and what i heard served only to increase my desire to know more i was told tales of their unflinching courage under torture of their unshakable faith of their marvellous skill in argument i once met one of them said a man of great learning to me as i was returning from karbala and he succeeded in drawing me into a discussion on religious matters so completely was i worsted by him at every turn so thorough was his knowledge of the quran and traditions and so ingenious was the use he made of this knowledge that i was finally compelled to effect my escape from his irresistible logic by declaring myself to be la madhab a free thinker whereupon he left me saying that with such he had nothing to do but whether my friends could not give me the knowledge i sought for or whether they did not choose to do so i was unable during my stay in teheran to become acquainted with any members of the sect in question some indeed of those with whom i was acquainted at that time were as i subsequently discovered actually barbies yet these although at times they asked me about the course of my studies commended my devotion to philosophy and even tantalized me with vague promises of introductions to mysterious friends who were as they would imply endowed with true wisdom heart, would say nothing definite and appeared afraid to speak more openly after arousing my curiosity to the highest pitch and making me fancy that i was on the threshold of some discovery they would suddenly leave me with an expression of regret that opportunities for prolonged and confidential conversation were so rare i tried to obtain information from an american missionary with similar lack of success he admitted that he had foregathered with poor bees but added that he did not encourage them to come and discuss their ideas which he regarded as mischievous and fanciful i asked how he succeeded in recognizing them since i had sought eagerly for them and had failed to find them he replied that there was not much difficulty in identifying them by their conversation as they always spoke on religious topics whenever an opportunity presented itself and dwelt especially on the need of a fuller revelation caused by the progress of the human race beyond this i could learn nothing from him once indeed i thought that i had succeeded in meeting with one of the sect in the person of an old shirazi merchant who to my astonishment launched forth before several other persians who were present on the excellencies of the new religion he declared that of their sacred books those written in arabic were more eloquent than the quran and those composed in persian superior in style to the writings of Sa'di he spoke of an arabic book of theirs of which a copy written in gold and worth at least five hundred tumans one hundred and fifty pounds existed in teheran this he added he might perhaps some day take me to see all the time he was talking he kept looking at me in a peculiar way as though to watch the effect produced by his words 
I met him once again when no one else was present, and easily induced him to resume the topic. He spoke of the numerous signs and wonders which had heralded the birth of Mirza Ali Muhammad, the Bob, of the wonderful quickness of apprehension manifested by him when still but a child, and of the strange puzzling questions he used sometimes to put to his teachers. Thus, on one occasion, when he was receiving instruction in Arabic grammar, he suddenly demanded, Hua kist? Who is he? My informant further declared that the Franco-German war and other events had been foretold by the Bob's successor some time before they actually occurred. On another occasion, in my eagerness to acquire knowledge on this matter, I committed a great indiscretion, and I fear caused considerable pain to my teacher, Mirza Asadullah. I had been informed that he had some time previously been arrested as a Bobi, and though he was released almost immediately on the representations of the English embassy, it was hinted to me that possibly this powerful protection, rather than any clear proof of his orthodoxy, was the cause of his liberation. I therefore determined to sound him on the matter, and, unable to control my impatience and await a favourable opportunity, I approached the subject as cautiously as I could the very next time that I saw him. Alluding to a previous discussion on the finality attributed by Mohammedans to the revelation of their prophet, I said that I had recently heard that there existed in Persia a number of people who denied this, and alleged that a subsequent revelation had been accorded to mankind even within the lifetime of many still living. Mirza Asadullah listened to what I said with a gradually increasing expression of dismay, which warned me that I was treading on dangerous ground, and made me begin to regret that I had been so precipitate. When I had finished, he continued silent for a few minutes, and then spoke as follows. I have no knowledge of these people, although you have perhaps been informed of the circumstances which give me good cause to remember their name. As you have probably heard some account of these, I may as well tell you the true version. Two or three years ago I was arrested in the village of Kulahak, which, as you know, serves the English residents for a summer retreat, by an officer in command of a party of soldiers sent to see another person suspected of being a Bobi. They had been unable to find him, and were returning disappointed from their quest when they espied me. Seize him, said the officer, that he is devoted to philosophy every one knows, and a philosopher is not far removed from a Bobi. Accordingly, I was arrested, and the books I was carrying, as well as a sum of money which I had on me, were taken from me by the officer in command. I was brought before the Naibus Sultana, and accused of being a Bobi. Many learned and pious men, including several mullahs, hearing of my arrest and knowing the utter falsity of the charge, appeared spontaneously to give evidence in my favour, and I was eventually released. But the money and the books taken from me I never recovered, and then the shame of it, the shame of it! But though, as you see, I have suffered much by reason of these people of whom you spoke just now, I have never met with them or had any dealings with them, save on one occasion. I was once returning from Sabzawar through Mazandaran, and at each of the more important towns on my way I halted for a few days to visit those interested in philosophy. Many of them were very anxious to learn about the doctrines of my master, Haji Mullah Hadi, and I was, as a rule, well received and kindly entertained. One day, it was at Sari, I was surrounded by a number of students who had come to question me on the views of my master, when a man present produced a book from which he read some extracts. This book, he said, was called Hakikati Basita, and as this was a term used by Haji Mullah Hadi, I thought it bore some reference to the philosophy I was expounding. I accordingly stretched out my hand to take the book, but the man drew it back out of my reach. Though I was displeased at his behaviour, I endeavoured to conceal my annoyance, and allowed him to continue to read. Presently he came to the turn Maratibi Ahadiyat, degrees of the primal unity. 
Here I interrupted him. I do not know who the author of the work you hold in your hand may be, I said, but it is clear to me that he does not understand what he is talking about, to speak of the degrees of primal unity, which is pure and undifferentiated being, is sheer nonsense. Some discussion ensued, and eventually I was permitted to look at the book. Then I saw that it was very beautifully written and adorned with gold, and it flashed upon me that what I held in my hand was one of the sacred books of the Borbees, and that those amongst whom I stood belonged to this redoubtable sect. That is the only time I ever came across them, and that is all that I know about them. And that was all, or nearly all, that I knew about them for the first four months I spent in Persia. How I came across them at last will be set forth in another chapter. End of se Section 15 of A Year Amongst the Persians by Edward Granville Brown This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For further information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Year Amongst the Persians by Edward Granville Brown Chapter 7, Part 1 From Tehran to Isfahan Christian, but what have you seen? said Christian. Men, seen? Why, the valley itself, which is as dark as pitch, we also saw there the hobgoblins, satyrs, and dragons of the pit. We heard also in that valley a continual howling and yelling, as of a people under unutterable misery, who there sat bound in affliction and irons. And over that valley hang the discouraging clouds of confusion. Death also doth always spread his wings over it. In a word, it is every whit dreadful being utterly without order. Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress Although, owing to the kindness of my friends, life in the capital was pleasant enough to make me in no hurry to leave it, nevertheless the praises of beautiful Shiraz and the descriptions of venerable Persepolis, which I so often heard, were not without their effect. I began to grow restless, and to suffer a kind of dread, lest, if I tarried much longer, some unforeseen event might occur to cut short my travels, and to prevent me from reaching what was really the goal of my journey. After all, Persis, Fars, is really Persia, and Shiraz is the capital thereof. To visit Persia, and not to reach Fars, is only a degree better than staying at home. Therefore, when one morning the Nawab came into my room to inform me that he had received instructions to proceed to Mashhad in the course of a week or two, and asked me what I would do, I replied without hesitation that I would start for the south. As he expected to leave Tehran about 10th February, I determined to arrange my departure for the 7th, which, being my birthday, seemed to me an auspicious day for resuming my travels. Ali the Turk having gone south with H, I was for a time left without a servant. Soon after I had become the guest of the Nawab, however, he advised me to obtain one, and promised to help me in finding someone who would suit me. I was anxious to have a genuine Persian of the South this time, and finally succeeded in engaging a man who appeared in every respect to satisfy my requirements. He was a fine-looking young fellow, of rather distinguished appearance, and a native of Shiraz. He made no boast of any special accomplishments, and was satisfied to receive the very moderate sum of three tumans a month while in Tehran, where he had a house and a wife. He proved, however, to be an excellent cook, and an admirable servant in every respect, though inclined at times to manifest the spirit of independence. Haji Safar, for that was his name, received the announcement that I should start for the south in a few days, with evident satisfaction. A Persian servant has everything to gain when his master undertakes a journey. 
In the first place, his wages are raised 50% to supply him with money for his expenses on the road, jire. In the second place, he receives, before starting, an additional sum of money, generally equivalent to a month's wages, to provide himself with requisites for the road, this allowance being known as puli chekme va shalwar, boots and breeches money. In the third place, he has more chance of making himself indispensable to his master, and so obtaining increased wages. Last of all, there is probably hardly a Persian to be found who does not enjoy travelling for its own sake, though in this particular case the charm of novelty was lacking, for Haji Safar had visited not only Mecca and Karbala, but nearly all the more important towns in Persia as well. Four or five days before the date fixed for my departure, he brought me a formidable list of necessaries for the road, cooking pots with all the appliances for making pilau, saddle bags, sponges, cloths, towels, whips, cups, glasses, spits, brooms, tongs, and a host of other articles, many of which seemed to me unnecessary, besides quantities of rice, onions, potatoes, tea, sugar, candles, matches, honey, cheese, charcoal, butter, and other groceries. I struck out a few of what I regarded as the most useless articles, for it appeared to me that with such stores we might be going to Khiba, whereas we should actually arrive at the considerable town of Qum three or four days after leaving Tehran. On the whole, however, I let him have his own way, in consequence of which I enjoyed a degree of comfort in my future journeyings hitherto quite unknown to me, whilst the addition to my expenses was comparatively slight. Then began the period of activity and bustle, which inevitably precedes a journey, even on the smallest scale in the East. Every day I was down in the bazaars with Haji Safar, buying cooking utensils, choosing tobaccos, and examining the merits of saddle-bags, till I was perfectly weary of the bargaining, the delays, and the endless scrutiny of goods, which had to be gone through before the outfit was complete. Indeed, at last I nearly despaired of being ready in time to start on the appointed day, and resigned the management into Haji Safar's hands almost entirely, only requesting him not to invest in any perfectly useless chattels or provisions. Another, and a yet more important matter, still remained, to wit, the discovery of a muleteer, possessed of a small number of reasonably good animals, prepared to start on the day I had fixed, and willing to make the stages as I wished. This matter I regarded as too important to be arranged by deputy, for, when one is travelling by oneself, the pleasantness of the journey greatly depends on having a cheerful, communicative, and good-natured muleteer. Such an one will beguile the way with an endless series of anecdotes, will communicate to the traveller the weird folklore of the desert, will point out a hundred objects of interest which would otherwise be passed unnoticed, and will manage to arrange the stages so as to enable him to see to the best advantage anything worth seeing. A cross-grained, surly fellow, on the other hand, will cast a continual gloom over the caravan, and will throw difficulties in the way of every deviation from the accustomed routine. Here I must speak a few words in favour of the much-maligned Charvadar, as far as my experience goes, he is, as a rule, one of the best fellows living. During the period which elapses between the conclusion of the agreement and the actual start, he is indeed troublesome and vexatious beyond measure. He will invent endless excuses for making extra charges. He will put forward a dozen reasons against starting on the proposed day, or following the proposed route, or halting at the places where one desires to halt. On the day of departure he will rouse one at a preternaturally early hour, alleging that the stage is a long one, that it is eight good farsakhs at least that it is dangerous to be on the road after dark, and the like. Then, just as you are nearly ready, he will disappear to procure some hitherto forgotten necessary for the journey, 
or to say farewell to his wife, or to fetch one of those scraps of sacking or ropes, which supply him with an unfailing excuse for absenting himself. Finally, you will not get off till the sun is well past the meridian, and may think yourself fortunate if you accomplish a stage of ten miles. But when once he is fairly started, he becomes a different man. With the dust of the city he shakes off the exasperating manner which has hitherto made him so objectionable. He sniffs the pure, exhilarating air of the desert. He strides forward manfully on the broad, interminable road, which is indeed for the most part but the track worn by countless generations of travellers. He beguiles the tediousness of the march with songs and stories, interrupted by occasional shouts of encouragement or warning to his animals. His life is a hard one, and he has to put up with many disagreeables, so that he might be pardoned even if he lost his temper oftener than he usually does. For some time my efforts to discover a suitable muleteer were fruitless. I needed only three animals, and I did not wish to attach myself to a large caravan, foreseeing that it would lead to difficulties in case I desired to halt on the way or deviate from the regular track. A very satisfactory arrangement, concluded with two young natives of Qum, who had exactly the number of animals I required, was broken off by their father, who wished to make me hire his beasts by the day, instead of for the whole distance to Isfahan. To this I refused to agree, fearing that he might protract the journey unduly, and the contract was therefore annulled. At length, however, Two days before I had intended to start, a muleteer, who appeared in every way suitable, presented himself. He was a native of the hamlet of Gez, near Isfahan, Rahim by name, a clumsy-looking, weather-beaten young man, the excessive plainness of whose broad, smooth face was redeemed by an almost perpetual smile. The bargain was concluded in a few minutes. He engaged to provide me with three good animals, to convey me to Isfahan in twelve or thirteen days, and to allow me a halt of one day each at Qum and Kashan, for the sum of ten tumans, nearly three pounds. All was now ready for the journey, and there only remained the always somewhat depressing business of leave-taking, which fully occupied my last hours in Tehran. Finally the day of departure came, but, as indeed invariably happens, endless delays arose before I actually got off, so that it was determined that we should that day proceed no farther than Shah Abdul Azim, situated some five or six miles to the south of the metropolis, whence we could make a fair start on the morrow. One of my friends, a nephew of my kind host, the Nawab, announced his intention of accompanying me thus far. This ceremony of setting the traveller on his way is called Badraka, while the converse, that of going out to meet one arriving from a journey, is called Istikbal. Of these two, the former is more an act of friendship and less a formality than the latter. Persian servants, having often been described as the most sordid and rapacious of mankind, I feel that, as a mere act of justice, I must not omit to mention the disinterested and generous conduct exhibited by those of the Nawab's household. The system of tips being extremely prevalent in Persia, and conducted generally on a larger scale than in Europe, I had, of course, prepared a sum of money to distribute amongst the retainers of my host. Seizing a favourable opportunity, I entered the room where they were assembled, and offered the present to the major-domo, Muhammad Riza Khan. To my surprise, he refused it unhesitatingly, without so much as looking at it. When I remonstrated, thinking that he only needed a little persuasion, he replied, The master told us, when you came here, that you were to be treated in every way as one of the family. We should not expect or desire a present from one of the family. Therefore, we do not expect or desire it from you. You have been welcome, and we are glad to have done what we could to make you comfortable. But we desire nothing from you unless it be kindly remembrance. 
In this declaration he persisted, and the others spoke to the same effect. Finally, I was compelled to accept their refusal as definite, and left them with the sense of admiration at their immovable determination to observe to the full their master's wishes. At length all was ready. The baggage mules had started, the last cup of tea had been drunk, and the last kalyan smoked, and the horses stood waiting at the gate, while Haji Safar, armed with a most formidable whip, and arrayed in a pair of enormous top boots, strutted about the courtyard, looking eminently businesslike, and evidently in the best of spirits. As I was just about to take my last farewells, I observed the servants engaged in making preparations of which the object was to me totally mysterious and inexplicable. A large metal tray was brought, on which were placed the following incongruous objects a mirror, a bowl of water with some narcissi floating in it, a plate of flour, and a dish of sweetmeats of the kind called shakar paneer, sugar cheese. A copy of the Qur'an was next produced, and I was instructed to kiss it first, and then to dip my hand in the water and the flour, to rub it over the face of the old servant who had brought the tray, pass under the Qur'an, which was held aloft for that purpose, and mount my horse without once turning or looking back. All these instructions I faithfully observed amidst general mirth, and as I mounted amidst many good wishes for my journey, I heard the splash of the water as it was thrown after me. What the origin of this curious ceremony may be I do not know, neither did I see it practised on any other occasion. Our progress not being hampered by the presence of the baggage, we advanced rapidly, and before 4 p.m. rode through the gate of the city of refuge, Shah Abdul Azim. I have already stated that the holy shrine for which this place is famous protects all outlaws who succeed in reaching its vicinity. In a word, the whole town is what is called bust, sanctuary. There are, however, different degrees of bust, the area of protection being smaller and more circumscribed in proportion as the crime of the refugee is greater. Murderers, for instance, cannot go outside the courtyard of the mosque without running the risk of being arrested. Debtors, on the other hand, are safe anywhere within the walls. It may be imagined that the populace of such a place is scarcely the most respectable, and of their churlishness I had convincing proof. I was naturally anxious to get a glimpse of the mosque, the great golden dome of which forms so conspicuous an object to the eyes of the traveller approaching Tehran from the west, and accordingly, as soon as we had secured our horses in the caravan sarai, for the rest of the caravan had not yet arrived, I suggested to my companion that we should direct our steps thither. Of course I had no intention of attempting to enter it, which I knew would not be permitted, but I thought no objection would be made to my viewing it from the outside. However, we had hardly reached the entrance of the bazaar, when we were stopped and turned back. Discouraged, but not despairing, we succeeded in making our way by a devious and unfrequented route to the very gate of the mosque. I had, however, hardly begun to admire it, when forth from some hidden recess came two most ill-looking custodians, who approached us in a threatening manner, bidding us be gone. My companion remonstrated with these churlish fellows, saying that as far as he was concerned, he was a good Mussulman, and had as much right in the mosque as they had. No good Mussulman would bring a Firangi infidel to gaze upon the sacred building, they replied. We regard you as no whit better than him. Hence, be gone. As there was nothing to be gained by stopping, and indeed a fair prospect of being roughly handled if we remained to argue the matter, we prudently withdrew. I was much mortified at this occurrence, not only on my own account, but also because the good nature of my companion had exposed him likewise to insult. I feel bound to state, however, that this was almost the only occasion on which I met with discourtesy of this sort during the whole time I spent in Persia. 
On returning to the caravanserai, we found that Haji Safar and the muleteers had arrived, the former being accompanied by a relative who had come to see him so far on his journey, and at the same time to accomplish a visit to the shrine from the precincts of which we had just been so ignominiously expelled. As it was now getting late, and as most of the gates of Tehran are closed soon after sunset, my friend bade me farewell, and cantered off homewards, leaving me with a sense of loneliness which I had not experienced for some time. The excitement of feeling that I was once more on the road, with my face fairly turned towards the glorious south, soon, however, came to my relief, and indeed I had enough to occupy me in attempting to introduce some order into my utterly confused accounts. Before long, Haji Safar, who had been busy ever since his arrival with culinary operations, brought in a supper which augured well for the comfort of the journey, so far as food was concerned. I had finished supper and was ruminating over tea and tobacco when he re-entered, accompanied by his relative, who solemnly placed his hand in mine and swore allegiance to me, not only on his behalf, but for the whole family, assuring me in a long and eloquent harangue that he, the speaker, would answer for Haji Safar's loyalty and devotion, and asking me in return to treat him kindly, and not make his heart narrow. Having received my assurances that I would do my best to make things agreeable, they retired, and I forthwith betook myself to rest in preparation for the early start which we proposed to make on the morrow. Next day we were astir early, for there was no temptation to linger in a spot from the inhabitants of which I had met with nothing but incivility, and moreover I was anxious to form a better idea of the muleteers who were to be my companions for the next fortnight. However, I saw but little of them that day, as they lagged behind soon after starting, and passed me while I was having lunch. The road, except for several large parties of travellers whom we met, presented few points of interest. Nevertheless, a curious history is attached to it, which, as it forms a significant commentary on what one may call the Board of Public Works in Persia, I here reproduce. On leaving Shah Abdul Azim, the road runs for a mile or so as straight as an arrow towards the south. A little before it reaches a range of low hills which lie at right angles to its course, it bifurcates. One division goes straight on and crosses the hills above mentioned to the caravanserai of Kinari Gird. The other bends sharply to the west for about three quarters of a mile, thus turning the edge of the hills, and then resumes its southward course. Of these two roads, the first is the good old direct caravan route, described by Vanbery, which leads to Qum by way of Kinari Girt, Hausi Sultan, and Puli Dalak. The second is the new improved road, made some years ago by order of the Aminus Sultan, the history of which is as follows. When the rage for superseding the venerable and commodious caravanserai by the new-fangled and extortionate Mehman Khane was at its height, and when the road between Tehran and Kazvin had been adorned with a sufficient number of these evidences of civilization, the attention of the Aminus Sultan and other philanthropists was turned to the deplorable and unregenerate state of the great southern road. It was decided that at least so far as Qum, its defects should be remedied forthwith, and that the caravanserais of Kinari Girt, Hausi Sultan, and Puli Dallak, which had for generations afforded shelter to the traveller, should be replaced by something more in accordance with modern Europeanized taste. Negotiations were accordingly opened by the Aminus Sultan, with the owners of the caravanserais in question, with a view to effecting a purchase of the land and goodwill. Judge of the feelings of this enlightened and patriotic statesman when the owner of the caravanserai at Hausi Sultan refused, yes, positively refused, to sell his heritage. 
perhaps he was an old-fashioned individual with a distaste for innovations perhaps he merely thought that his caravanserai brought him in a better income than he was likely to get even by a judicious investment of the money now offered for it be this as it may he simply declined the offer made to him by the aminus sultan and said that he preferred to retain in his own possession the property he had inherited from his father what was to be done clearly it was intolerable that the march of civilization should be checked by this benighted old conservative in the rough days of yore it might have been possible to behead or poison him or at least to confiscate his property but such an idea could not for a moment be seriously entertained by a humane and enlightened minister of the fourteenth century of the hijra no annoying and troublesome as it was there was nothing for it but to leave the old road in status quo and make a new one this was accordingly done at considerable expense the new road being carried in a bold curve to the west and garnished at suitable intervals with fancifully constructed mihman situated amidst little groves of trees supplied with runnels of sweet pure water from the hills and furnished with tables chairs and beds in unstinted profusion but alas for the obstinacy of the majority of men and their deplorable disinclination to be turned aside from their ancient habits the muleteers for the most part declined to make use of the new road and continued to follow their accustomed course alleging as their reason for so doing that it was a good many farsakhs shorter than the other and that they preferred the caravanserais to the new mihmanchanes which were not only in no wise better adapted to their requirements than the old halting places but were very much more expensive briefly they objected to go farther and fare worse there seemed to be every prospect of the new road being a complete failure and of the benevolent intentions of the Aminus Sultan being totally frustrated by this unlooked-for lack of appreciation on the part of the travelling public, when suddenly the mind of the perplexed philanthropist was illuminated by a brilliant idea. Though it would not be quite constitutional to forcibly overthrow the caravanserais on the old road, it was evidently within the rights of a paternal government to utilise the resources of nature as a means of compelling the refractory sons of the road to do what was best for them luckily these means were not far to seek near the old road between houses sultan and pulitanlak ran a river and this river was prevented from overflowing the low flat plain which it traversed ere losing itself in the sands of the dashti kavir by dikes solidly constructed and carefully kept in repair if these were removed there was every reason to hope that the old road would be flooded and rendered impracticable the experiment was tried and succeeded perfectly not only the road but an area of many square miles round about it was completely and permanently submerged and a fine lake almost a sea was added to the realms of the shah it is indeed useless for navigation devoid of fish so far as i could learn and being impregnated with salt incapable of supporting vegetable life but it is eminently picturesque with its vast blue surface glittering in the sun and throwing into bolder relief the white salt-strewn expanse of the terrible desert beyond it also constitutes a permanent monument of the triumph of science over obstinacy and prejudice the aminus sultan might now fairly consider that his triumph was complete suddenly however a new difficulty arose the management of the posts was in the hands of another minister called the aminu daula and he like the muleteers considered the charges which it was proposed to make for the use of the new now the only road excessive as however there appeared to be no course open to him but to submit to them 
since the posts must be maintained and the old road was irrecoverably submerged the aminus sultan determined to withstand all demands for a reduction but the aminud daula was also a minister of some ingenuity and having the example of his colleague fresh in his mind he determined not to be outdone he therefore made yet another road which took a yet wider sweep towards the west and transferring the post-houses to that bade defiance to his rival thus it has come to pass that in place of the old straight road to Kum, there is now a caravan road longer by some fourteen miles and a post road longer by nearly twenty miles the last indeed on leaving teheran follows the hamadan road for about a stage and a half diverging from it some distance to the south-west of ribat karim the first post-house and curving back towards the east by way of pik and kushki pahram to join the aminus sultan's road near the mihman khane of shashgir about ten farsakhs from Qum. on the second day after leaving tehran ninth of february soon after quitting the mihman khane of hasanabad we entered the dismal region called by the persians malakul maut dere the valley of the angel of death around this spot cluster most thickly the weird tales of the desert to which i have already alluded indeed its only rival in this sinister celebrity is hasad dere thousand valleys which lies just to the south of isfahan anxious to become further acquainted with the folklore of the country i succeeded in engaging the muleteer in conversation on this topic the substance of what i learnt was as follows there are several species of supernatural monsters which haunt the gloomy defiles of the valley of the angel of death of these the ghuls and ifrits are alike the commonest and the most malignant the former usually endeavour to entice the traveller away from the caravan to his destruction by assuming the form or voice of a friend or relative crying out piteously for help and entreating the unwary traveller to come to their assistance they induce him to follow them to some lonely spot where suddenly assuming the hideous form proper to them they rend him in pieces and devour him another monster is the nasnas which appears in the form of an infirm and aged man it is generally found sitting by the side of a river and bewailing its inability to cross when it sees the wayfarer approaching it earnestly entreats him to carry it across the water to the other side if he consents it sits itself on his shoulders and when he reaches the middle of the river winds its long supple legs round his throat till he falls insensible in the water and perishes besides these there is the palis foot liquor which only attacks those who are overtaken by sleep in the desert it kills its victim as its name implies by licking the soles of his feet till it has drained away his life-blood it was on one occasion circumvented by two muleteers of isfahan who being benighted in the desert lay down feet to feet covering their bodies with cloaks presently the pilis arrived and began to walk round the sleepers to discover their feet but on either side it found a head at last it gave up the search in despair exclaiming as it made off gashtiam hazar usi usi dere amana dide am mardidu sere i have wandered through a thousand and thirty and three valleys but never yet saw a two-headed man another superstition not however connected with the desert of which i heard at tehran may be mentioned in this connection a form of cursing used by women to each other is alat bizanad may the owl strike thee the belief concerning the owl is that it attacks women who have recently been confined and tries to tear out and devour their livers to avert this calamity various precautions are taken swords and other weapons are placed under the woman's pillow and she is not allowed to sleep for several hours after the child is born 
being watched over by her friends, and roused by cries of, Yam, Maryam, Oh, Mary, whenever she appears to be dozing off. It is worthy of note that the owl, as well as its congeners, is supposed to have flaxen hair. The scenery through which we passed on leaving the Malakul Malt Dere was savage and sublime. All round were wild, rugged hills, which assumed the strangest and most fantastic shapes, and deserts sparsely sown with camel thorn. As we reached the highest point of the road, rain began to fall sharply, and it was so cold that I was glad to muffle myself up in ulster and rug. Now for the first time the great salt lake made by the Aminus Sultan came in view. It is of vast extent, and the muleteers informed me that its greatest width was not less than six farsakhs, about twenty-two miles. Beyond it stretches the weird expanse of the Dash de Gavir, which extends hence even to the eastern frontier of Persia, a boundless waste of sand, here and there glimmering white with incrustations of salt, and broken in places by chains of black, savage-looking mountains. The desolate grandeur of this landscape defies description, and surpasses anything which I have ever seen. The Mihman Khane of Ali Abad, which we reached an hour or so before sunset, presents no features worthy of remark, except this, that in the room allotted to me I found three books, which proved on examination to be a copy of the Qur'an, a book of Arabic prayers, and a visitor's book. It was evident that here, at least, the prototype was afforded by the Bible and prayer book which are usually to be found in every bedroom of an English hotel, and the visitor's book which lies on the hall table. I examined this visitor's book with some curiosity. It was filled with long rhapsodies on the Aminus Sultan, penned by various travellers, all complimentary, as I need hardly say. How enlightened and patriotic a minister! How kind of him to make this nice new road, and to provide it with these admirable guest-houses, which indeed might fairly be considered to rival, if not to excel, the best hotels of Firangistan! I could not forbear smiling as I read these effusions, which were so at variance with the views expressed in the most forcible language by the muleteers, who had continued at intervals throughout the day to inveigh against the new road, the Mihman Khanes, and their owner alike. End of section 15「16 of A Year Amongst the Persians」by Edward Granville Brown. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For further information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Year Amongst the Persians by Edward Granville Brown. Chapter 7 From Tehran to Isfahan Part 2 The next day brought us to Qum after a long, quick march of nearly ten hours. The muleteers were suddenly seized with one of those fits of energetic activity to which even the most lethargic Persians are occasionally subject, so that when, early in the afternoon, we reached the Mihman Khane of Shashgird, or Manzariye, the place of outlook, as it is more pretentiously styled, and Haji Safar proposed to halt for the night. They insisted on pushing on to the holy city, which they declared they could reach before sundown. A lively altercation ensued, which concluded with a bet of five crans offered by Haji Safar and taken by the muleteers, that we should not reach the town before sunset. The effect of this stimulus was magical. Never before or since did I see muleteers attain such a degree of speed. With eyes continually directed towards the declining sun, they ran along at a steady trot, 
occasionally shouting to their animals, and declaring that they would fare sumptuously that night off the delicacies of Qum, with the money they would earn by their efforts. The road seemed interminable, even after the golden dome of the mosque of Hazrati Ma'suma, Her Holiness the Immaculate, rose up before us across the salt swamps, and as the sun sank lower and lower towards the horizon, the efforts of the muleteers were redoubled, till, just as the rim of the luminary sank from sight behind the western hills, we crossed the long graceful bridge which spans a river-bed almost dry except in spring, and, passing beneath the blue-tiled gate, rode into the holy city. I have already had occasion to allude to the Indo-European telegraph, and to mention the great kindness which I met with from Major Wells, in whose hands the control thereof was placed, and from all other members of the staff with whom I came into contact. This kindness did not cease with my departure from Tehran. A message was sent down the line to all the telegraph stations, which are situated every three or four stages all the way from Tehran to Bushir, to inform the residents at these, most of whom are English, of my advent, and to ask them to extend to me their hospitality. Although I felt some hesitation at first in thus quartering myself without an invitation on strangers who might not wish to be troubled with a guest, I was assured that I need have no apprehensions on that score, and that I should be certain to meet with a hospitable welcome. This indeed proved to be the case to a degree beyond my expectations. At all the telegraph offices I was received with a cordial friendliness and geniality which made me at once feel at home and I gladly take this opportunity of expressing the deep sense of gratitude which I feel for kindnesses, the memory of which will always form one of my pleasantest recollections of the pleasant year I spent in Persia. The first of these telegraph stations is at Qum, and thither I at once made my way through the spice-laden twilight of the bazaars. On arriving, I was cordially welcomed by Mr. Lyne and his wife, and was soon comfortably ensconced in an easy chair before a bright fire, provided with those two great dispellers of weariness, tea and tobacco. My host, who had resided for a long while at Qum, entirely surrounded by Persians, was a fine Persian and Arabic scholar, and possessed a goodly collection of books, which he kindly permitted me to examine. They were, for the most part, formidable-looking treatises on Mohammedan theology and jurisprudence, and had evidently been well read. Indeed, Mr. Lyne's fame as a mullah is great, not only in Qum, but throughout Persia, and I heard his erudition warmly praised, even at distant Kirman. Perhaps it was owing to this that I met with such courtesy and good nature from the people of Qum, of whom I had heard the worst possible accounts. My treatment at Shah Abdul Azim had not given me a favourable idea of the character of holy cities and sanctuaries, and this prejudice was supported in this particular case by the well-known stricture of some Persian satirist on the towns of Qum and Kashan. Sagi Kashi Bih as Akabiri Qum, Bavujuri ki Sag Big as Kashist. A dog of Kashon is better than the nobles of Qum, although a dog is better than a native of Kashon. Whether the inhabitants of Qum have been grossly maligned, or whether their respect for my host, for, so far as my experience goes, there is no country where knowledge commands such universal respect as in Persia, procured for me an unusual degree of courtesy, I know not. At any rate, when we went out next day to see the town, we were allowed, without the slightest opposition, to stand outside the gate of the mosque and look at it to our heart's content. 
Several people, indeed, came up to us and entered into friendly conversation. Further than this, I was allowed to inspect the manufacture of several of the chief products of the city, the most important of which is the beautiful blue pottery, which is now so celebrated. This, indeed, is the great feature of Qum, which might almost be described as the blue city. Nowhere have I witnessed a greater profusion of blue domes and tiles. Many small articles are made of this ware, such as salt cellars, lamps, pitchers, pipe bowls, beads, and button-like amulets of diverse forms and sizes, which are much used for necklaces for children, and for affixing to the foreheads of horses, mules, and the like, as a protection against the evil eye. Of all of these I purchased a large selection, the total cost of which did not exceed a few shillings, for they are ridiculously cheap. Besides the mosque and the potteries, I paid a visit to a castor oil mill, worked by a camel, and ascended an old minaret furnished with a double spiral staircase in a sad state of dilapidation. From this I obtained a fine view of the city and its surroundings. It has five gates and is surrounded by a wall, but this is now broken down in many places, and the whole of the southern quarter of the town is in a very ruined condition. Altogether I enjoyed my short stay in Qum very much, and was as sorry to leave it as I was pleased to find how much better its inhabitants are than they are generally represented to be. Their appearance is as pleasant as their manner, and I was greatly struck with the high average of good looks which they enjoy, many of the children especially being very pretty. Though the people are regarded as very fanatical, their faces certainly belie this opinion, for it seemed to me that the majority of them wore a singularly gentle and benign expression. I could not, however, protract my stay at Qum without subjecting my plans to considerable alteration, and accordingly, on the second day after my arrival, 12th of February, I again set out on my southward journey. As I was in no hurry to bid a final farewell to my kind host and hostess, the muleteers had been gone for more than half an hour before I finally quitted the telegraph office but about this I did not greatly concern myself, making no doubt that we should overtake them before we had gone far. In this, however, I was mistaken, for when we halted for lunch, no sign of them had appeared, supposing, however, that Haji Safar, who had travelled over the road before, knew the way. I thought little of the matter till the gathering shades of dusk recalled me from my reveries on the future to thoughts of the present, and I began to reflect that it was a very odd thing that a stage of only four farsakhs had taken so long a time to accomplish, and that even now no signs of our destination were in view. Accordingly I pulled up and proceeded to cross-examine Haji Safar, with the somewhat discouraging result that his ignorance of our whereabouts proved to be equal to my own. It now occurred to me that I had heard that the caravanserai of Pasangan was situated close under the hills to the west, while we were well out in the plain, and I therefore proposed that we should turn our course in that direction, especially as I fancied I could descry, in spite of the gathering gloom, a group of buildings under the hills. Haji Safar, on the other hand, was for proceeding, assuring me that he saw smoke in front, which no doubt marked the position of our halting place. While we were engaged in this discussion, I discerned in the distance the figure of a man running towards us, shouting and gesticulating wildly. On its closer approach I recognised in it the muleteer Rahim. We accordingly turned our horses towards him, and presently met him, whereupon, so soon as he had in some measure recovered his breath, he proceeded to upbraid Haji Safar roundly. "'A wonderful fellow art thou!' he exclaimed, on receiving some excuse about the smoke ahead looking like the manzil. "'Do you know where that smoke comes from?' 
It comes from an encampment of those rascally Shatsivans, who, had you fallen into their midst, would as like as not have robbed you of every single thing that you have with you, including my animals. If you don't know the road, keep with us who do, and if you thought you were going to discover a new way to Yezd across the desert, I tell you, you can't. Only camels go across there, and if you had escaped the Shah Sivan's curses on the graves of their fathers, it is as like as not that you would have just gone down bodily into the salt swamps, and never have been seen or heard of again, as has happened to plenty of people who knew more about the desert than you. So he ran on, while we both felt very much ashamed of ourselves, till we finally reached Pasangan, and took up our quarters at the post-house, which looked more comfortable than the caravanserai. Next day was beautifully fine and warm, almost like a bright June day in England. Our way still lay just beneath the hills to the west, and the road continued quite flat, for we were still skirting the edge of the great salt-strewn Dashti Kavir. About midday we halted before the caravanserai of Shurab for lunch. Here there is some verdure and a little stream, but the water of the Is, as the name of the place implies, brackish. Soon after leaving this, we met two men with great blue turbans, carelessly and loosely wound. These Haji Safar at once identified as Yezdis. You can always tell a Yezdi wherever you see him, he explained, and indeed whenever you hear him, as you may like to hear their sweet speech, I will pass the time of day with them, and ask them whence they hail, and whither they are bound. So saying, he entered into a brief conversation with them, and for the first time I heard the broad, drawling, sing-song speech of Yezd, which once heard can never be mistaken. We reached the caravanserai of Sin Sin quite early in the afternoon, the stage being six light farsakhs, and the road good and level. This caravanserai is one of those fine, spacious, solidly constructed buildings which can be referred almost at a glance to the time of the Savafi kings, and which the tradition of muleteers, recognising, as a rule, only two great periods in history, that of Feridun and that of Shah Abbas the Great, unhesitatingly attributes to the latter. The building, although it appeared totally neglected, even the doors being torn away from their hinges, is magnificently constructed, and I wandered with delight through its long, vaulted, dimly lit stables, its deserted staircase and untenanted rooms. The roof, however, solidly built of brickwork, and measuring no less than ninety paces from corner to corner of the square, was the great attraction, commanding as it did an extensive view of the flat plain around, the expanse of which was hardly broken by anything except the little group of houses which constitute the village, and a great caravan of camels from Yezd, kneeling down in rows to receive their evening meal from the hands of their drivers. While I was on the roof, I was joined by a muleteer called Khuda Bakhsh, whom I had not noticed at the beginning of the journey, but who had cast up within the last day or two as a recognised member of our little caravan, in that mysterious and unaccountable way peculiar to his class. He entered into conversation with me, anxiously inquired whether I was not an agent of my government, sent out to examine the state of the country, and refused to credit my assurances to the contrary. He then asked me many questions about America, Yangi Dunya, not, as might at first sight appear, a mere corruption of the term commonly applied by us to its inhabitants but a genuine Turkish compound, meaning the New World, and received my statement that its people were of the same race as myself, and had emigrated there from my own country, with manifest incredulity. Next day brought us to another considerable town, Kashan, after an uneventful march of about seven hours, 
broken by a halt for lunch at a village called Nasrabad, at which I was supplied with one of the excellent melons grown in the neighbourhood. On leaving this place we fell in with two Kirmanis, an old man and his son, who were travelling back from Hamadan, where they had gone with a load of shawls, which had been satisfactorily disposed of. They were intelligent and communicative, and supplied me with a good deal of information about the roads between Shiraz and Kirmon, concerning which I was anxious for detailed knowledge. About 3.30 p.m. we reached Kashan, but did not enter the town, alighting at the telegraph office, which is situated just outside the gate. Here I was kindly welcomed by Mr. Aganor, an Armenian who spoke English perfectly. Though it was not late, I did not go into the town that day, as we received a visit from the chief of the custom house, Mirza Hussein Khan, who was very pleasant and amusing. Besides this, a man came with some manuscripts which he was anxious to sell, but there were none of any value. In the evening I had some conversation with my host about the Barbies, whom he asserted to be very numerous at Yezd and Abade. At the former place, he assured me, the new religion was making great progress even amongst the Zoroastrians. Next morning we went for a walk in the town. Almost every town in Persia is celebrated for something, and Kashan is said to have three specialities. First, its brasswork. Second, its scorpions, which, unlike the bugs of Miyane, are said never to attack strangers, but only the natives of the town. And third, the extreme timorousness of its inhabitants. Concerning the latter, it is currently asserted that there formerly existed a Kashan regiment, but that in consideration of the cowardice of its men and their obvious inefficiency, it was disbanded, and those composing it were told to return to their homes. On the following day, a deputation of the men waited on the Shah, asserting that they were afraid of being attacked on the road and begging for an escort. We are a hundred poor fellows, all alone, they said. Send some horsemen with us to protect us. The scorpions I did not see, as it was winter, and of the alleged cowardice of the inhabitants I had, of course, no means of judging, but with the brass bazaar I was greatly impressed, though my ears were almost deafened by the noise. Besides brass work, fine silk fabrics are manufactured in large quantity at Cachon, though not so extensively as at Yezd. The road to this latter city quits the Isfahan and Shiraz route at this point, so that Cachon forms the junction of the two great southern roads, which terminate respectively at Bandari Abbas and Bushir on the Persian Gulf. In the afternoon, Mirza Hussein Khan, the chief of the customs, came again. He had his little child of seventeen months old, to which he seemed devotedly attached, brought for me to look at, as it was suffering from eczema, and he wished for advice as to the treatment which should be adopted. Later in the evening, after the child had gone home, he returned with his secretary, Mirza Abdullah, and stayed to supper. We had a most delightful evening, the Khan being one of the most admirable conversationalists I ever met. Some of his stories I will here set down, though it is impossible for me to convey an idea of the vividness of description, wealth of illustration, and inimitable mimicry, which, in his mouth, gave them so great a charm. "'What sort of a supper are you going to give us, Aganor Saip? he began, Persian or Firangi? Oh, half one and half the other. Very good, that is best, for this sahib is evidently anxious to learn all he can about us Persians, so that he would have been disappointed if you hadn't given him some of our foods, while at the same time, being fresh from Firangistan, he might perhaps not have been able to eat some of the things which we like. How do you like our Persian food so far? he continued, turning to me. For my part, I doubt if you have anything half so nice as our pilaus and chilaus in your country. 
Then there is must khiyar, curds and cucumbers. Have you tasted that yet? No? Well then, you have a pleasure to come. Only after eating it you must not drink water to quench the slight thirst which it produces, or else you will suffer for it, like Manakji Saib, the chief of the Gebs, who is now residing at Tehran to look after the interests of his people. How did he suffer for eating must khiyar? Well, I will tell you. You must know, then, that when he was appointed by the Parsees at Bombay to come and live in Persia and take care of the Gebs, and to try to influence the Shah in their favour, he knew nothing about Persia or the Persians, for though, of course, the Parsees are really Persians by descent, they have now become more like Firangis. Well, Manakji Saib set sail for Persia, and on board the vessel, being anxious to remedy this lack of knowledge on his part, he made friends with a Persian merchant of Isfahan, who was returning to this country. In the course of the voyage the ship touched at some port, the name of which I have forgotten, and as it was to remain there all day, the Isfahani suggested to Manakji Saib that they should go on shore and see the town, to which proposition the latter very readily agreed. Accordingly they landed, and since the town was situated at a considerable distance from the harbour, hired donkeys to convey them thither. Now the day was very hot, and as the sun got higher, Manakji Saib found the heat unbearable. So, espying a village near at hand, he suggested to his companion that they should rest there under some old ruins, which stood a little apart, until the sun had begun to decline, and the heat was less oppressive. To this his companion agreed, and further suggested that he should go to the village and see if he could find something to eat, while Manakji rested amongst the ruins. So they arranged with the muleteer to halt for an hour or two, and the Isfahani went off to look for food. Presently he returned with a number of young cucumbers, and a quantity of must, curds, with which he proceeded to concoct a bowl of must khiyar. Now Manakji, like you, had never seen this compound, and, being a man of a suspicious disposition, he began to fancy that his companion wanted to poison him in this lonely spot and take his money. So when the must khiyar was ready, he refused to partake of it, to the great surprise of his companion. "'Why, just now you said you were so hungry,' said the latter. "'How is it that you now declare you have no appetite?' "'I found a piece of bread in my pocket,' said Manakji, "'and ate it while you were away in the village, "'and now my hunger is completely gone.' The more his companion pressed him to eat, the more suspicious he grew, and the more determined in his refusal. "'Very well,' said the Isfahani at last. "'Since you won't join me, I must eat it by myself.' And this he proceeded to do, consuming the must khiyar with great relish and evident enjoyment. Now, when Manakji saw this, he was sorry that he had refused to partake of the food. "'It is quite clear,' said he to himself, "'that it is not poisoned, or else my companion would not eat it.' while at the same time, from the relish with which he does so, it is evident that strange as the mixture looks, it must be very nice. At last, when his companion had eaten about half, he could stand it no longer. Do you know, he said, that my appetite has unaccountably come back at seeing you eat. If you will allow me, I think I will change my mind and join you after all. His companion was rather surprised at this sudden change, but at once handed over the remainder of the food to Manakji, who, after tasting it and finding it very palatable, devoured it all. Now, certain rules must be observed in eating some of our Persian foods, and in the case of must khiyar, these are two in number. The first rule, as I have told you, is that you must not drink anything with it, or after it, for if you do, not only will your thirst be increased, but the food will swell up in your stomach, and make you think you are going to die of suffocation. The second rule is that you must lie down and go to sleep directly you have eaten it. 
Now Malakji Sahib was ignorant of these rules, and so, when his companion lay down and went to sleep, he, feeling somewhat thirsty, took a draught of water, and then lay down to rest. But, so far from being able to rest, he found himself attacked by a strange feeling of oppression, and his thirst soon returned twofold. So he got up and took another drink of water, and then lay down again, but now his state was really pitiable. He could hardly breathe, his stomach swelled up in a most alarming manner, and he was tormented by thirst. Then his suspicions returned with redoubled force, and he thought to himself, There is no doubt that my companion really has poisoned me, and has himself taken some antidote to prevent the poison from affecting him. Alas, alas! I shall certainly die in this horrible lonely spot, and no one will know what has become of me. While he was rolling about in agony, tormented by these alarming thoughts, he suddenly became aware of a strange-looking winged animal sitting on a wall close to him, and apparently gloating over his sufferings. It was nodding its head at him in a derisive manner, and to his excited imagination it seemed to be saying, as plain as words could be, Ahwali shuma chetaurast! Ahwali shuma chetaurast! How are you? How are you? Now, the animal was nothing more than one of those little owls which are so common in ruined places, but Manakji didn't know this, never having seen an owl before, and thought it must certainly be the angel of death come to fetch his soul. So he lay there gazing at it in horror, till at last he could bear it no longer, and determined to wake his companion. For, thought he, even though he has poisoned me, he is after all a human being, and his companionship will at least enable me better to bear the presence of this horrible apparition. So he stretched out his foot, and gave his companion a gentle kick. Finding that did not rouse him, he repeated it with greater force, and his companion woke up. Well, said he, what is the matter? Manakji pointed to the bird which still sat there on the wall, nodding its head, and apparently filled with diabolical enjoyment at the sufferer's misery. Do you see that? he inquired. See it? Of course I see it, replied his companion. What of it? Then some inkling of the nature of Manakji's terrors and suspicions came into his mind, and he determined to frighten him a little more, just to punish him. "'Doesn't it appear to you to be saying something?' said Manakji. "'I can almost fancy that I hear the very words it utters.' "'Saying something?' answered the Isfahani. "'Of course it is, but surely you know what it is and what it is saying.' "'Indeed I do not,' said Manakji, "'for I have never before seen anything like it, "'and as to what it is saying, "'it appears to me to be inquiring after my health.' which, for the rest, is sufficiently bad. So it would seem, said the other. But do you really mean to tell me that you don't know what it is? Well, I will tell you. It is the spirit of the accursed Omar, who usurped the Caliphate, and whose generals overran Persia. Since his death he has been permitted to assume this form, and in it to wander about the world. Now he has come to you, and is saying, I, in my lifetime, took so much trouble to overthrow the worship of fire, and do you dare come back to Persia to attempt its restoration? On hearing this, Manakji was more frightened than ever, but at last his friend took pity on him, and picking up a stone, threw it at the bird, which instantly flew away. I was only joking, he said. It is nothing but an owl. So Manakji's fears were dispelled and he soon recovered from the mast khiyar, but though he subsequently found out the proper way of eating it, I am not sure that he ever had the courage to try it again. We laughed a good deal at this story, and I remarked that it was an extraordinary thing that Manakji Saib should have been so frightened at an owl. Well, he said, it is, but then in the desert, and in solitary gloomy places, Things will frighten you that you would laugh at in the city. I don't believe in all these stories about Ghuls and Ifrits, which the Charvadars tell, 
but at the same time I would rather listen to them here than out there in the Kavir. It is a terrible place, that Kavir, all sand and salt and solitude, and tracks not more than two feet wide on which you can walk with safety. Deviate from them only a hand's breadth, and down you go into the salt swamps, camel, man, baggage, and everything else, and there is an end of you. Many a brave fellow has died thus. Have I seen anything of the Kavir? No, nor do I wish to do so. Hearing about it is quite sufficient for me. I was once lost in the salt mountains near Semnan when a boy, having run away from my father, who had done something to offend me. I only remained amongst them one night, and beyond the bitter brininess of the bright-looking streams at which I strove to quench my thirst, and the horror of the place and its loneliness, there was nothing half so bad as the Kavir, yet I wouldn't go through the experience again on any account. You have probably heard plenty of stories about the desert from your charvadars on the road. Nevertheless, as you seem to like hearing them, I will tell you one which may be new to you. We begged him to give us the story, and he proceeded as follows. A poor man was once travelling along on foot and alone in the desert, when he espied coming towards him a most terrible-looking dervish. You have very likely seen some of those wandering, wild-looking dervishes who go about all over the country armed with axes or clubs, and fear neither wild beast nor man, nor the most horrible solitudes. Well, this dervish was one of that class, only much more ferocious-looking and wild than any you ever saw, and he was moreover armed with an enormous and ponderous club, which he kept swinging to and fro in a manner little calculated to reassure our traveller. The latter, indeed, liked the appearance of the dervish so little that he determined to climb up a tree, which fortunately stood close by, and wait till the fellow had passed. The dervish, however, instead of passing by, seated himself on the ground under the tree, of course the poor traveller was horribly frightened, not knowing how long the dervish might choose to stop there, and fearing, moreover, that his place of retreat might have been observed. He therefore continued to watch the dervish anxiously, and presently saw him pull out of his pocket five little clay figures, which he placed in a row in front of him. Having arranged them to his satisfaction, he addressed the first of them, which he called Omar, as follows. O oh, Omar, I have thee now, thou usurper of the caliphate. Thou shalt forthwith answer to me for thy crimes, and receive the just punishment of thy wickedness. Yet I will deal fairly with thee, and give thee a chance of escape. It may be that there were mitigating circumstances in the case which should not be overlooked. Inform me, therefore, if it be so, and I promise thee I will not be unmerciful. What? Thou answerest nothing at all. Then it is evident thou canst think of no excuse for thy disgraceful conduct, and I will forthwith slay thee. Saying this, the dervish raised his mighty club over his head, and bringing it down with a crash on the little image, flattened it level with the ground. He next addressed himself to the second image, thus, O oh, Abu Bekr, thou also wert guilty in this matter, since thou didst first occupy the place which by right belonged to Ali. Nevertheless thou art an old man, and it may be that thou wert but a tool in the hands of that ungodly Omar, whom I have just now destroyed. If it be so, tell me that I may deal mercifully with thee. What, thou too art silent? Beware, or I will crush thee, even as I crushed thine abettor in this offence. Thou still refusest to answer? Then thy blood be on thine own head. Another blow with the club, and the second figure had followed the first. The dervish now turned to the third figure. O Murtaza Ali, he exclaimed, Tell me, I pray thee, now that these wretches who deprived thee of thy rights have met with their deserts, how it was that thou, the chosen successor of the prophet, didst allow thyself to be so set aside. 
after all thou didst in a manner acquiesce in their usurpation and i desire to know why thou didst so and why thou didst not withstand them even to the death tell me this therefore i pray thee that my difficulties may be solved what thou also art silent nay but thou shalt speak or i will deal with thee as with the others still thou answerest nothing then perish down came the club a third time while the poor man in the tree was almost beside himself with horror at this impiety this horror was further increased when the dervish turning to the fourth clay figure addressed it as follows o muhammad o prophet of god since thou didst enjoy divine inspiration thou didst without doubt know what would occur after thy death how then didst thou take no precautions to guard against it without doubt in this too there is some hidden wisdom which i would fain understand therefore i beseech thee to tell me of it thou answerest not a word nay but thou shalt answer else even thy sacred mission shall in no wise protect thee from my just wrath still thou maintainest silence beware for i am in earnest and will not be trifled with thou continuest to defy me then perish with the rest another heavy blow with the club and the figure of the prophet disappeared into the ground while the poor man in the tree was half paralysed with dread and watched with fascinated horror to see what the dervish would do next only one clay figure now remained and to this the dervish addressed himself o oh allah he said thou who hadst knowledge of all the troubles which would befall the family of him whom thou didst ordain to be the successor of thy prophet tell me i pray thee what divine mystery was concealed under that which baffles our weak comprehension wilt thou not hear my prayer art thou also silent nay thou shalt answer me or wretch suddenly exclaimed the man in the tree his terror of the dervish for the moment mastered by his indignation art thou not satisfied with having destroyed the prophet of god and ali his holy successor wilt thou also slay the creator beware hold thy hand or verily the heavens will fall and crush thee on hearing this voice apparently from the clouds the dervish was so terrified that he uttered one loud cry dropped his uplifted club and fell back dead the man in the tree now descended and cautiously approached the body of the dervish being finally assured that he was really dead he proceeded to remove his cloak which he was surprised to find of enormous weight so that he began to think there must be something concealed in the lining this proved to be the case for as he cut it open a hidden hoard of gold pieces poured forth on to the ground these the poor traveller proceeded to pick up and transfer to his pockets when he had completed this task he raised his face to heaven and said o oh allah just now i saved thy life by a timely interference and for this thou hast now rewarded me with this store of gold for which i heartily thank thee what a very foolish man the traveller must have been we remarked when the story was concluded he certainly met with better fortune than he deserved of course the dervish was nothing better than a madman yes answered the khan and of the two a fool is the worse especially as a friend a truth which is exemplified in the story of the gardener the bear and the snake which well illustrates the proverb that a wise enemy is better than a foolish friend if you do not know the story i will tell it you for it is quite short once upon a time there was a gardener into whose garden a bear used often to come to eat the fruit now seeing that the bear was very strong and formidable the gardener deemed it better to be on good terms with it thinking that it might prove a useful ally so he encouraged it to come whenever it liked and gave it as much fruit as it could eat 
for which kindness the bear was very grateful. Now there was also a snake which lived in a hole in the garden wall. One day when the snake was basking in the sun, half asleep, the gardener saw it and struck at it with the spade which he had in his hand. The blow wounded the snake and caused it a great deal of pain, but did not kill it, and it succeeded in dragging itself back into its hole. From this time forth it was filled with a desire for revenge, and a determination to watch the gardener's movements carefully, so that, if ever it saw him asleep, it might inflict on him a mortal wound. Now the gardener knew that the snake had escaped, and was well aware that he had made a deadly enemy of it, so he was afraid to go to sleep within its reach unprotected. He communicated his apprehensions to his friend the bear, which, eager to give some proof of its gratitude, readily offered to watch over him while he slept. The gardener gladly accepted this offer, and lay down to sleep, while the snake, concealed in its hole, continued its watch, hoping for an opportunity of gratifying its revenge. Now the day was hot, and the flies were very troublesome, for they kept buzzing round the gardener's face, and even settling upon it. This boldness on their part annoyed the bear very much, especially when he found that he could only disperse them for a moment by a wave of his paw, and that they returned immediately to the spot from which they had been driven. At last the bear could stand it no longer, and determined to have done with the flies once and for all. Looking round, he espied a large flat stone which lay near. "'Ah, oh, now I have you,' he thought, as he picked up the stone, and waiting for the flies to settle again on the gardener's face. "'I'll teach you to molest my friend's slumbers, you miserable creatures!' Then, the flies having settled, thud! Down came the stone with a mighty crash on the gardener's head, which was crushed in like an eggshell, while the flies flew merrily away to torment some new victim, and the snake crept back into its hole with great contentment, muttering to itself the proverb in question, A wise enemy is better than a foolish friend. End of section 16「Section 17 of A Year Amongst the Persians » by Edward Granville Brown • This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For further information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org A Year Amongst the Persians by Edward Granville Brown Chapter 7 From Tehran to Isfahan Part 3 And now, just outside the walls surrounding the telegraph office, rose a prolonged and dismal howl, followed by another, and yet another, while from the city, like an answer, came back the barking of the dogs. Are those jackals howling outside? I asked. And do they come so close to the town? Yes, answered the Khan. They always do so and the dogs always answer them thus. Do you know why? Once upon a time the jackals used to live in the towns, just as the dogs do now, while the latter dwelt outside in the desert. Now the dogs thought it would be much nicer to be in the town, where they would be sheltered from the inclemency of the weather, and would have plenty to eat, instead of often having to go without food for a long time. So they sent one of their numbers to the jackals with the following message. Some amongst us, they said, are ill, and our physicians say that what they need is change of air, and that they ought, if possible, to spend three days in the town. Now it is clearly impossible for us dogs and you jackals to be in one place at the same time, so we would ask you to change places with us for three days only, and to let us take up our quarters in the city, while you retire into the desert, the air of which will doubtless prove very beneficial to you also. To this proposition the jackals agreed, and during the following night the exchange was effected. In the morning, when the people of the city woke up, 
they found a dog wherever there had been a jackal on the previous night. On the third night the jackals, being quite tired of the desert, came back to the gates of the town, filled with pleasant anticipations of resuming their luxurious city life. But the dogs, being very comfortable in their new quarters, were in no hurry to quit them. So, after waiting some time, the jackals called out to the dogs, Na khushi shuma khub Are your sick ones well yet? Ending up with a whine rising and falling in cadence, just such as you heard a minute ago, and, as Mirza Abdullah, who is a native of Isfahan, will tell you, just such as you may hear any day in the mouth of an Isfahani or a Yezdi. But the dogs, who are Turks and speak Turkish, only answered, Yoch, Yoch, no, no. And so the poor jackals had to go back into the desert. And ever since then they come back at night and hail the dogs with the same question, as you heard them do just now and the dogs always give the same reply, for they have no wish to go back to the desert. And that is why the jackals come and howl round the town after dusk, and why the dogs always answer them. At this point our host interrupted the conversation to tell us that supper was ready. Supper! exclaimed the Khan, who had already commenced another story. Supper indeed! Am I to have my stories cut short and spoiled by supper? No, I shall not go on with what I was saying, even though you do beg my pardon. But I will forgive you, provided always that you ask an English pardon, and not a Persian pardon. What do you mean by a Persian pardon? I asked. Please explain the expression. No, I shall keep my word and tell you no more stories tonight, answered the Khan. I have told you plenty already, and you will probably forget them all, and me too. Now you will remember me much better as having refused to satisfy your curiosity on this one point, and whenever you hear the expression Padomirani, so he pronounced it, you will think of Mirza Hussein Khan of Kashan. After supper we had some songs accompanied on the sitar, all present except myself, being something of musicians. And thus the evening passed pleasantly, till the guests announced that they must depart, and I was astonished to find that it was close on midnight, and high time to retire for the night. Next day, 16th of February, our road continued to skirt the plain for some twelve or fifteen miles, and then turned to the right into the mountains. We at first ascended along a river bed, down which trickled a comparatively small quantity of water. I was surprised to see that a number of dams had been constructed to divert the water from its channel, and make it flow over portions of the bank, whence it returned charged with mud. On asking the reason of this strange procedure, I was informed that it was done to prevent the water evaporating, as muddy water evaporates less readily than that which is clear. On ascending somewhat higher, we came to a place where there was a smooth, rather deep, oblong depression in the face of the rock. Inside this, as well as on the ground beneath, were heaps of small stones and pebbles, while in every cranny and chink of the cliff around and below this spot were planted little bits of stick decorated with rags of diverse colours placed there by pious passers-by. As we came up to this place, Khuda Bakhsh, the muleteer, who was a few paces in front, sprang up towards the depression, shouting, Ya Ali! and drew his hand down it, thus affording an indication of the manner in which the wonderful smoothness of its walls had been produced. He then informed us that the depression in question was the mark left by the hoof of Ali's steed, Duldul, and that there were only two or three more such in the whole of Persia. Near the village of Gez, he added, there was the mark of Ali's hand in the rock. Haji Safar, on learning these facts, added his quota of pebbles to those already collected on the slope. Proceeding onwards, through very fine scenery, we suddenly came upon a mighty wall of rock, wherewith the channel of the stream was barred, 
and beyond this a vast sheet of water formed by the damming up of the watercourse. This splendid, half-natural reservoir, which serves to keep the city of Cachon well supplied with water during the hot, dry summer, was constructed, like so many other useful and beneficial public works, during the period of prosperity, which Persia enjoyed under the Safavi kings, and is known as Bande Kohrud. Winding round the right side of this great lake, we presently began to see around us abundant signs of cultivation, plantations of trees, orchards and fields, laid out in curious steps for purposes of irrigation, and already green with sprouting corn. Soon we entered tortuous lanes, enclosed by stout walls of stone, and overshadowed by trees, and after traversing these for some distance, we arrived at the village of Javinan, the strange-looking inhabitants of which came out to see us pass. The women, for the most part, wore green shawls, and did not cover their faces. As we passed, we could hear them conversing in the curious dialect incomprehensible to the ordinary Persian, of which I shall have to speak directly. About a mile farther on, we came to the village of Kohrud, where the Chaparkhane, post-house, being occupied, we found quarters at the house of a Sayyid, who appeared to be one of the chief men of the village. I had already heard from General Hutum Schindler, who possesses probably more knowledge about the geography, ethnology, and local dialects of Persia than any man living, of the curious dialect spoken in and around Kohrud and Natan, and, anxious to acquire further information about it, I mentioned the matter to my host, who at once volunteered to bring in two or three of the people of the place to converse with me. Accordingly, as soon as I had had tea, a man and his son came in, and, bowing ceremoniously, took their seats by the door. I first asked them as to the distribution of their dialect, and the extent of the area over which it was spoken. They replied that it was spoken, with slight variations, in about a dozen or fifteen villages round about, extending on the one hand to the little town of Natanz, in the valley to the east, and on the other to the mountain village of Kamsar. Of its age, history, and relations they knew nothing definite, merely characterising it as Fursi Kadim, ancient Persian. From what I subsequently learnt, I infer that it forms one branch of a dialect or language spoken with greater or less variations over a large portion of Persia. With the dialect of Natanz it seems almost identical, so far as I can judge, from a comparison of the specimen of that vernacular, consisting of some thirty words, given by Pollock, with my own collection of Kohrud words. With the so-called Dari language of the Zoroastrians of Yezd and Kirmon, it has also close affinities, and it would also seem to be near akin to the dialect spoken about Sivomb, three stages north of Shiraz. The relations of these dialects to one another and to the languages of ancient Persia have not yet been fully worked out, though excellent monographs on several of them exist and the quatrains of the celebrated Baba Tahir, the Lourdes, have been published with translation and notes by M. Clément Ouard. It would be out of place here to discuss the philological bearings of this question, and I will merely observe that the wide distribution of these kindred dialects, and the universal tradition of their age, alike point to something more than a merely local origin. I now for the first time realised the difficulty of obtaining precise information from uneducated people with regard to their language. In particular, it was most difficult to get them to give me the different parts of the verbs. I would ask, for example, how would you say, I am ill? They gave me a sentence which I wrote down. Then I asked, now, what is, thou art ill? They repeated the same sentence. That can't be right, I said. They can't both be the same. Yes, that is right, they answered. If we want to say, thou art ill, we just say what we have told you. 
Well, but suppose you were ill yourself, what would you say? Oh, then we should say, so and so. This readiness in misapprehending one's meaning and reversing what one had said gave rise to one class of difficulties. Another class arose from the extreme simplicity of the people. For instance, after asking them the words for a number of common objects in their language, I asked, And what do you call city? Kashon, they replied. Nonsense, I said. Kashon is the name of a particular city. What do you call cities in general? No, they said. It is quite right. In Persian you say, Shah miravam. I am going to the city. We say, Kashan miravam. It is all the same. It was useless to argue, or to point out that there were many other cities in the world beside Kashan. To these simple-minded folk, Kashan remained the city par excellence, and they could not see what one wanted with any other. Finally, I had to give up the struggle in despair, and to this day I do not know whether the Kohrudi dialect possesses a general term for city or not. I here append a list of words and expressions which I took down during the short opportunity I had for studying the Kohrud dialect, as I am not aware that anything has been published on that particular branch of what Monsieur Ua called Pehlevi Musulman. For the sake of comparison, I place in parallel columns the equivalents in the Natanz dialect given by Polak and those of the so-called Dari of Yezd, given by General Schindler and Justi. The transcription of these latter I have only altered so far as appeared necessary to convey the proper pronunciation to the English reader, e.g. in substituting the English Y for the German J. Columns English, Persian, Kohrudi, Natanzi, Dari of Yezd Father Pidar, Baba Per, Pedar, Schindler. Baba, Bab, Babu, Justi, Baug, Schindler. Mother, Madar, Mune, Mune, Polak. Mar, Ma, Mer, Schindler. Memu, Justi. Brother, Biradar, Dadu, Berar, Schindler. Dadar, Old, Duhar, Justi, Sun, Pisar, Pura, Pura, Polak, Pur, Justi, Pur, Old, Borer, Schindler, Daughter, Duchtar, Duta, Duta, Polak, Dute, Justi, Dut, Duter, Dotter, Schindler, Child, Bacha, Vacha, Vacha, Schindler and Justi, Woman, Zan, Jana, Jena, Polak, Jen, Jenuk, Schindler, House, Khane, Kia, Kee, Polak, Kede, Keda, Schindler, Kede, Chada, Justi, Door, Dar, Bar, Bar, Schindler and Justi, Wood, Chub, Chuga, Chu, Schindler, Tree, Diracht, Diracht, Justi and Schindler, Bun, Bana, Bena, Water, Ab, O, Au, Polak, Vuv, Beresin, quoted by Justi, Vo, Yezd, O, Kirman, Fire, Atash, Atash, Tash, Justi and Schindler, Apple, Sib, So, Suv, Justi, Garden, Raz equals Vine, Raz, Raz, Raz equals Vine, Schindler, Night, Shab, Shuye, Sho, Justi and Schindler, Bird, Karge, Karge, Polak, Dog, Sag, Ispa, Saba, Schindler, Seva, Justi, Cat, Gurba, Malji, Muljin, Polak, Mali, Schindler, Snow, Barf, 
Vafra, Vabr, Beresin, quoted by Yusti. Today, Imruz, Iru, Emru, Yusti. Yesterday, Diruz, Ize, Heze, Schindler. Tomorrow, Ferda, Hia, Arda, Schindler. Begone, Birau, Bashe, Bashe, Besho, Schindler, Bishau. From this example of the Kohrud dialect, it will be seen that the following are some of its chief peculiarities, so far as generalizations can be drawn from so small a vocabulary. 1. Preservation of archaic forms, e.g. pur, ispa, vafra, zend, vafra, etc. 2. Change of b into v, e.g. vacha, Persian, bacha, valg, Persian, barg, leaf. But this change does not go so far as in some other dialects. B, for instance, being preserved in the prefix to the imperative as in Bashe, Persian, Bishor, Yezdi, Veshor. The change of Shab, Persian, into Shau or Shor, Yezdi, and Shuye, Kohrudi, of Sib, Persian, into Suv, Yezdi, and So, Kohrudi, and of Ab, Persian, into O, Kohrudi and Kirmani and Vo Yezdi is doubtless to be accounted for in this way. Three R standing before a consonant in a Persian word often stands after it in the Kohrud dialect, e.g. Vafra Persian Barf. Sometimes its place is taken by L, e.g. Valg Persian Barg. Four G is sometimes replaced by V, e.g. Varg. Persian Gurg, wolf. 5. P is sometimes replaced by F, e.g. Asf, Persian Asp, horse. 6. Kh sometimes drops out when it is followed by another consonant, Basut, Persian Suchte, burnt. A few short sentences may be given in conclusion, without comment or comparison. I come, Atun, he is coming today, Iru Ati. We are coming, Hama Atima. You are coming tonight, Isha Atima. They are coming, Atanda. Come, let us go into the country, Burya Bashima Sahra. Bring some oil here, Rukhan Urge Burya. Take this and give it to him, Urgi Buide. Take the donkey, go and load it with earth, and come here, Kha Urgi Bashechak Barki Burya. Throw down the blanket here and sit down. Pa be halim urbunu dume huchin. Sit here. Hakum unchis. I sat. Hochistum. He sat. Hochish. He came here. Bame ande. I have not gone there. Nige nashtima. It was day. Ruabu. My brother is ill. Duron nasaza. Is your brother better? Ahwali dodo bihtara. It is seven farsakhs from here to Kashon. Ande ta Kashon haft farsanga. How far is it from here to there? Ande ta nige chan farsanga. What is your name? Isma chechiga. What does he say? Ajichi. When do you go? Keashima. Whose is this house? No kia ani kia. Where do you belong to? Tu kiga egi. Whence comest thou? Iruki gorate. I come from Kamsar. Kamsar datun. How many days is it since you left? Chand ruga bashtei. It is ten days since I left. Da ruga bashtaun. This wood is burnt. Na chuga basut. The fire has gone out. Atash Bamar. Abdullah is dead. Abdullah ba Marda. Take the pillow and come and put it under my head. Balish Urgi Burya Ziri Saramnu. Why art thou such an ass? Jiranandagar Khari. It has laid eggs. Tochm Yudada. At last I asked my informants, whose number had been greatly increased by additions from without, what they said in their language for Pidar Suchte, burnt father, 
the commonest term of abuse in Persian. Baba Basut, they cried unanimously, and with much relish, but we have many other bad names beside that, like Baba Bamar, dead father, and blank. Here they poured forth a torrent of Kohrudi objurgations, which would probably have made me shudder if I had understood them. As it was, confusion being prevalent, and supper ready, Haji Safar turned them all out of the room. That night snow fell heavily, and I was surprised to see that the Kohrudis appeared to feel the cold, though they were well wrapped up, much more than any of us did. In the morning there was a layer of snow on the ground nearly six inches deep, and much more than this in the hollows. Luckily there had been but little wind, else it might have gone hard with us. As it was, we had difficulty enough. We were delayed in starting by the purchase of a quantity of yuzrand, a kind of sweetmeat made with sugar and walnuts, in which, as it was a peculiar product of the place, Haji Safar advised me to invest. Then various people had to be rewarded for services rendered, amongst these my instructors of the previous night. The people were a grasping and discontented lot, and after I had given the man who had come to teach me the elements of Kohrudi a present for himself and his son, the latter came and declared that he had not got his share, and that his father denied my having given him anything. At last we got off, accompanied by another larger caravan, which had arrived before us on the preceding evening. The path being completely concealed, one of the muleteers walked in front, sounding the depth of the snow with his staff. At first we got on at a fair pace, but as we advanced and continued to ascend, it got worse and worse. Once or twice we strayed from the road and had to retrace our steps. The last part of the climb which brought us to the summit of the pass was terrible work. The muleteers lost the road entirely, and after blundering about for a while, decided to follow the course of the telegraph poles so far as this was possible. In so doing, notwithstanding the sounding of the snow, we kept getting into drifts. Many of the baggage mules fell down, and could not regain their feet till they had been unloaded and every time this happened the whole caravan was brought to a standstill till the load had been replaced, the muleteers uttering loud shouts of Ya Allah! Ya Ali! and the women in the Kajavis, a sort of panniers, sending forth piteous cries whenever the animals which bore them stumbled or seemed about to fall. Altogether it was a scene of the utmost confusion, though not lacking in animation but the cold was too intense to allow me to take much interest in it. After we had surmounted the pass, things went somewhat better, but we had been so much delayed during the ascent that it was nearly 6 p.m. and getting dusk, before we reached the rather bleak-looking village of Soh. Here also there is a telegraph office, whither I directed my steps. Mr. McGowan, who was in charge of the office, was out when I arrived, but I was kindly received by his wife, an Armenian lady, and his little boy. The latter appeared to me a very clever child. He spoke not only English, Persian, and Armenian with great fluency, but also the dialect of So, which is closely allied to, if not identical with, the Kohrud vernacular. His father soon came in, accompanied by two Armenian travellers, one of whom was Darcham Bey, who is well known over the greater part of Persia for the assiduity with which he searches out and buys up walnut trees. I often heard discussions amongst the Persians as to what use these were put to, and why any one found it worth while to give such large sums of money for them. The general belief was that they were cut into thin slices, and subjected to some process which made pictures come out in the wood, these pictures being, in the opinion of many, representations of events that had occurred under the tree which had supplied the wood. I had a good deal of conversation with Darcham Bay, though much less than I might have done had I been less overcome with somnolence induced by exposure to the cold. He had travelled over a great part of Persia, especially Luristan, 
which he most earnestly counselled me to avoid. The only people that I have seen worse than the lures, he said, are the Kashkais, for, though the former will usually rob you if they can, and would not hesitate to murder you if you refuse to give up your possessions to them, the latter, not content with this, will murder you even if you make no resistance, alleging that the world is well quit of one who is such a coward that he will not fight for his own. Next day's march was singularly dull and uneventful, as well as bitterly cold. I had expected a descent on this way of the pass, corresponding to the rapid ascent from Cachon to Kohrud, but I was mistaken. It even seemed to me that the difference in altitude between the summit of the pass and Soh was at any rate not much greater than between the former and Kohrud, while from Soh to our next halting place, Murchekhar, the road was, to all intents and purposes, level. At the latter place we arrived about 5 p.m. It is an unattractive village of no great size. Finding the caravanserai in bad repair, I put up at the post-house, where I could find little to amuse me but two hungry-looking cats, which came and shared my supper, at first with some diffidence, but finally with complete assurance. They were ungrateful beasts, however, for they not only left me abruptly as soon as supper was over, but paid a predatory visit to my stores during the night, and ate a considerable portion of what was intended to serve me for breakfast on the morrow. The following day's march was a good deal more interesting. Soon after starting we saw three gazelles, ahu, grazing not more than a hundred yards off the road. The wind being towards us from them, they allowed us to approach within a very short distance of them, so that, though I had no gun, I was almost tempted to take a shot at them with my revolver. A little farther on, at a point where the road, rising in a gentle incline, passed between two low hills before taking a bend towards the east, and descending into the great plain in which lies the once magnificent city of Isfahan, we came to the ruins of a little village, amidst which stood a splendid, though somewhat dismantled, caravanserai of the Safavi era. Concerning this, one of the muleteers told me a strange story, which, for the credit of the Qajar dynasty, I hope was a fiction. The Shah, he said, was once passing this spot, when his courtiers called his attention to the architectural beauty and incomparable solidity of this building. In the whole of Persia, they said, no caravanserai equal to this is to be found, neither can any one at the present day build the like of it what exclaimed the shah are none of the caravanserais which i have caused to be built as fine that shall be so no longer destroy this building which makes men think lightly of the edifices which i have reared this command if ever given was carried out somewhat tenderly for the destruction is limited to the porches, mouldings, turrets, and other less essential portions of the structure. But indeed, to destroy the buildings reared by the Safavi kings would be no easy task, and could hardly be accomplished without gunpowder. A little way beyond this we reached another ruined village, where we halted for lunch. We were now in the Isfahan plain, and could even discern the position of the city by the thin pall of blue smoke which hung over it, and was thrown into relief by the dark mountains beyond. To our left, east, was visible the edge of the Dashti Kavir, which we had not seen since entering the Kohrud Pass. Its flat, glittering expanse was broken here and there by low ranges of black mountains, thrown up from the plain into sharp rocky ridges. To the right, west, were more hills, amongst which lies the village of Najaf Abad, one of the strongholds of the Babis. Resuming our march after a short halt, we passed several flourishing villages on either side, amongst them, and some distance to the east of the road, Gurgab, which is so celebrated for its melons, and at about 4 p.m. reached our halting place, Gez. 
I think we might without much difficulty have pushed on to Isfahan, which was now clearly visible at a distance of about ten miles ahead of us. But the muleteers were natives of Gez, and naturally desired to avail themselves of the opportunity now afforded them for visiting their families. Personally, I should have preferred making an attempt to reach the city that night, for Gez is by no means an attractive spot, and I could find no better occupation than to watch a row of about a dozen camels kneeling down in the caravanserai to receive their evening meal, consisting of balls of dough, nawali, from the hands of their drivers. Later on, Khuda Bakhsh, the second muleteer, brought me a present, pishkesh, of a great bowl of mast, curds, and two chickens. Next day, 20th of February, we got off about 8.30. Khuda Bakhsh, having received his present, in Am, testified his gratitude by accompanying us as far as the outskirts of the village, when I bade him farewell and dismissed him. Rahim, assisted by a younger brother called Mahdi Kuli, whom he had brought with him from the village, undertaking to convey us to Isfahan. I had, while at Tehran, received a most kindly worded invitation from Dr. Hörner of the English Church Mission to take up my abode with him at the mission house during my stay in the city, and as that was situated in the Armenian quarter of Julfa, beyond the river Zayandarud, Zinderud of Hafiz, the muleteers wished to proceed thither direct without entering the city, alleging that the transit through the bazaars would be fraught with innumerable delays. As, however, I was desirous of obtaining some idea of the general aspect of the city as soon as possible, I requested them to do exactly the contrary to what they proposed, videte, to convey me to my destination through as large a portion of the bazaars as could conveniently be traversed. This they finally consented to do. During a portion of our way to the city, we enjoyed the company of a Mokanni Bashi, or professional maker of kanats, those subterranean aqueducts of which I have already spoken, with whom I conversed for a time on the subject of his profession, since I was very desirous to learn how it was possible for men possessed of but few instruments, and those of the rudest kind, to sink their shafts with such precision. I cannot say, however, that my ideas on the subject were rendered much clearer by his explanations. As we drew nearer to the city, its numerous domes, minarets, and pigeon towers, Kaftar Khane, began to be clearly discernible, and on all sides signs of cultivation increased. We passed through many poppy fields, where numbers of labourers were engaged in weeding. The plants were, of course, quite small at this season, for they are not ready to yield the opium till about a month after the Nauruz, i.e. about the end of April. When this season arrives, the poppy capsules are gashed or scored by means of an instrument composed of several sharp blades laid parallel. This is done early in the morning, and in the afternoon the juice, which has exuded and dried, is scraped off. The crude opium, tiriachi cham, thus obtained, is subsequently kneaded up, purified, dried, and finally made into cylindrical rolls about half an inch or a third of an inch in diameter. At length we entered the city by the gate called Derwaze Ye Charchu, and were soon threading our way through the bazaars, which struck me as very fine, for not only are they lofty and spacious, but the goods exposed for sale in the shops are for the most part of excellent quality. The people are of a different type to the Tehranis. They are not, as a rule, very dark in complexion, and have strongly marked features, marred not infrequently by a rather forbidding expression, though the average of good looks is certainly fairly high. The character which they bear amongst other Persians is not altogether enviable, avarice and niggardliness being accounted their chief characteristics. Thus it is commonly said of anyone who is very careful of his expenditure, 
that he is as mean as the merchants of Isfahan who put their cheese in a bottle and rub their bread on the outside to give it a flavour. Another illustration of this alleged stinginess is afforded by the story of an Isfahani merchant, who one day caught his apprentice eating his lunch of dry bread and gazing wistfully at the bottle containing the precious cheese, whereupon he proceeded to scold the unfortunate youth roundly for his greediness, asking him if he couldn't eat plain bread for one day. Nor have the poets failed to display their ill-nature towards the poor Isfahanis, as the following lines testify. Isfahan janatisht pur nitmat, Isfahani daru nami bayad. Isfahan is a paradise full of luxuries. There ought, however, to be no Isfahanis in it. At last we emerged from the bazaars into the fine spacious square called maidan -i shah On our right hand as we entered it was the Ali-Kapi, supreme gate, which is the palace of the Zilus Sultan, the prince governor of Isfahan, of whom I have already spoken. In front of us, at the other end of the square, was the magnificent mosque called masjid -i shah surmounted by a mighty dome. Quitting the Maidan at the angle between these residences of ecclesiastical and temporal power, and traversing several tortuous streets, we entered the fine spacious avenue called Chaharbagh, which is wide, straight, well paved, surrounded by noble buildings, planted with rows of lofty plane trees, and supplied with several handsome fountains. This avenue must have been the pride of Isfahan in the good old days of the Safavis, and is still calculated to awaken a feeling of deep admiration in the mind of the traveller. But it has suffered considerably in later days, not only by the state of dilapidation into which many of the buildings situated on its course have been allowed to fall, but also by the loss of many noble plane trees which were cut down by the Zilus Sultan, and sent to Tehran to afford material for a palace which he was building there. On reaching the end of the Chaharbagh, we came in sight of the river Zayandarud, which separates the city of Isfahan from the Christian suburb of Julfa. This river, though it serves only to convert into a swamp, the Gavkhani Marsh, a large area of the desert to the east, is at Isfahan as fine a stream as one could wish to see. It is spanned by three bridges, of which the lowest is called Pule Hassanabad, the middle one Pule Si or Si Chashme, the bridge of thirty-three arches, and the upper one Pule Marun, all of them solidly and handsomely built. We crossed the river by the middle bridge, obtaining while doing so a good view of the wide but now half-empty channel the pebbly sides of which were spread with fabrics of some kind which had just been dyed and were now drying in the sun. The effect produced by the variegated colours of these, seen at a little distance, was as though the banks of the river were covered with flower beds. On the other side of the stream was another avenue closely resembling the Chahabagh, through which we had already passed, and running in the same line as this and the bridge towards the south. This, however, we did not follow, but turned sharply towards the right, and soon entered Julfa, which is not situated exactly opposite to Isfahan, but somewhat higher up the river. It is a large suburb, divided into a number of different quarters, communicating with one another by means of gates, and traversed by narrow, tortuous lanes planted with trees, in many cases a stream of water runs down the middle of the road, dividing it in two. After passing through a number of these lanes, we finally reached the mission house, where I was met and cordially welcomed by Dr. Hernler, who, though I had never seen him before, received me with a genial greeting, which at once made me feel at home. Dr. Bruce, who had kindly written to him about me, was still absent in Europe so that all the work of the mission had now devolved on him, 
and this, in itself no small labour, was materially increased by the medical aid which was continually required of him, for Dr. Hörner was the only qualified practitioner in Isfahan. Nevertheless, he found time in the afternoon to take me to call on most of the European merchants resident in Julfa, and the cordial welcome which I received from these was alone necessary to complete the favourable impression produced on me by Isfahan. End of section 17